As you know, this panel is focused on climate change and air pollution. A steady stream of scientific reports has been adding to the concern about the grave dangers of unchecked greenhouse gas emissions. Congress is paralyzed on this issue. There aren't enough votes to pass new laws, and there are not enough votes to repeal any old ones. One of the old laws that is still in effect, of course, is the Clean Air Act, most recently amended in 1990. The Supreme Court's 2007 decision in Massachusetts versus EPA held that the Clean Air Act empowers EPA to regulate greenhouse gas emissions, and EPA has been using that power. The United States joined in the major United Nations climate agreement that was reached in Paris in December. However, the fate of that agreement may hang in the balance with the upcoming presidential election. So we're going to go a little bit out of order because uh, one of our speakers on this panel will need to depart. Uh, before we jump into the panel, I do want to remind you uh, during the Q&A session um, to when you want to speak and ask your question, please press the speak button uh, on the microphone in front of you. Um, the way we're going to run this is we're going to uh, ask Gwendolyn Litvak to come up first. Um, and we'll have a short Q&A uh, with Gwen after her talk, um, and then she has to decamp, and then we'll turn back to EPA. So Gwendolyn, our first speaker will be Gwendolyn Litvak, who is substituting for her colleague uh, Nilda Mesa, who had to be out of town today. Gwen is the chief of staff for the New York City Mayor's Office of Sustainability, where she oversees the policy work to to fulfill Mayor de Blasio's commitments to reduce greenhouse gas emissions 80% by 2050. Before coming to City Hall, Gwen worked for the US Senate Budget Committee, where she oversaw billions of dollars in transportation, housing, and commerce funding. And also, she, she also worked on President Obama's 2008 campaign. Gwen? Thanks so much for having me this morning. Um, I'm sorry Nilda can't be here. She's in San Francisco at the Under 2 MOU Summit, um, but she definitely wanted to be here. So I'm here this morning to talk about One New York, the plan for a strong and just city. Uh, One New York is the administration's integrated plan to chart a path towards um, reducing our greenhouse gas emissions uh, 80% by 2050. It's a comprehensive plan that seeks to prepare New York for its fifth century. Um, it also addresses how we want to look in 10 years, 20 years, and beyond. It articulates the goals and initiatives achieve, that we'll need to achieve to get to this long-term vision, and it connects with other city efforts, including our 10-year capital strategy, the executive budget, and the Center for Economic Opportunities Poverty Report. So as many of you know, we inherited a great foundation from the Bloomberg administration with Plan YC. Previous Plan YCs addressed growth, sustainability originally in 2007, um, and then of course resiliency after Hurricane Sandy. This administration continues to look at those things um, as well as things that are near and dear to this mayor, including growing inequality, importance of the region, and voices of regular New Yorkers. In this plan, uh, we articulated four visions. The first around growth, our growing, thriving city. The second around equity, our just and equitable city. The third around sustainability, our sustainable city. And of course, the fourth around resiliency, our resilient city. This past April, we produced a one-year progress report highlighting the work that we've made over the past year since the plan's release. Here are some highlights from all four visions. Today I'm gonna to talk about uh, progress made on Vision 3 specifically, where we all made the commitment to have New York City be the most sustainable big city in the world and a global leader in the fight against climate change. Um, the vision has six goals around 80 by 50, zero waste, air quality, brownfields, water management, and parks and natural resources. And I'll dive into a few of these this morning. So much of what I work on and our office is working with our partner agencies around the city to reduce greenhouse gas emissions 80 by 50. This data comes from our annual GHG inventory. This year we updated our GHG inventory to be compliant with the global protocol for community scale greenhouse gas emission inventories. So we're accounting a little bit differently. Um, many cities across the world are adopting this new methodology and we're glad to be a part of that effort. Our findings from our GHG inventory guide all of our work. So we know that 74% of our GHG emissions come from buildings. And in this chart, you can see 
from buildings, what are the largest emitters of GHG? So space heating, certainly in multifamily and citywide as well. Uh, the remaining GHG emissions come from the energy supply, transportation, and waste sectors within the city. So to figure out how to reduce emissions from buildings, we gathered about 60 um, different stakeholders last year and had a year-long process called the Buildings Technical Working Group. The report, which was published on Earth Day, includes the most comprehensive analysis of energy use in New York City's buildings to date. We have about a million buildings, so this was not a quick undertaking. Um, we modeled basically all one million buildings using seven different average typologies of New York City buildings, um, and then ran these through 100 different energy conservation measures. Based on that analysis, we're launching new requirements and supporting programs for buildings to put them on a pathway to 80 by 50, and the findings from this building's work will be integrated into our September action plan um, to get to 80 by 50 across the sectors I named previously. <coughs> Excuse me. So what you can see here is that our current policies um, are projected to reduce building-based emissions by 28%, and then our new initiatives include new requirements for buildings, including heating distribution system upgrades. We found that steam is actually the largest emitter of GHGs across all of our buildings, in part because so many of them have steam. Expansion of the greener, greater buildings plans to mid-sized buildings. Currently, only buildings under 50,000 square feet are covered by a lot of our um, benchmarking laws, and so we're looking to expand that to also larger buildings. And supporting programs included the New York City Retrofit Accelerator, Community Retrofit NYC, and the New York City Carbon Challenge. Both um, retrofit programs are targeted at buildings um, that don't currently have green investments, and you can come if you're a large commercial building or if you're a one to four family building and receive free technical assistance from our staff. Additional reductions will be uh, achieved through integration of the technical working group identified energy conservation measures into codes, our new performance-based energy code to be fully implemented by 2022, and exploring technical potential for deep energy retrofits in existing buildings. Um, we will be the first city in America to do the performance-based energy code, so it's really a big deal. We've also made progress on our zero waste goals. What you can see in this chart is even as population continues to increase, um, waste disposed and waste landfilled is going down. We now have curbside organics at over 50,000 households, um, which reaches more than 700,000 residents. This number will triple by the end of the year, and DSNY is also introducing recycling for select high-rise buildings in Manhattan this year. Our office has also launched the Zero Waste Challenge um, for businesses in all five boroughs to voluntarily reduce their waste. We've had a lot of uh, large restaurants sign on, including Le Bernardin, Whole Foods, and then also some stadiums such as City Field and Barclays, which is great. Um, this air quality is a subject that's near and dear <coughs> to Nilda's heart, and so we do a lot of work on this. One of the great achievements of this year is that we phased down all city mandated use of number six heating oil, so no city buildings are burning that any longer. Um, and we launched NYC Clean Fleet, which I will talk about, uh, which is New York City's commitment to operate the largest municipal EV fleet of any city by 2025. Uh, we're starting with small and light vehicles and uh, moving to medium and heavy duty vehicles. Um, the mayor pledged that all vehicles we buy moving forward that are light duty will be um, electric vehicles, sorry, and then we're exploring opportunities for medium and heavy as battery technology improves. Uh, here is a recap of some of the overarching vision goals and the plan that we set out last year. Um, and here is a bit on how we are tracking these. Every year we put out an annual progress report, and as I mentioned, and we just published our latest report in April, it's online at nyc.gov backslash one NYC. And I'm happy to take any additional questions about the plan. I didn't, but we have had a dramatic expansion in solar. Um, it is one of the highlights in the plan. I will go to the exact number. Um, one second. Yep, we've tripled solar energy installation citywide since 2014. That's correct. Do you have a follow-up question about solar? Uh, we have some uh, plans for installation of uh, solar panels. 
Yep, so we've committed to putting solar on city buildings where feasible. We're exploring alternatives on all city buildings. It doesn't make sense for every single city building, but we're certainly exploring it, and we're expanding our solar pilot, which was started in Brooklyn CB6 last year, um, to other communities in the surrounding area. Just a, a just a quick reminder to please press the buttons on your microphones when you ask questions. Thank you. Um, New York State um, Supreme Court judge recently invalidated the city's uh, styrofoam yeah. uh, ban. Yep. Um, what are your plans to have that reenacted? That's actually under the jurisdiction of DSNY, so I don't know, but I'm happy to get back to you with what their plans are. Why is Murphy nodding? <laughs> the standard politician answer is that one. Go ahead. Me? Yeah. Gwendolyn, do you, do you uh, in your work, uh, enforce regulations and statutory material uh, that has been promulgated by the New York City Council, or are you relying on, on state law and uh, federal air quality law? Uh, we don't do enforcement. DEP, the Department of Environmental Protection, is the air enforcement arm of the administration. Yep, we are an inter kind of cross cutting policy body that brings together different mayoral agencies to advance initiatives that maybe touch a part of um, an agency but isn't the bulk of their work. So, around air quality, we bring together a number of stakeholders at buildings, the Department of Health and Mental Hygiene, Environmental Protection to talk about policy issues, but we ourselves do not do any enforcement. So, you're more a planning agency? Yep, we're more of a planning agency, that's correct. Yep. Um, when you look at Google photographs of New York City, you see a lot of flat roofs, and most of them are black. Yep. Um, does your report address white roofs and paint, in other words, painting roofs white because that reduces energy use, particularly during the summer? One, NYC doesn't specifically address cool roofs. We do have a program called Cool Roofs um, for painting roofs white. That's actually run out of the Department of Small Business Services. Um, and we are looking into a lot, number of pitch issues with, the, with FDNY right now. Yes. Um, this is a really commendable plan. Um, but regarding the phasing out of number six, heating oil, that's, that's also very good. But that, um, those are largely being replaced by natural gas. Mm -hmm. And um, what are you doing to reduce natural gas use in New York City? Um, there are uh, NYSERDA and Con Edison incentives to convert from number six to natural gas. Mm -hmm. And um, from a climate perspective, you know, gas has 86 times the global warming potential as uh, CO2 combustion, mm -hmm. um, especially if you include all the leaking methane. And there are maps out there um, that show uh, leaking methane all over New York City. Mm -hmm. So um, what are you doing to address that problem? I think it's kind of the elephant in the room um, in terms of our energy use right now. Yeah, definitely. It's on our radar. Uh, I'm also not the natural gas expert in the office. I'm the one NYC expert in the office, but I'm happy to get back to you for more information. I know it's part of our conversations. It's part of our integrated plan for 80 by 50 in September. Yeah. Yep. Going back to solar for a quick second. Um, a couple of years ago, I think uh, e EDC had an initiative to uh, put solar panels at fresh kills. Yeah. And I'm wondering whether that program has uh, disappeared or, or whether it's going to be expanded to other landfills and whatnot. Um, as you know, probably Sun Edison filed for bankruptcy recently. Mm -hmm. um, so we are revisiting options for that site currently. And how about other, s other uh, former landfills around the city? Uh, I don't know of any other active projects, which doesn't mean they're not ongoing, but we do work on the Fresh Kill site. I can follow up. Thanks. Yep. I was, I was wondering if you know w when you plan to launch the technical working group for the transportation sector. We have focus groups that are currently ongoing. Um, we've had two focus groups already. If you'd like to be involved, I'm happy to connect you with some folks if you give me your contact information. Okay, thank you. Sure. Anything else? Thanks so much for having me. Thank you, Gwen.
with you, right? Thank you. Um, so our next speaker is Joseph Siegel. Uh, Joe has worked in the Office of Regional Counsel of EPA Region 2 for 29 years. He specializes in climate change and air pollution law and policy. Um, among many other things, Joe co-chairs EPA Region 2's Climate Change Work Group and is the lead regional attorney on climate change. Joe? Thank you, Mike, and thanks to you and Mike Gerard for organizing this event. Um, I did tell Mike Gerard to bring a message to the Pope um, and that I'm very insulted that he has selected uh, the Pope over me to talk about climate change today. Um, so uh, a conversation about climate change and EPA can't begin with something other than the Paris COP. Uh, last year ended with a really a wonderful bang. Um, unprecedented decision, and the success was only possible in part because of the leadership of President Obama, um, who had bilateral meetings in advance of the, the COP. Um, you probably heard about the, 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 um, the, the press event releasing the goals of the United States and China. These are the kind of things that made for a successful event. Um, it also was in part because of EPA's actions under the Clean Air Act, and that's what I'm going to talk about today. So um, in 2013, President Obama issued uh, the President's Climate Action Plan. This followed a number of years, starting in 2009, with robust regulatory development by EPA um, on climate change. Um, but I'm going to focus on uh, some of the things that were in this Climate Action Plan, in particular um, uh, power plants, heavy-duty vehicle rule, um, hydrofluorocarbons, which is a high global warming pollutant, and methane, another uh, global warming pollutant. Um, so I'm going to talk about that. There were many other things in the President's Climate Action Plan, like entering into the 21st century transportation economy and uh, having uh, less energy use in our homes, businesses, and industries, uh, preparing the U.S. For the, for the impacts of climate change, and leading international efforts. But I'm going to focus on these clean air related developments. Thanks to the, 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 the President's uh, Climate Action Plan and EPA action, the U.S. was well prepared to submit its intended nationally determined contribution in advance of the Paris uh, summit. Um, and uh, you can see on the right, there's a green box. This, is, this was our INDC, our intended nationally determined contribution. Um, and in that, there was reference to the four actions that I'm going to be talking about today. Um, the orange box uh, just above it um, was, our, uh, was our target coming out of Can Cancun and Copenhagen. Um, starting in 2020 with this new pledge, we are going to double the rate of our reductions in the United States, which puts us on a nice glide path to getting to 80% uh, below 2005 levels by 2050. The President's Climate Action Plan also called for a report on the impacts of climate change on human health. And the U.S. Global Change Research Program, uh, which is under the auspices of the U.S. Global Change Research Act, issued a report this year um, about the effects in the United States on human health. Uh, there's a broad range of findings in there, and I won't get to talk about all of them, but I want to highlight two that's relevant to us today. Um, the first is that uh, they project a warmer future which will result in thousands to tens of thousands of additional premature deaths per year by the end of the century. That's important because we sit here uh, on Manhattan Island, which experiences a heat island effect, as do many urban centers. So this is something we need to think about. Um, and then, in addition, uh, climate change will make it harder for any given regulatory approach to address ground-level ozone pollution. Um, now, you want ozone in the stratosphere, but you don't want it down here where we're breathing. It's very bad for people's uh, cardiac and pulmonary systems. Um, so 
Um, I mentioned this today because last, just last week we had several ozone alert days in, in New York. And this is a, a, a chart from the U.S. Global Change Research Program report. And you can see on the left, we already have seen that over the last 10 years, heat waves are actually the biggest impact on, on human health in terms of estimated deaths. Um, so, and I mention this because in New York, we're so focused on Sandy and Irene. We saw inundation from Sandy. We saw extreme rainfall events like Irene. And, and those are very important impacts to be concerned about. And they do have great human health effects. But we shouldn't overlook the importance of heat and what effect it's having on our uh, atmosphere and our health. Um, so what's causing all the problems? Well, um, this pie graph helps to elucidate that. Um, you'll see on the upper left that the power sector is the single biggest uh, impact in terms of their emissions uh, from the United States. Second is the transportation sector. Um, and so the, the, clean, the uh, President's Climate Action Plan uh, was designed in part to address these two large sectors, and I'll be talking about that. First, the Clean Power Plan. Um, which was announced of, in August of 2015, published in the Federal Register in October of 2015, after we responded to 4 million public comments. Um, it's been rather controversial. There's a lot of litigation, and I'll mention that in a moment. Um, this is a map of the United States. Um, the Clean Power Plan sets CO2 emission performance rates for two different kinds of facilities. Uh, fossil, f fossil steam units, basically coal plants, that's the blue, and then natural gas combined cycle plants, gas plants. Um, and we set these two standards reflecting the best system of emission reduction, which is the statutory standards, um, using three building blocks uh, to establish that. Um, and then based upon each state's unique, unique mix of power generation in 2012, we set state-specific goals for those uh, states. And then the states have a lot of flexibility in how they meet those goals. But let's cut to the chase. Um, you all probably heard that the Supreme Court stayed the Clean Power Plan in February. This was after the DC Circuit declined to stay the, the, the Clean Power Plan. Um, and so where are we now? Well, EPA, first of all, we believe very firmly that it will be upheld on the merits. The Supreme Court, of course, did not address the merits. Um, we feel that it rests on very strong scientific and legal foundations. Um, but given the stay, we are not implementing or enforcing the Clean Power Plan at this time. Um, states do not have to submit their initial plans, which was originally due on September 6th of, of this year. Um, but for states that want to continue working on reductions in this sector and would like to work with us, we are uh, happy to provide guidance and assistance. Um, and tools and support, and many states have, have gone down that path. Obviously not all of them. Okay, so the case is not in the Supreme Court at this time, it's still in DC Circuit, um, and you may have heard that uh, just last month on May 16th, the DC Circuit on its own initiative um, decided that the case would be heard en banc, but in, in initially um, there was to be a three judge panel in fact, today was the day of the oral argument. I was all looking forward to like maybe reporting on it. Um, but, uh, but that's been delayed now to September 27th with the, the en banc uh, panel. Um, so we'll see what happens with that. So just to give you a summary of where we're at with the rules, the Clean Power Plan was just one of three rules that EPA issued uh, and published back in August, um, October rather, of 2015. Um, there was another rule, uh, the carbon pollution standards for new plants, new modified and reconstructed sources, that is still in effect. Um, that has not stayed, though there is litigation. Um, briefs are due in that, uh, initial briefs are due in mid-July, and the briefing goes through mid-November on, on that rule. Then the second bullet there is the Clean Power Plan for existing sources, that is, that's the one I talked about, that stayed. And then the third is um, a federal plan proposal and model rules. We issued model rules to the extent, remember I said states have a lot of flexibility in how they carry out their, their, uh, their goal. And so the, this was a model rule that we proposed for states that wanted to just adopt that model rule. Um, we also had a federal plan proposal uh, for states that decided not to issue a plan under the, uh, under the Clean Power Plan rule. Um, those are 
proposed, and I don't have any information about what next steps will be for those. All right, moving on to, um, to vehicles. Uh, the EPA has already issued phase one and phase two vehicle rules for passenger cars, light duty vehicles, passenger cars, SUVs, minivans, light duty trucks. That was, those were already issued going through 2025. And we will see roughly a 50% cut in emissions from cars by 2025. Um, we also issued a phase one rule for heavy duty and medium duty vehicles. Um, we then submit, uh, issued a proposal for a phase two. That's what you see up on the screen. It covers many different kinds of large vehicles. Um, we will see significant benefits. Uh, we'll see uh, in terms of cost savings as well as environmental benefits. Just to give you an example, for tractor trailers, we would expect to see as much as a 24% decrease in, in greenhouse gas emissions. Um, look for the uh, final rule by the end of the summer on the phase two. Uh, we, will, we expect to have that out by then. Okay, uh, I mentioned the, the President's Climate Action Plan in 2013. Uh, this was followed by, uh, released by the White House of a specific strategy for methane. Um, methane is more than 25 times more potent than carbon dioxide. So it's a very important gas to address. And it's also the second most prevalent greenhouse gas in the United States. Um, methane uh, comes from uh, largely the biggest sector, as you see from the pie graph, on the right is the is gas and oil and gas sector. Um, another big sector is landfills. So, so those were both addressed in the, in the uh, President's Climate Action Plan. Um, but, but methane is released from oil and gas, so is volatile organic compounds. And so it's, it's interesting to think about, you know, I mentioned the ozone alert days we have. Volatile organic compounds contribute to that ozone formation in the lower atmosphere where, where we, we breathe. Um, so uh, we issued an oil and gas rule um, that builds on a 2012 rule for, uh, for the oil and gas sector that was specifically for VOCs. But what this new rule will do is it addresses methane from the oil and gas sector and strengthens the VOC control. So not only are we addressing greenhouse gas emissions, but we're also addressing the compounding effect of, cli effect of climate change on ozone formation with this rule. There's actually three rules. Um, the first addresses um, new modified and reconstructed sources. Um, the second uh, is a source determination rule, which clarifies how to aggregate uh, different components of the oil and gas sector production line. And then the third is a, uh, a FIP, a Federal Implementation Plan for Indian Country. Uh, the, the other thing that we issued is a draft information collect request, um, which will go out to the regulated sources uh, to collect information, very technical information that will help us to formulate a rule for existing oil and gas facilities. Um, we expect the, um, let's see, oh yeah. What all of these rules will do is help to keep us on track to meet the president's goal of achieving a 40 to 45 percent reduction from the oil and gas sector in, sector in greenhouse gas emissions um, by 2025. Okay, I already mentioned landfills as one of the uh, things mentioned in the president's uh, uh, methane strategy. The last time we issued a rule in, on landfill gas was in 1996. There were a couple of proposals after that which were never finalized. We proposed a new rule um, in, in last summer um, which would address new modified and reconstructed uh, landfills. Um, and then we also proposed emission guidelines which would uh, address how the states could, um, could reduce emissions from existing landfills. Um, and again, this updates the 1996 rule. In particular, it relates somewhat to the threshold for which kind of uh, landfills will be affected. The current rule from 1996 says 50 metric tons. The 2014 proposal uh, said 40 tons, and now we've reduced it even further in this supplemental proposal from last summer to 34 metric tons. Um, we plan to take final action on the NSPS rule for new modified and reconstructed sources um, by, by mid-July. And sometime this summer, by the end of the summer, we should have the, the final uh, emission guidelines out. 
hydrofluorocarbons are high global, global warming commit, uh, pollutant that are up to 10,000 times more potent than carbon dioxide. And they're increasing by 10 to 15 percent globally per year. So it's something we need to be, right now they're not a big chunk of it, but we need to be very concerned about it. It happens that the Clean Air Act, Title VI, which addresses ozone-depleting substances, the stuff that, that destroys the ozone layer in the stratosphere that we, where we want the ozone, that set up a program for creating substitutes for those ozone-depleting substances. Well, guess what? Some of the substitutes that we've developed since 1990, we've discovered, turn out to be uh, global warming pollutants, hydrofluorocarbons. So we've issued a number of rules over the past couple of years to gradually phase out those kinds of substitutes under our significant new alternatives policy under Section 612 of the Clean Air Act, which essentially looks at a variety of different factors in determining what is an acceptable substitute for an ozone-depleting substance. You can see some of the considerations on the bottom of the slide. And one of them is global warming potential. So we have been shifting uh, through these rules to expanding the list of acceptable alternatives with low global warming potential and phasing out and ruling as a, in unacceptable those that have high global warming potential. Um, oh, and um, the most recent rule for that was just proposed in April of this year. Just uh, before I go, I, I want to spend a couple of minutes on adaptation. Um, EPA uh, and Region 2 in particular, we've been very involved in, in adaptation um, to climate change. One thing I want to focus on is um, an, uh, an effort that grew out of actually Hurricane Sandy. Because after Hurricane Sandy, um, the National Disaster Recovery Framework kicked in, which required federal agencies to work together to recover from the, the hurricane. And um, in doing so, we were partnering with other federal agencies and state and local government. Well, the partnership was so successful that these entities decided to continue their work going forward to build resilience to climate change while encouraging economically, environmentally, and social sustainability development, recognizing that we want to rebuild in a way that's in low-risk areas from climate change impacts and away from flood zones. Um, EPA, FEMA, New York State DEC, New York State Department of, of, of State, Nassau, Suffolk counties, um, and later, um, there were a number of other partners, including the Nature Conservancy and Stony Brook University, worked together um, on, on um, adaptation issues. The launch event was actually a couple of years ago called Accepting the Tide. And out of that came a plan to work on a number of different efforts on, on, that relate to adaptation. Um, two of them are ecosystem services valuation and health impact assessment. And so now all these, these partners are collaborating in a facilitated process to um, develop strategies that will incorporate the communities that we're serving in these, some of these are pilots, they're pretty new throughout the country. Um, and we're doing things, for example, to give you an example of how ecosystem services valuation works, um, wetlands we know can, can help to stem the inundation from, from climate change induced storm surges. Um, if we have more wetlands, then what is the value to us economically? How many homes will we be saving if we have wetlands restoration in a particular community? What's the economic value of saving those homes? So, and what's the health impact of doing that? Um, so those are the kinds of things, really groundbreaking stuff that's happening. Um, there's another, a number of other uh, adaptation efforts we uh, were embarking on and actually steeped in which I don't have time to talk to, to right now, uh, but maybe during the q and I'll get to it. Anyway, thank, thank you very much.
Um, thank you. Okay, so uh, our final speaker on today's panel is Liliana Villatora, the chief of the Air Branch for EPA Region 2. She joined Region 2 in 1996, spent more than a decade working on Superfund matters, and since 2007 has been in the Air Branch. She has managed complex multi-party uh, judicial enforcement matters under both the Clean Air Act and under CERCLA, and is handling many other matters at EPA. Liliana? Thank you. Um, good morning, everyone. I uh, want to start by posing a question. Uh, what would you say if I asked you, what is the one thing that you use the most? I've had several people answer that differently than I would. I would say clean air. And I would hope that it's clean air all the time. <laughs> anyway, uh, this is my disclaimer. That's my opinion. <laughs> and everything that I'll say today is my opinion. Um, Anyway, uh, we uh, breathe about 3,000 gallons of air each day, and we can go days without food. Gandhi actually went 21 days without food, and I hear that some people can go up to 48 days without food, uh, hours without water. Um, researchers at Duke University say about 100 uh, with average temperatures. Uh, but you can only go a few minutes without air. I hear that uh, some women can actually die for like five minutes uh, for pearls, but you know, that's about it. Um, and I think most of us couldn't do that. So we have a lot of pollutants in our air, and in order for us to live healthy lives, we need to have clean air. Uh, we have, for instance, benzene, which is a known human carcinogen, and uh, it was a big um, source of pollution at the San Juan de Coke facility, which you have already heard about and we'll hear a little more about in a few minutes. Uh, we also have mercury that um, comes out of our power plants, and it's a neurotoxin. It can really affect children's health and functions, and it, if you are really exposed to it, you may even die, which is uh, you know, something to really consider and take in. Uh, hydrogen sulfide, uh, it can cause everything from tremors, nausea, and in very high concentrations, it can lead to extremely rapid and unconscious, unconsciousness and death. Um, the one thing about hydrogen sulfide that I find amazing and most disturbing is that after a few minutes of being exposed to it, your olfactory nerve actually uh, will freeze you won't smell it anymore, uh, but you could actually continue to take it in, and that will cause death and has in the past. Um, so now I, I just want to turn over to Tana Wanda Coke uh, for a, a minute, and I want to say that you just heard from Joe about this wonderful regulations that we're passing, and you know, uh, wonderful regulations work only if you also have a strong enforcement program. And for that, you need to work side by side with all the other regulators, New York State, New Jersey, Puerto Rico, and the Virgin Islands for us, but also with the community. As Caroline described this morning, we had um, a really interesting case in Tanawanda, New York, where we had citizens that really became involved in figuring out what was wrong in their community. They knew there was something wrong and they went out there and did something about it. I wanna describe the operation that you had at the tunnel on the Coke facility a little bit first. They uh, take coal and they put it in really huge ovens and they crank up the heat to about 1100 to 1300 Celsius and this produces uh, emissions that have volatile organic chemicals and this gas that uh, comes out of it is called coke oven gas. Then it gets piped over to a, an area that's, um, that has several pipes and that area also is supposed to collect gas. But at this facility, they were not collecting the gas well, they were not controlling the emissions and we uh, ended up taking some action. Um, the local residents collected samples in buckets and they brought them to uh, EPA and DEC. And uh, 
EPA funded a study that was conducted by DEC, which confirmed that there were high levels of benzene in the air for this uh, community. And that not only did it confirm that uh, we had the high levels, but it also confirmed that the primary source was this uh, facility in Tano on the Coke. Some of the other uh, emissions from the facility also cause uh, respiratory problems and asthma, which are a huge concern in that community. So in starting in about 2009, uh, EPA began to conduct Im investigations with New York State DEC. We had uh, nine facility inspections, uh, six requests for information that went out to the facility, two notices of violation, and eight administrative orders that were issued. So a lot was done. We found violations of the Clean Air Act, the Clean Water Act, and the Emergency Planning and Community Right to Know Act. Uh, and so we found that they were not moving fast enough. And what you're seeing here is some special technology that we actually ordered the facility to use in order to figure out exactly how much benzene there was in the air. So this is the differential absorption lighter uh, technology and it uses lasers to scan the area and it accurately monitors the source and volume of emissions. Now the first thing that you need to figure out is what type of pollutant you have in the air. You can't use this just because you feel that there may be a problem. You actually need to know which pollutant you're looking for. We already knew that we were looking for benzene and so then we, um, we had them use the technology. It also uh, has a MET station that accounts for the winds in the air and it can measure exactly how much benzene is out there. And that's exactly what it did. So we got the test results from uh, dial and we found that Tano on the Coke was emitting 90.8 tons per year of benzene. This is the largest source of benzene emissions in New York. They also represent 95% of the total benzene emissions in Erie and Niagara counties. And the local residential neighborhoods that were in the area are low income and envir environmental justice areas. And you know, we took it very seriously. So I'm gonna be concentrating on the Clean Air Act portion. You've heard from Pat about the, um, the criminal part and there, there were also the APRA and water uh, portions. But these are the violations that we found, general duty violations. We also found uh, all sorts of niche violations for benzene emissions, uh, equipment leaks, uh, benzene waste operations. Uh, they were in violation of the national emissions standards for coke oven batteries, the COVID COVID Act, the New York SIP, their own Title V permit. It was uh, quite a mess actually. And so we partnered with the Department of Justice who came in to help us uh, ensure that they did the right thing. So they've agreed to install pollution controls and they are putting in a bag house, or actually they have already put in a bag house and are collecting the emissions that are coming out of the Coke ovens. And they've also agreed to pay a million dollars to the state, a million dollars uh, as a environmental beneficial project to the state, one and 1.75 million to the United States, uh, plus a SEP, and the SEP is a wetlands preservation SEP, and that is related to their Clean Water Act violations, and the, um, the penalties themselves are actually for violations of all statutes. Um, however, on the air side, uh, they have agreed to do a lot of injunctive relief. So we have them replacing the leaking equipment. We have them putting in the bag house. We have them putting in um, a special reduction, um, uh, they're putting in a special controlled reductions, um, I'm sorry, um, a special technology to resist con uh, er the emissions from the smokestacks. And they are also undergoing a comprehensive evaluation by a third party of their LDAR, uh, and so that's their leak detection. And they are, have really changed the facility uh, where right now we have about 
an 86% reduction in benzene emissions in the area. So the people are really seeing a different uh, a change in uh, how the facility is run. Uh, these are some of the benefits of the settlement. Uh, we are going to be saving the community from uh, taking in 324,000 pounds a year of particular matter, 120,000 pounds a year of benzene, and 700,000 pounds of ammonia. Uh, okay, uh, I'm gonna move on uh, to uh, mercury and uh, the mercury and air toxic standards. So last time I was here, I spoke about uh, this regulation, which is uh, really important. We are uh, regulating the uh, mercury, acid gases, and other toxic pollutants emitted from affected coal and oil power power plants. Uh, implementation of MATS will prevent 90% of the mercury in coal burned in power plants from being emitted into the air, and it will reduce 88% of gas emissions from power plants. They will, it will cut 41% of sulfur dioxide emissions from power plants also. There are about 1,400 coal and oil-fired electric generating units at 600 power plants in the United States. And you, we are going to see about 50% of all mercury emitted into the air that comes out of the power plants, uh, as well as 75% of all acid gases in the United States that are coming out of these power plants uh, actually being curtailed. And that's really important. Uh, as far as mass compliance, everyone was supposed to comply with mass by April of 2015, but uh, certain facilities could get a one-year extension if they really needed it, and the Title V permitting authority, which for most uh, facilities was actually the, uh, the states, uh, they, so they got an extra year. There were a few facilities in the country that uh, got an ex that are getting an extra year, and it's because it is beyond their control. The owner and operator cannot possibly put in the controls by uh, April of 2016, and FERC and other uh, agencies have advised the EPA that we are actually going to have an adverse localized impact on electric re reliability, and for that reason, these five facilities around the country are going to get one extra year to come into compliance uh, with MATS, and that's being done through an administrative order. Um, last year, the Supreme Court uh, held that we had interpreted the Clean Air Act um, Section 112 N1 wrong, and that we had to actually consider costs when regulating power plants. Uh, so that's exactly what we did. We uh, took a step back and we uh, considered costs. I want to point out that the Supreme Court and the D.C. Circuit Court both decided that they would not vacate this rule. They were going to give EPA extra time in order to um, figure out how to document the fact that we did have enough cost documentation. And we have done that in December of 2015, EPA proposed the supplemental finding that a consideration of cost does not alter EPA's previous determination that it is appropriate and necessary to regulate air toxic emissions from coal and oil fired EGUs. Um, April 14th of this year, we have confirmed that after considering costs, it is still appropriate and necessary to regulate air toxins, including mercury from power plants. Uh, so we uh, looked at four metrics, uh, the revenue, capital expenditures, retail electricity rates, and the potential impact on reliability. So revenue, uh, power plants do make a lot of money, and the mass is just a small fraction of their overall sales. It's just 2.7 to 3.5% of annual electricity rates from 2000 to 2011. As far as capital expenditures, it falls right within the range of historical uh, variability for capital expenditures during a 10-year period for any power plant, so they're not going to be spending more money than they have in the past. For uh, rates going up, uh, we think it's going to be 
about three cents per kilowatt hour, which represents a natural average increase of 3.1%, which is well within the range of retail price fluctuations over a 10 year period. And as far as reliability, all analysis shows that retirement of resulting from mats is not going to adversely impact the ability of the power sector to meet demand for electricity. So, um, I, so then EPA also came out with a, with a second independent approach that supports the appropriate finding. Uh, this was a benefit cost analysis that was conducted at the time MATS was issued in 2012. And what it says is that we are going to be saving $9 in healthcare costs for every dollar that we spend fixing the power plants. And this is almost too good to be true, or it sounds too good to be true, but it actually is not. And I think that it's more important for everyone to be active and at work than uh, to be homesick uh, and spending the money on healthcare. Uh, these are some of the health effects the rule um, will have. Uh, we are going to uh, save 11,000 people from premature death, uh, 2,800 uh, cases of bronchitis a year, 4,700 heart attacks, 130,000 asthma attacks, and uh, hospital emergency rooms will go down by 5,700. Restricted activity days are 3.2 million, which is huge, especially for children. And we'll have $540,000 uh, days that people will not be missing work. Uh, I've just been told that uh, I'm running out of time, but I do want you to uh, take a look at uh, what I put together on some bent plan emissions we have. NOx, SO2, and CO that's coming out of the cement plants. And we have one cement plant in particular that we took an enforcement action against. They went over the limit that they had on their permit. So they, uh, this is a cement plant in Ponce, Puerto Rico. As you know, Puerto Rico is going through a big uh, financial crisis, and that has affected a lot of its industry. This plant uh, used to be one of the largest producers of cement in the United States, and now it is uh, only running about four months a year. So they have taken a huge hit uh, as far as profits. However, they have agreed to install uh, pollution controls so that they will be decreasing their annual NOx emissions. And the uh, emissions will be reduced by 55% from the, their baseline emissions, which we got uh, in 1997. And this will be uh, a really great, um, it, it's a really great result for the people of Puerto Rico. The one thing that I want to highlight here is that the children of Puerto Rico have, 30% uh, of all children have asthma. And if you happen to live in a housing project, there's a 40% chance that you have asthma. And you, you have to really consider that when you speak to the community, they feel that a lot of the emissions are coming from the facilities. However, they also don't want to put these um, facilities out of business. So working together with the facilities is what we're trying to do to ensure that there are jobs, but also that people are being protected. And as a final thought, I, and I want you to consider this. Every day, I speak to my children and I ask them, do you actually need it? Because they always ask for something. <laughs> and you know, every time that we put something into a landfill, it is producing methane. If it's construction and debris material, it's producing hydrogen sulfide. And that affects us all. So do you actually need it? And if you don't actually need it, can you get it somewhere else? You know, if it's a baseball bat, did the kid next door already go through T-ball? Can you go and borrow it? Or, you know, if you know that the kid across the street is going to go into T-ball and you have an, an extra bat, you know, walk it over, uh, offer it to them. And as a last thought, if you 
really, really just needed to buy it and you're done with it, now consider whether you can recycle it. If you can recycle it, please do so because that's one less item that's going into that landfill. And you are going to have less emissions coming out and that is gonna help us all. We can pass as many regulations as we want. We can do uh, you know, all this enforcement, but it is really up to us. And I think that if we just unite and start putting thing, less things into those landfills, we will make an actual difference. Thank you. Thank you, Liliana. So we have time for a few questions, and I'm going to actually take the moderator's prerogative and ask the first one. Uh, my question, Joe, is for you. Um, so even with all of the ambitious action that EPA has undertaken under the Obama administration, including all of the recent initiatives and the in-the-pipeline initiatives that you identified, the methane rules for landfills and oil and gas, the HFCs reduction under the Montreal Protocol, um, the Clean Power Plan, um, the the rule for heavy duty vehicles. Um, the, a, a recent study conducted by the Rhodium Group best, based on the United States State Department's own analyses as well shows that we are not, um, even with all of those things, um, fully succeeding. Um, and even with an optimistic set of projections around land use and sequestration effects, um, we're still somewhere between three to 5% short of our Paris goal. Um, so my question is, what else is EPA, does EPA have in the pipeline in order to get us to, uh, to help fill that gap between where we are and where, we want, where we've pledged to be? Okay, I, have, I haven't seen that particular study, but um, I do know there are studies out there showing it'll be, it could be a challenge to get to our, our, our goal. Um, we are on target to meet the Cancun-Copenhagen pledge uh, by 2020. So we're, we're already on target for that. We made it more aggressive for 2025. 2025 isn't tomorrow. So um, there are a lot of things that, um, that can be done between now and then. Um, I can't speak to anything that's not public, that's in the, you know, in the pipeline. Um, but there's a lot of opportunities, not just with the Clean Air Act, but um, with, transport, with, uh, with energy efficiency, DOE initiatives, uh, as you mentioned, uh, we may have another agreement under the Montreal Protocol by the end of this year that's going, that could result in a 0.5 degree reduction in, um, in, in the increase in temperature that we're going to have because of climate change. So I think there's a lot of opportunity out there. Um, and we have to remember that we, we have to be vigilant and keep moving the ball forward but um, there's, a, there's still a lot of untapped um, opportunities, and we, and we have quite a number of years to get there. Thank you. Questions? Yes, Steve. Um, my question is, is for Joe, and it's, it's uh, uh, it, I was struck by, by two of the things you said, not relating to power plants, but to transportation and HFCs. Um, it looks as if the net benefits you're projecting from your transportation reduction of greenhouse gases, um, $200 million, $200 billion, are four, time, four or five times as much as what EPA projects from the Clean Power Plan in terms of net benefits. And, um, and I was thinking about the implications of that for developing countries, where you talked about, which you mentioned in HFCs. Most developing countries do not have serious transit programs. They rely upon trucks, uh, which are very old and diesel-based and the like, and probably their percentage of greenhouse gases is higher even from the transportation sector. Um, and now you've mentioned that they're getting into HFCs. Would it be helpful for EPA or what, if any, plans does EPA have to think about how the United States might help developing countries um, improve their transportation systems to get comparable greenhouse gas benefits and switch away from HFCs? Well, uh, one of the things that is in the Paris Agreement is a commitment by developed countries to assist developing countries with technology transfer and finance and create the infrastructure they need uh, to have low carbon emitting technologies. 
Um, so I think that that's a big part of this agreement and I think was one of the reasons why developing countries signed on to it because they don't have the funds to do it and they need the technology transfer. Um, um, EPA has been involved in supporting efforts by the State Department in many parts of the world uh, to help uh, reduce emissions um, and I don't know any of the details about what we're planning for the future but um, I suspect we're going to be quite involved in that. Um, in any event, the United States, um, as a party to the, to the, uh, the Paris Agreement, um, will be uh, one of the developed countries that's going to assist with technology transfer. Um, so I, th I think, that, and, and the reason why that's important is that it makes it possible for the developing countries also to put forward more aggressive uh, commitments at, at the five-year cycles that that agreement requires. Uh, so I think, I think we'll be seeing a very positive movement. Um, the Paris Agreement doesn't solve the problem right here and now. We know that we've got a lot of work to do, but it sets in motion a process um, that I think is going to, to get where we need to be with the developing countries. That's my personal opinion. You know, I'm not working for the State Department or in EPA's Office of International Affairs, but, but I, you know, my read of the agreement is it's a great process that's going to take us on the right path. Great. Thank you. In the back. Hi, this is a question for Leanne. Um, because you were just speaking about promoting recycling so much, one of the topics that we found researching waste, waste to energy is that even though we do have curbside recycling in a lot of places, especially in New York City, what we found is that the recycling is not actually getting to recycling facilities. It's really just ending up in landfills anyway. Is the EPA looking into this and, and how are they sort of enforcing that what we as a community think is recycling is actually recycling. I think that um, the EPA has left a lot of the recycling to the states and the states tend to try and get things to the proper places. If you do find that there are things that are not properly being recycled at that point, I think that you do need to contact the state authorities and you know if there is a really high problem with a certain uh, let's say waste hauler that's not getting it to the right place at that point I think that you may have other issues and if you report it uh, something will be done about it yes yeah I have a question for Joe Joe, you, as an attorney working in the area where you do with you discussing the implementation of the President's air plans, air control plans, how do you translate that into actual uh, regulations and standards or mission standards? And is there a process whereby you coordinate with uh, the people in the enforcement division? At, on, or do you actually go to D.C.? and try to get uh, effluent stand I mean, uh, mission standards promulgated on, uh, in some way to implement your conclusions of what should be done? So the, um, the, the President's Climate Action Plan sets a national agenda and, um, and, and what I was referring to in large part were national rules. Um, as you can see, they're, they're just in the development stage or recently been developed. Um, so we haven't had a lot of enforcement. There has been enforcement of the light duty vehicle rules. There was once one settlement involving about a $100 million penalty. Um, so yeah, I think that's to come. Um, as Liliana pointed out, none of these rules are, are, are very viable without an enforcement program. Um, and we will overlay our existing enforcement program onto these new rules. Um, so that, that's how I see it happening. Be available to the public to to read as to how EPA came to the conclusions that it did as to the standards they actually set? Oh, so the standards that are set, um, there's very thorough explanation in the preamble to the Federal Register notices and in technical support documents. And in fact, for all of these rules, we had, we had a very significant public engagement beyond just the regular notice and comment. So um, there, was meet, there were meetings with, with with hundreds of different organizations and individuals who have expertise, um, 
leading up to most of these rules being even proposed. Mm -hmm. um, so, but yes, you can find our explanation in the preambles to all these rules. We have time for one more question. Yes. Uh, they were collecting air samples, and they were collecting in and around the Tonawanda um, residential neighborhoods, but also around the facility. Wonderful. Well, join me in thanking our panelists for the second panel. <laughs>
Uh, we'll come back at 1045 for the panel on the climate change issues. At um, noon or so, we'll move directly to the panel on contaminated site cleanup and redevelopment. Uh, we'll then have a 45 minute lunch break, though depending on how far behind we actually wind up getting, that may have to be shortened. Um, and then we'll have out, the, there will be a lunch buffet right outside the room. Um, we did look into having reusable plates uh, to reduce the amount of waste, but that would have upped the expense for everybody involved and such are the trade-offs. We will have some, some plastic waste. Um, once you grab your lunch, you can eat that. Either you can bring it back in here or you can eat it at the tables that are set up outside or in the sort of seating area out in the front of the law school. Um, we will then have our keynote address um, from Regional Administrator Judith Enk. That's followed by our commissioner's speak panel. Um, and then there's a refreshment break and then our final panel of the day which covers water issues. Uh, we'll adjourn um, as close to five as we can but more likely around 5.15. So we have uh, a great deal to cover today um, and we're gonna dive in in just one moment. Um, the whole day is being videotaped um, and we're gonna post the video on the Columbia website. So beware that your questions uh, as well as the answers will be recorded for posterity. Um, each speaker today will have a maximum of 15 minutes and we're going to keep strictly to that time limit. Uh, we have um, a volunteer student in the front row who will be holding up time cards for our speakers. So without any further ado, I'll turn it over to Eric Schaff to introduce our first panel of the day. Thank you. Good morning, everyone. Thank you, Michael. Um, I'm Eric Schaff. I'm regional counsel for EPA Region 2. And in this first panel, we're going to hear about the region's civil and criminal enforcement programs, as well as the latest on environmental justice and citizen science. Um, we're going to have questions at the end, so we'll do the 15 minutes per speaker and then questions at the end. Um, our first speaker will be Paul Simon. Paul Simon is the Deputy Regional Counsel of EPA Region 2, and I can say with complete confidence that he is simply the best Deputy Regional Counsel in the agency. And that makes me very lucky indeed. Paul has also served as Region 2's Senior Policy Advisor on Climate Change Issues and has spent time in headquarters as Acting Deputy Director of the Office of Groundwater and Drinking Water. Paul joined EPA in 1985 as a staff attorney, became a first-line supervisor in ORC, Office of Regional Counsel for the New York Superfund, uh, Caribbean Superfund uh, branch in 1989. Before coming to EPA, Paul was a litigation attorney with the Pennsylvania Department of Environmental Resources. Paul will be giving us the general enforcement update. Paul. Good morning. Thank you, Eric. Um, Usually we do the civil enforcement update a little later in the program, but this time we'll start off. Maybe that's good. We'll start at sort of a 10,000 foot level and as we go through the day, you'll get more into the, the details. So I better talk fast. Uh, I have a lot to cover. Uh, to advance the slides of this. Okay. All right, so this is just a uh, overview of what I'll be covering very quickly. I'm gonna uh, touch on the national enforcement initiatives that EPA has, uh, the current ones and the new ones. Uh, I'll talk uh, a little bit about a few additional regional enforcement priorities. Uh, then I'll speak about the Next Generation Compliance Initiative, a very important uh, priority. I want to make sure that you know about the new e-disclosure portal that EPA set up having to do with the audit policy. And then if I have a second, I also want to let you know about uh, some changes that are coming to uh, the statutory civil penalty amounts uh, under our various statutes. That could be significant. So the mantra, you know, very much continues to be uh, that we need to uh, maintain a tough enforcement program. That's been the mantra, it continues to be. We want to protect communities by reducing pollution, uh, requiring compliance. We want to deter others from violating. We want to maintain a level playing field so that the people who do comply, comply are not put at an uh, economic disadvantage. And this approach applies to all of our statutes. And as we're doing this, we also want to keep environmental justice in mind. Environmental justice is something that we want to consider throughout uh, our enforcement efforts, including in the way we do targeting. So these are our current national enforcement initiatives. Every three years, EPA headquarters sets uh, these NEIs, and we're nearing the end of the current three-year cycle. Uh, you can see the, the current uh, NEIs listed there. Uh, the first one, uh, reducing air pollution from the largest sources, that deals with 
um, enforcing the, the new source review and, and PSD requirements of the Clean Air Act. Uh, a recent example of that is, is the consent decree that we did uh, in the last year with Guardian Industries uh, that requires them to install state-of-the-art emission controls and, uh, and continuous emission monitors at their glass manufacturing plants in, in New York State and, and six other states around the country. The second one, cutting toxic air pollution. I think a little later uh, you'll hear from Liliana about uh, a great uh, uh, environmental success we had in pursuing Tano on the Coke, where we got a consent decree that cuts uh, toxic air pollution. Number five, Region 2 does a great deal of work having to do with keeping raw, so raw sewage and contaminated stormwater out of our nation's waters. And I think you'll be hearing from Phyllis later today about uh, some examples of that. So uh, the new, new three-year cycle uh, of NEIs, uh, last February, uh, EPA headquarters just announced what the new NEIs will be. There will be seven. Uh, I think Region 2 will be invested uh, in all of them. Uh, four of the seven are just being carried over from the current cycle. Those are the, these four. Those are currently our priorities and will continue to be some of our uh, big priorities. And then the other three, uh, two of them are new and one of them is sort of an expanded uh, expanded initiative. So this first one, uh, keeping industrial pollutants out of the nation's waters, that deals with, you know, Clean Water Act enforcement against uh, chemical and metal manufacturing plants and food processing facilities, which cause nutrient and, and metal pollution of the waters of the U.S. The second one uh, deals with reducing the risk of serious accidents at facilities that handle extremely hazardous substances, like ammonia fr refrigeration and chemical manufacturing facilities. This is an area that, that uh, Region 2 has already been very active in, and we're going to continue to be. An example of this is uh, the enforcement action we took under the general duty clause of the Clean Air Act uh, against DuPont after they had uh, an explosion at their plant in Tonawanda, New York. Uh, so because of our enforcement action, they spent about $7 million uh, on various corrective actions. And last year, they agreed to pay a penalty of $723,000 and also uh, pay for um, equipment to be given and training to be given to first responders. Uh, the third one you see listed there, that's an expanded version of the existing air toxics initiative. So now it's going to cover not just the Clean Air Act, but RICRA. Uh, so we're going to be, in addition to addressing illegal emissions of toxic air pollutants from leaks and flares, uh, we're going to be uh, looking at air emissions from large product storage tanks and hazardous waste uh, TSD facilities or, or large generators. We've already started, do started doing inspections of these sorts of facilities in Region 2, and in fact we we brought an enforcement action against one facility in New Jersey uh, a month or two ago. Um, in Region 2, obviously, we do a lot more than just the national enforcement priorities. We really uh, we're working under, on enforcement under all of our statutes and many, many environmental uh, regulatory programs. Just a few of our uh, regional uh, enforcement priorities are, are listed here. Uh, Safe Drinking Water Act enforcement continues to be uh, and compliance assistance uh, continue to be a real priority for us, and we work closely with the states on that. For example, in the last several years, we brought, uh, we brought enforcement actions against a number of municipalities uh, for non-compliance for the Safe Drinking Water Act. Uh, we sued Westchester County uh, recently for not following the surface water treatment rule, and then last year the county signed a consent decree requiring it to make uh, capital improvements and pay a penalty of more than $1 million. Uh, also under the Safe Drinking Water Act, where, uh, you know, lead in drinking water has been in the news a lot lately. We're working with the states to review compliance of all public water systems with the lead and copper rule and to help school districts uh, uh, who are dealing with lead in drinking water issues. The second one I've listed there, making a visible difference in communities. I think we've talked about that in the last uh, couple editions of this conference. Uh, that's an EPA administrator priority. And in Region 2, we've selected about six communities that we're really trying to focus on uh, under this initiative, uh, six overburdened communities, including Newburgh and Newark and Camden and the Martin Pena community in, in Puerto Rico. This initiative goes beyond enforcement, but, but within the enforcement realm, we have brought a number of enforcement actions in, in these communities in the last few years, particularly under the Clean Water Act and the Safe Drinking Water Act. I've listed FIFRA uh, also. Uh, we continue to have a number of enforcement cases under the federal pesticide law, uh, for example, where companies were illegally using or marketing um, 
uh, unregistered pesticides. And then you may have heard about this horrible incident that happened uh, in the Virgin Islands about a year ago where a family who was staying in a condo was, was seriously injured uh, because methyl bromide had illegally been used as a fumigant inside the condo. Uh, uh, we later found out that unfortunately some uh, pesticide companies were doing the same thing in Puerto Rico. So we are pursuing uh, enforcement uh, there. Um, and then uh, sadly, you know, the lead-based paint rules, they're not hard to comply with and yet Unfortunately, we still see a lot of noncompliance with these rules. Um, last fall, uh, EPA nationally announced uh, 75 enforcement actions taken just over the one preceding year against companies that did building renovations without following our uh, renovation repair and uh, painting rules. You know, and lead dust is obviously a very big problem. Uh, it's a major source of lead poisoning uh, of children. So please, if you have any clients who are doing or arranging for building renovations, please make sure that uh, they're following uh, those rules. Okay, next generation compliance. That's, uh, I think you've heard about that in one or two of our last uh, versions of this conference. It continues to be a very big overarching priority of our uh, national enforcement pro uh, program. It involves using new strategies that are going to increase the rate of compliance, even at the same time as you know our resources are, are flat or declining. Uh, so it's an interconnected bunch of tra uh, strategies. It involves designing regulations and permits smarter so that compliance is more likely, uh, using advanced monitoring technologies, um, innovative enforcement. I'll talk about that more in a minute. Uh, transparency, and what that means is you know the more information we can get out to the public about what a company is or isn't doing to comply probably, you know, the more likely it is that the company is going to comply. And it includes a, an electronic reporting piece. Uh, so as I said, these things are all sort of interconnected. So for example, uh, EPA issued the NPDES uh, electronic reporting rule last uh, September. And that's not only going to make reporting more accurate, more efficient, hopefully more timely, it also helps transparency because it makes it easier for us to get the data out to the public. Uh, uh, monitoring technologies are, are constantly uh, improving and we're trying to take advantage of that. Uh, so, so this piece of next gen just involves that, trying to do, use things like infrared cameras that, that help us find emissions that otherwise we wouldn't be able to spot. Uh, there's any number of different types of advanced equipment. There's the GMAP device, which is, it combines GPS and a mobile air pollution uh, monitoring equipment so you can more accurately pinpoint where the air pollution is coming from. Advanced monitoring is also about getting the data in real time so you can, act, you can uh, act more quickly as opposed to having to take samples, send them to a lab and wait several weeks for the results. Uh, you know, using things like remote sensing equipment, uh, for example, we were able to find that at some refineries, the flares were giving off way more VOCs than the company had been estimating. So this resulted in us bringing enforcement actions against uh, uh, BP Whiting and Marathon Petroleum, for example. I hope you're all aware of the, uh, the ECHO website, Enforcement and Compliance History Online uh, website that EPA has. It is a powerful tool. It's constantly being you know, improved and, and new features built into it. It's a great example of transparency. Uh, people can, anyone, any member of the public can go in there, search for individual facilities, thousands of regulated facilities. Uh, there's data about their compliance uh, or non-compliance in there. They can, people can build their own maps, uh, uh, build their own sort of graphs showing trends. It's, it's a very powerful uh, tool, so I recommend that uh, to you. You know, again, if we can get that sort of information into the public's hands, we think it's more likely that the regulated parties uh, will comply. I mentioned that another piece of, uh, of NextGen is innovative enforcement, so let me just talk about a little bit about what that means. So it includes things like using data analytics, so a, EPA in the states crunching the data in a more sophisticated way so that we can find non-compliance more effectively than we maybe uh, did before. But it also includes uh, including some of these next-gen tools I talked about, you know, electronic reporting and, and advanced monitoring and so on, right in the settlement document itself. Um, in your uh, materials, you'll find a memo that was written by uh, Cynthia Giles, the head of our National Enforcement Program, 
uh, which I really recommend you read. It's about five pages long. Uh, and in that memo, she basically directed all the regional enforcement folks, like us, to consider next-gen enforcement tools in, in all of their enforcement cases and include the tool right in the settlement document wherever, wherever they can. And we're really uh, taking this to heart. Uh, in your materials, uh, you'll see uh, a document that gives highlights of, you know, examples of where we've done this. And if you go on EPA's website, Next Generation Compliance website, you'll see many, many more examples. Um, so we're trying to do things like uh, include advanced monitoring requirements in the, in the consent decree, uh, include requirements that uh, someone arrange for an independent third party uh, to do an audit of their compliance and their rules about how to make sure it's really, really independent. Uh, include uh, requirements that uh, the entity post data on a public website so that the public can see whether they're complying uh, with the consent decree. Uh, the many Region 2, uh, there's some recent Region 2 examples of us using, uh, including NextGen in our settlements. For example, we have an, we've done a number of RICRA underground storage tank uh, settlements that have required the companies to have automated sensors on every single underground storage tank and then that then automatically sends data to a central monitoring station, which could be an iPhone in, in the, you know, the health and safety officer's pocket. You know, so that person can get real-time data about whether there's a leak from a tank. Uh, we've done that in a number of uh, RICRA uh, settlements. Th these are just a few other examples of us including NextGen in, uh, in consent decrees, uh, by several involving uh, Parties needing to install uh, uh, fence line monitors uh, uh, to see if, if the pollution is leaving the facility, uh, requirements to post data on a public website. Uh, uh, the one with the municipality of Arecibo is not just posting data, but the company, the municipality has to have the website include some interactive tools that let citizens uh, report pollution and ask questions. I'm running short on time, but uh, you may have heard about uh, moving on now to the latest in terms of our audit policy. There's this new uh, e-disclosure portal. It's a more efficient way uh, for EPA to receive disclosures under our audit policy and small business compliance policy. We've gotten thousands of disclosures over the years under, under these policies, uh, and it's very, <laughs> it's very resource intensive. And it was taking us longer than we would like sometimes to be able to process these disclosures. So, so this new uh, portal, uh, is a much more automated uh, a system. And how your disclosure is processed depends on whether it's an EPCRA violation or other types of violations. Uh, and you know, the reason why EPCRA is sort of treated differently is, believe it or not, something like 55% of all of the disclosures that have ever been made to EPA under the audit policy are for simple EPCRA reporting violations. So those are handled differently in a more uh, dispositive way under the, the new e-disclosure portal. Um, to get into, I don't have time to go into all the details of this, but uh, if there are web, EPA's website um, dealing with e-disclosure has all the information you need to know, uh, Q&As. Uh, we think it really is going to streamline uh, dealing with these disclosures. The underlying conditions of the policies haven't changed. You know, you have to uh, voluntarily discover the violations. You need to promptly disclose them. You need to fix them. You need to prevent future violations from happening. All those conditions still apply. This is just a much more efficient way of processing these disclosures. And then lastly, and this may sound like sort of a, a mundane thing, but because we've been, we've been adjusting our civil penalties every few years because of inflation for a number of years now, that's not new. But what's new is that Congress passed a law last November that changed the way we're supposed to do it. Uh, the formula has changed. And so July 1st, uh, EPA and other agencies too have to issue what's called a catch-up rule uh, that's going to change the statutory civil penalty amounts in our statutes. You know, for example, statute says such and s such and such violation, you know, penalties of up to $25,000 a day. It's those numbers I'm talking about. So those numbers are by and large going to increase. Under some of our statutes, they're going to go up significantly um, under this, this catch-up rule. And then every year thereafter, every single year, agencies have to do an, an additional inflation adjustment. And another change is that w uh, under the old system, it depended on when your violation happened. Depending on, like if you had a, a set of violations that spanned five years, you might have different penalty numbers depending on when it happened. Under this new system, that doesn't, that's not the case anymore. It's whenever, 
the penalties are assessed. Uh, now, how this actually gets translated into our penalty policies, we're figuring that out. So stay tuned. Okay, I think I'm out of time. Sorry if that went really fast, but thank you very much. Thank you, Paul. Um, our next speaker will be Pat Hick. Pat Hick is the Associate Regional Counsel for Criminal Enforcement in EPA Region 2. Pat joined Region 2 in 1990, and before heading the criminal team, she worked as an attorney in the New Jersey Superfund branch. Immediately after law school, Pat served as a staff attorney for the Interstate Sanitation Commission, which I guess is now the Interstate um, Environmental Commission, right? Pat will be speaking to us about the EPA Criminal Enforcement Program. Pat? Do I um, get it to be a full screen? Yeah. That's what the civil enforcement did. It's the full. Oh. Hmm. Down here. Sorry. So I'll give you a little bit of the, uh, the background. So what I'll do for folks who haven't attended one of these before, I'll talk about the, uh, the program in general, and then um, as it uh, applies to Region 2, and then also I'll talk about some specific cases. And this is the disclaimer, so hopefully you've had enough time to read it. Um, <laughs> so uh, the crim you. Criminal Investigation Division has approximately 180 agents nationwide CID. They are all within the Office of Criminal Enforcement, Forensics, and Training that's based in headquarters. Each uh, region has a CID area office that's supervised by a special agent. Region 2 offices are in Manhattan and Syracuse, Buffalo, Edison, and San Juan. But in addition, there are offices throughout the country that have other agents. And just to mention, too, there's a um, lab in Denver that will come in and do sampling and analysis for us, and there's also a computer forensics lab in Jacksonville that assists. Um, there are, there's also legal support within OSEFT, but each region has its own regional criminal enforcement uh, council. And in Region 2, we have two full-time attorneys based in New York and three part-time attorneys, one of whom is based in San Juan. So why develop a criminal case? Well, it's one of the tools that we have available, and it can be used for um, actions that are intentional, uh, egregious or done by repeat offenders. Whoops. Um, so in addition, their criminal penalties oftentimes are more uh, severe than uh, civil penalties. And also, uh, deterrence, as noted in the last uh, bullet, uh, can't be passed along as a cost of doing business. Uh, the, the criminal cases that come in are assigned a tier, and they're based on the, the bullets that are included here. But all cases are investigated and, uh, and prosecuted appropriately, although the focus is on cases with the most significant impact to human health and the environment. So what is an environmental crime? Well, it depends upon the environmental statute where, where it's prosecuted. Um, it could be a felony, it could be a misdemeanor. There are two statutes, TSCA and FIFRA, that only allow prosecution of misdemeanors. The other important thing is that the uh, knowledge of the action must be proved um, beyond a reasonable doubt. So knowing violations have to be deliberate and can't be the product of a, a mistake or accident. The knowledge, however, of the specific law is not required by the prosecution, and that's because most environmental crimes, at least in most instances, are general intent crimes. And that is that environmental cases have been um, incorporated into the body of law that relates, started a long time ago, that related to handling of hazardous materials and the expectation that companies or individuals who are handling these hazardous materials really have an obligation or they're expected to know that these uh, regulate, there might be regulations that could be violated. So how do criminal cases arrive at EPA? They come from tips or complaints, and there's a website that is at the end of my presentation. There are also internal referrals from the civil division. 
and referrals from state and local agencies. Periodically, we have um, proactive investigative work that our agents um, develop a case and then it comes in that way. They discover that there's been a violation. Our criminal case pipeline looks like this. So a tip comes in, almost all tips are developed into leads and with the agent and the Regional Criminal Enforcement Council, those can be developed and a case could be opened. The investigation continues and if it's worthy of being prosecuted, it will be prepared for uh, presentation to Department of Justice. Our Department of Justice first, uh, first stop is um, the uh, U.S. Attorney's Office. They prosecute most of our cases. However, in some instances, the U.S. Attorney's Office may decline prosecution and will offer it to environmental crime section of Department of Justice. In some instances, we'll go directly to Department of Justice because they've developed expertise in, for example, lab fraud or vessel cases. Since the last presentation that we did two years ago, this is our essential case portfolio of the cases that we had open. You can see that the largest portion is um, Clean Air Act, and most of that is asbestos rip and run cases. Also, we have um, a lot of Clean Water Act and uh, RICRA. The 7% actually is a little bit misleading because the 7% would be Title 18 uh, violations, which would be false statement or obstruction of justice, and in most instances, <coughs> those are brought in conjunction with an environmental statute. To get to specific cases, Paul alluded to United States versus Terminex International Company, LP, and Terminex International USVI. So this came to our attention as a result of the, um, the tragic incident in uh, St. John's. Uh, in that instance, a family was on vacation in the upper unit of a two-floor condominium and the application of the methyl bromide occurred on the lower floor. The Terminex International USVI is the Terminex branch in the Virgin Islands. It has two offices, one in St. Thomas and one in St. Croix. And then Terminex International Company LP is the portion of the Terminex structure that uh, provided oversight to that um, branch. It was an application of a restricted use pesticide in a manner inconsistent with its labeling in violation of uh, FIFRA. So FIFRA, quickly, controls um, uh, distribution and sale of pesticides. So a pesticide has to be registered, and it can be either a general or restricted-use pesticide. Restricted-use pesticides, as you can see here, are those that, when applied in accordance with the directions, cause, without additional regulatory restrictions, unreasonable adverse effects on the environment. So right out of the box, that's something that needs to be um, closely controlled. Uh, all violations under FIFRA are misdemeanors. So uh, that's one of the statutes that I alluded to earlier. Um, the, the pesticide here was methyl bromide, and not only is that a restricted use pesticide, but it's a class one ozone depleting chemical. It has significant medical impacts through respiratory and neurological effects um, can, and can lead to very severe medical uh, issues including paralysis and convulsions. The formulation here was 100% methyl bromide, and the label indicated that it was to be used only for quarantine use and used under the supervision of a state or federal agency. Under no instances can, or can methyl bromide be used for residential application as it was her here. Um, following on during the investigation, uh, the agents discovered that not only it had been applied at this condominium on several occasions, but also there were 17 similar applications that were in inappropriate locations. As a result of uh, the negotiation in this instance, the environmental crime section of DOJ was involved with us. The companies agreed to plead guilty to four counts of violating um, FIFRA. The um, Penalty provisions in cri criminal penalty provisions in FIFRA are insubstantial. So what we did is use an alternative fines calculation that's allowed in Title 18 to calculate a uh, value based on pecuniary loss as a result of the application. 
And through that, we were able to get them to agree to pay an $8 million criminal penalty, which is really uh, very high. They also agreed to pay $1 million in restitution to reimburse Superfund because Superfund had cleaned, cleared the two units of uh, methyl bromide, um, and that had amounted to a million dollars. Also, they had agreed to allocate um, one million dollars to a third-party uh, entity to provide pesticide training to be offered to the applicators in the Virgin Islands. The plea agreement was submitted to the court in April, and the plea agreement was rejected by the court. So in this instance, it was submitted under Rule 11C1C, and that's a, a pretty regular, normal way to, to uh, submit a plea. It's binding on the court. It's been agreed to between the parties, and the court can accept, reject, or de defer a decision. Um, in this instance, the judge accepted the guilty plea but did not accept the plea agreement and the judge in doing that indicated, indeed, given the facts and circumstances of this case, the court is not satisfied that the proposed plea agreement reflects an appropriate balancing of, among other things, the relevant factors that underpin the assessment and distribution of monetary sanctions. So at this point, we're evaluating how to uh, resubmit the plea, um, uh, and we're trying to evaluate the steps that we will take going forward. And we're also, as Paul alluded to, evaluating methyl bromide applications other than in Terminex. So the other case that I'm going to talk about very briefly came up two years ago, but I just wanted to provide a little bit of an update on where we stand now. So Tonawanda Co Corporation is a 188-acre facility, and it has two batteries of, um, containing 60 Coke ovens each. And uh, coke is a uh, fuel that's used to produce steel. So in this instance, there was an indictment in uh, 2010, and it was against Tonawanda Coke Corporation and the environmental control manager, Mark Kamholtz. There was a trial that occurred in Buffalo in the winter for a month, and then um, there was a jury decision in which um, uh, TCC was found guilty on 14 out of 19 counts, and those counts related to Clean Air Act and RICWA violations. And Cam Holtz was found guilty on 15 of 19, and that, in addition to Clean Air Act and RICWA, was obstruction of justice. The sentencing occurred on in uh, March 2014, and the notable points on the sentencing is uh, are that there were um, substantial criminal fines but also there were um, community service projects that were ordered by the court amounting to over $12 million, and those were air and soil studies and epidemiological studies in the community that had been affected by the discharges from the, the um, company. And Mark uh, Kamholtz at this point has complied with his sentence. But Tonawanda Coke appealed the decision, and the points <coughs> The highlights of the points were that uh, they argued that they did not have fair notice that the conduct was criminal based on definitions that existed in uh, policy statements uh, by EPA. Um, they alleged that the conduct relating to active management was beyond the statute of limitations, and most importantly, they uh, alleged that there was an abuse of discretion by the district court in imposing those evaluative studies. The, it was argued in December of last year, and the Second Circuit came out with a decision in January of 2016 rejecting all of those points. The uh, court indicated that the statements that were in the memoranda were insufficient to preserve the fair notice argument, um, that storage under RICRA is a continuous offense, and therefore the statute of limitations did not um, apply. And then more import most importantly, I think, is that the uh, TC, the district court found that TCC had caused harm to the public, and the Second Circuit was not going to second-guess the wide discretion that the district court had in imposing those studies. The TCC um, petitioned for rehearing on banc. That was denied, and at this point a mandate has issued, so it appears as though uh, it will not be appealed to the Supreme Court. Just to give you a flavor of the other cases that we address in the few minutes I have left, um, uh, U.S. v. Davis 
In this instance, Mr. Davis um, was known throughout the Northeast for taking plating wastes when plating companies were closing. Unfortunately, he didn't have any permits for transport, storage, disposal, or treatment. So, and also, he uh, accumulated these at his home, at his property. So um, as a result of our investigation, um, he uh, took a, a plea uh, for illegal storage of um, RICRA hazardous waste. And also as part of this, uh, Walter Mugden's group got in involved with the on-scene coordinators. They um, helped oversee him clean up his property. Um, U.S. v. Barney goes back to a point that Paul raised about lead tests. So in this instance, this was a gentleman who undertook um, to manage HUD um, contracts for uh, refurbishment of low-income housing. It was convenient because he was a certified lead inspector so he could do the, uh, the, the risk assessments. Unfortunately, his certification had lapsed and in many instances he actually didn't do the risk assessments, which was discovered when some of these properties were retested, including some that had children. So. Um, Mr. Barney, t again, took a plea agreement and he will not be performing these again. These last two, very quickly, show where environmental cases can go. They started out as environmental cases, but um, Martin Kimber uh, was unhappy with the billing that he received uh, from a hospital based on his treatment, so he decided to distribute um, elemental mercury around the, the hospital on several occasions. We, dis we investigated that, but he was ultimately charged under a terrorism statute for use and possession of a chemical weapon. And then the last one, is, is uh, which is also a Second Circuit decision, is uh, U.S. versus Naranjo. This started out as an asbestos investigation, but um, in looking at his operations, there were just a whole lot of other charges once we, uh, we uh, uncovered that rock. There were mail fraud, there was witness tamp tampering, and then um, aggravated uh, identity theft. So that's, those are some of the cases that have developed that have gone beyond the environmental statute. So um, here's the website that I talked about if you have a violation that you want to report, and then we'll deal with the questions afterwards. Okay. Thank you, Pat. I'm especially pleased to introduce our third speaker, Carol Ann Siciliano, from our headquarters Office of General Counsel, and to thank her for traveling up to be uh, here with us today. It's actually only fitting that she be part of this Cross-Cutting Issues panel since Carol Ann serves as the Associate General Counsel of the Cross-Cutting Issues Law Office within OGC. Uh, Carol Ann oversees three practice groups within OGC, one of which focuses on environmental justice as well as the Endangered Species Act, NEPA, and Indian law. If this wasn't enough, Carol Ann also supervises the agency's legal counseling on international environmental law as well as the Administrative Procedures Act. And I just learned that Carol Ann celebrated her 26th year with the agency this past Memorial Day. Carol Ann will talk to us about environmental justice and citizen science. Carol Ann. Good morning. I do not have a PowerPoint, so I am hoping I can keep your attention engaged um, through eye-to-eye -eye contact here. I am I'm thrilled to be invited to participate in this conference of such long standing, uh, and I'm delighted to be talking about the interplay of environmental justice and citizen science. So what do those two things have in common? Well, EPA defines environmental justice as the fair treatment and meaningful involvement of all people, regardless of race, color, national origin, or income, with respect to the development, implementation, and enforcement of laws and regulations and policies. So what I want to talk about today is the element of meaningful involvement. So in the EJ context, what that means is a community's capacity to learn more about its local environment, and then also to seek change where it's needed. And I'll be talking a little bit about the Tonawanda Coke matter, because that's a really good example of meaningful involvement of citizens in the science context. And what all of this involves, of course, is inf information. You know, information about the chemicals that are in the environment, where they're coming from, what effect they have on human health or the natural environment. 
It's information about the businesses. You know, what pollutants do they release? How successful are they in meeting their emissions or effluent limitations? And what's their plan if something goes wrong? Another set of information that's relevant to environmental justice is information about the regulators. You know, what are the regulations? What are the permits and licenses that authorize the release of pollutants to the environment? What's the process the agencies undertake to promulgate those regulations or issue those permits? And then what are the accountability mechanisms that the agencies have in place to ensure compliance with those regulations? All of that information is relevant to citizens and very relevant in an environmental justice context. So we have information in a couple of forms. EPA and other agencies love to talk about numbers. You know, what? how many milligrams per liter, how many parts per million of a particular contaminant or pollutant are released to the environment. But information is also about how, how things work. Very important in an environmental justice context where uh, it's really incumbent upon the agencies and actually I'll say a little bit later the business community to build the capacity of communities to participate in the environmental protection that matters so much to them. So how can a community shape a new permit? You know, how can a factory learn about its neighbor's deepest concerns? You know, the folks at the fence line, the people who are employed in the factory, the people who depend upon the taxes that the, that the facility generates. Um, how can the factory learn about what the community cares about, really cares about? How can state and federal agencies share best practices? We're all laboratories all the time, learning so much. You know, and how can everyone better understand what everyone else's concerns and interests are? So EPA, in an environmental justice context, has just released a document that captures a lot of these ideas, and you'll find it in your materials. It's called EJ 2020 Action Plan, or Action Agenda. We just released it for public comment, and the comment period is open until July 7th, so if you're inspired, I do encourage you to take a look at the document. And if you have some suggestions or ideas or encouragement, please send them along. We deeply appreciate that. Among other things, EJ 2020 talks about the importance of community engagement. So I'll bring it back to EJ and citizen science. Um, it talks about some of the tools we already have in place. We have something called EJ Screen, which allows any citizen or regulator to go in um, using, I think it's zip code, to type your zip code in and to figure out, find out in a display um, what some of the environmental indicators, the pollutants or the demographic information in your community is, are. And um, EPA and other regulators or anybody can use that to try to figure out where some of the EJ communities might be or where some concerns might be to target our engagement. We also are developing web-based tools and uh, Paul talked a little bit about those to promote, encourage, uh, encourage folks to engage. And also, and, and uh, Paul definitely talked about next generation compliance ideas, advanced monitoring, transparency, putting into enforcement tools ways for the community to understand what facilities are doing and what their follow up is. Expanding information, waves of information out to the public. And those are really very, very important. And uh, we talk about it in the next generation context, critically important in environmental justice. And in fact, there's a considerable amount of overlap between those two initiatives. And then, you know, we had, then we come to citizen science. We talk about waves of information out to the public. What is the agency doing? What is the facility doing? But what citizen science then is about is information back to the agency. How do we get information from the public about what they're worried about. You know, it, it's incredibly exciting the technologies that are out there for, um, especially in the air context. We have wearable technologies. We have our cell phones that citizens can go about figuring out what the levels of air, of particular air pollutants are in the environment. And then send the data right to a non-governmental data source, a Google site or something like that. Tons and tons of information out there. It's terribly exciting. Uh, because we have citizens who now are trying to make the invisible visible, not only, to, not only to themselves, but also to the regulators 
and frankly, the regulated community as well. I mean, the, citizen, the factories should be using these technologies as well to quickly pinpoint where their problems might be, what their emissions are that may exceed their required levels. Where are they coming from? What can we do to fix that? That kind of transparency is very, very important from a compliance assurance perspective and from the perspective of, cu of cultivating trust in the neighborhood that a facility is on top of its compliance, um, it's on top of its compliance, that it is committed to compliance and it's willing to display to the community as well as the regulators how well it's doing and what it will do if it discovers it has a problem. So it, it's enormously exciting data coming from the citizens to the agencies. But then we're still in early days with citizen science. The technology is cool. It's evolving all the time. But from a regulator's perspective, it, it really does create all sorts of very interesting problems. And then double down on it from a lawyer's perspective, fascinating legal issues that we're still struggling with. Um, you know, some of them might be, so we've got all this data. We've got citizens excited. We have citizens eager to participate. What actually does it mean? What does it mean if citizens are acquiring data that shows short-term uh, er emissions, but the standard that the agency has decided is relevant from a human health perspective is a long-term standard? How do those sets of data or those uh, notions align? Now, there could be a disconnect there, a communication issue. What about unpredictable performance of the technologies? You know, we're not certifying these citizen science technologies. These could be buckets, and we, we'll hear about Tonawanda Coke if I have a minute, about buckets acquired and other equipment acquired from the hardware store to identify levels of benzene in the environment. Hugely successful. That was a very successful equipment. That's how the citizens in Tonawanda Coke discovered the benzene problem. It was citizen science. And they brought it to the uh, regulator's attention. The regulators ended up getting the terrific result that Pat talked to us about. Uh, those buckets work. What, what about other technologies? Um, and then they work. What about assuring the quality of the data that comes out of that? You know, as you may know, regulators um, take the data acquisition and the data analysis and assuring the quality of the data extraordinarily seriously when we're using it for regulatory or enforcement purposes. Why? Because our decisions need to stand up in the face of judicial scrutiny. Lawyers get involved in that. We want to be able to tell the public, the facility, and the court that our basis for enforcement of regulation is absolutely reliable. Citizen science does not have that accountability overlay through judicial review. So what do we do about that? And what happens, as we employ our quality assurance overlay, if we disagree with the citizens about the credibility of their data? I mean, they say, look what I've got. My, my little phone right here, right here. It says it right here. Well, OK, but that's not enough for us to build a case. Well, we do what Pat was talking about. It's a tip. It leads to a lead. They may lead on to the other steps of a criminal or civil enforcement. That's the communication. We say, thank you very much. You've really given us something to think about. We're going to go right out there, if we can, <laughs> if we have the resources, and learn more about the problem that you might have identified for us. And then, you know, as we think about all of this, um, how do we keep up? The technology keeps changing. But it's incredibly exciting, because what it means is that we now have the public meaningfully involved in protecting and learning about and protecting their own environment, their local environment. And you know, as we define environmental justice, that's, what, uh, that's a very important element of it, meaningful involvement. They might be motivated to get involved in the permitting process. They might be involved to get involved in the, in the enforcement process. They might um, you know, inspire EPA, although EPA and the states are already inspired, to find uh, innovative solutions in settlement instruments to promote even greater transparency, even greater uh, assurance of compliance. It, it's totally exciting, I think. And um, and it's you know and it's and it's you know the science that we're talking about here is technology science and chemical science.
but I'll take, I have a couple of minutes left, and I want to talk about social, citizen social science. Bring it back to lo words lawyers can understand, like me, where numbers get me nervous, words just inspire me, as you can tell. So words. This is another initiative that EPA has undertaken in the environmental justice context, and I will I'll bring it in through social science. What this is about, it's facilitating meaningful involvement of communities, but between the community and the facility, with the regulators stepping out of the conversation. You know, we're very much in the conversation in an enforcement context, but this idea, uh, focuses on the fact that at bottom you have a facility over here and a neighborhood all around it. And that those two parties are the most important parties, the most important relationship in an environmental justice context. That what the facility emits, the community worries about. But it tends to be, the relationship tends to be triangulated with the regulators. The facility and the regulator engage in permitting and enforcement together. The community and the regulator engage in tips and conversation. But the two people, two sets who should be talking are the community and the facility. So what I put in your packet is something from 2013. It's called Promising Practices for Promoting Engagement Between Communities and Facilities. So and I really, I, I love it for the private sector in particular to pay attention to this because it's a really good way of managing cost, managing risk. And oh, and in the process, cultivating trust with the folks on the other side of the fence who may not feel like they have a lot of power, but when they get the regulator's attention from a facility's perspective, they can introduce delay and cost and unexpected outcomes. So what we're trying to do, and we have five promising practices that we've identified to encourage facilities to reach out to the communities, you know, to think ahead about what the communities might actually care about, um, to have a plan for communicating with the communities, to engage the community leaders, and they come in all sorts of forms. It could be religious, it could be academic, it could be, you know, of course, the, the local council and mayor, and, um, and then to engage effectively. What does that actually mean? You know, have meetings at night when the community can participate, offer food, offer babysitting, offer tours, engage effectively with the community, and communicate effectively, translate technical information into language communities can understand, and then follow up. Uh, also very, very important. And what we're finding, uh, I've talked a lot of business communities about this, and they're terrified of the communities. They really are frightened of the communities. Well, they don't trust them. They can't speak their language. Well, maybe a little bit of the social science can help bridge that gap and allow for greater transparency and allow for greater communication and build the trust and actually help the community express what they care about. Um, you know, an example would be where buses, the, where the community really wasn't worried about what was coming out of the smokestack they cared about where the buses were idling because it was right next to a school bus stop. And that's not something we would regulate in a permit, but boy, oh boy, that's something a facility is glad to know about, and then they reroute their trucks, you know, so that the trucks, or I should say the truck, not the buses, the trucks are not idling where the bus stop is. Communication. Social science. So thank you very much for your attention as I talked about citizen science, social science, and environmental justice, and I'm looking forward to any questions you might direct to me. Thank you. Thank you, Carolyn. Um, we actually have the right slide up there right now, so this is the time for questions. <laughs> By the way, uh, for those of you who, this is a little inside EPA stuff, whenever we need a shot of enthusiasm, we, ju we just place a call <laughs> to Carolyn. Uh, it's just, you know, one of those things. Anyway, yes? Is that for Carol Ann? Yeah. yeah. Well, um, or anybody. Oh, I'm sorry, I see Yeah, yeah. Um, uh, yeah Carol Ann is, is fine. Um, you know, I'm not sure the answer to that. And, and as I was preparing for this talk, I realized I need to talk to the scientists more about citizen science. But we do know that uh, PM, 
uh, is definitely something that is revealed through, the, through these tools. That's particulate matter, levels of particulate matter. Um, and, I, and I think other air, air pollutant contaminants most particularly as opposed to water or RICRA. Pat or Paul, do you have um, any specific, any other information about that? Not really. Well, let, actually, yeah, let me butt in a little bit on, on Tonawanda Cove in particular. Um, Caroline alluded to particulate matter. We had a situation where people had to br brush the, the particulate matter off their cars. I mean, this was not, this was not, you know, arcane stuff. Um, and then there was the benzene stuff that you talked about. But you know, we can envision what's going to be happening, right? With all these connections into iPhones that are coming up, these things that you can add on, it's coming. I mean, to, and, and it will get increasingly sophisticated, but as Caroline pointed out, and Pat to a degree as well, you know, these things are probably always going, at least for, well, maybe always, I'll, I'll stay with always, uh, fall short of what we need to build a case. And so we'll use it as a tip, we'll go out there, we'll confirm it, we'll do the things that we need to do to make sure that we have samples and data and, and evidence that will hold up in court when we do the enforcement action. Yes? Wait, shall I try? Yeah, go ahead. Okay. Thank you very much. Uh, the speaker had uh, formerly worked for the Port Authority and is identified that ports, uh, uh, shipping ports, are a very important source of environmental justice concern. Because as we know, a lot of communities um, that might identify as environmental justice cluster around ports. And with so many ships and trucks idling in those ports, have a tremendous amount of, of air pollution there. And so what the, um, the questioner wanted to know is to what extent is citizen science playing into the agency's ports initiative, and a, an agency, of course, working with the states on this. And um, it, that is, a, a, it, it, I, I, I think it is. I don't, I don't know the exact, I don't know the answer to that. I don't have the facts on that particular situation, but it's a great example <coughs> of how Citizen concerns, either just intuitive concerns, or, or maybe someone has any. Do you have an answer, sir, on that? Uh, yeah, uh, my name is Aaron Kleinbaum. I'm the Regional Environmental Law Center at the Excuse me for a quick second. Sorry to interrupt. When you're speaking, just everybody, there are microphones in front of each of you, and there's a speak button. If you could press that speak button, that would be great. Thank you. Okay, how's that? Uh, it needs to be green. I, I can oh, see your ba the band is red. There you go. Oops, almost. Oh, red, red is on. Okay, that was wrong. Okay. Anyway. <laughs> My name is Aaron Kleinbaum, Eastern Environmental Law Center in Newark, and our, uh, we have uh, our, our clients are some of the uh, EJ groups uh, involved in the Clean Ports Initiative, and they are engaging in citizen science. They uh, collect data about the number of trucks uh, going through their communities, uh, uh, diesel trucks that are emitting, uh, emitting diesel emissions, and uh, they do quite a, a large effort in collecting uh, that data, both in the ironbound section and the, uh, and the south ward of Newark. Um, and I, I appreciate, uh, 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 Carol Ann, your enthusiasm. Uh, about the work that EPA is doing about uh, about EJ, uh, but my clients are very concerned about the lack of investigation and enforcement of Title VI complaints uh, uh, that relate to EPA's uh, awarding of money in in some cases to the port and the fit and the uh, and the disparate impacts uh, that result from. Uh, uh, in this case, port activities and, and throughout the country, disparate impacts that uh, result from the expenditure of federal funds and, and the experience of my clients and others throughout the country is that EPA is less than enthusiastic about investigating and enforcing compliance with Title VI. So I was wondering what EJ 2020 
uh, will be doing about that. Uh, what EJ 2020 talks a little tiny bit about Title VI, which is Title VI of the Civil Rights Act. Um, and it, we, we recognize it as a tool that can be used to promote EJ, but EJ 2020 leaves actually the civil rights enforcement to our civil rights enforcement office. EJ is a non-statutory program. We do because we, our statutes authorize and require us to protect human health and the environment. We have a tremendous amount of authority under our statutes to advance EJ, uh, but it does not speak very much about Title VI. Yes, Rich. And I was wondering, are you speaking about the databases that you have in-house, or are you talking about databases that are developed uh, in the companies that you don't have in their self-monitoring reports? I'm not sure it's so much about databases, it's about uh, technologies to crunch the data, different ways of looking at the data. Uh, this data do you have this data that you're providing to the defendant or the party that's being the polluter, or is this data that you're requesting from them? So data analytics is just a very broad bucket. It includes a lot of different things. But uh, for example, we may have data on uh, uh, TSD, hazardous waste TSD facilities or, or large quantity generators of hazardous waste. You know, a ton of data uh, and working with the states. It's a collectively we have this data. Maybe if we use more sophisticated software and, and manipulate the data in a different way, Violations that we hadn't noticed before will pop out. I mean, that's just one example. It's a way not necessarily of getting new databases, but just uh, manipulating them and crunching them more in a more sophisticated way. But, but it's a very broad category, uh, and maybe it also includes some of the things you're talking about. Is EPA outsourcing this to uh, vendors that can who know about relativity or things like that? Because there's structural analytics and there's conceptual analytics and cluster theories that wow. are developed around these, yeah. these di databases that could be very helpful, you know, looking back as to when I was at EPA, if that was available. I mean, that when I was there, the big thing was the, the pe penalty policy that in the computer system. Right. <laughs> so this sounds like it's more sophisticated. Yeah, and, it, and it's always becoming more and more sophisticated. So yes, we are using consultants. Mm -hmm. uh, we also use relativity, but I guess relativity has a lot of different subparts, and I'm not sure we're using all the different subparts you're talking about. We use it for a different purpose than the one that yeah, you're yeah. suggesting. Um, yeah, but I, I know that is being looked at at parts of the agency, but people have a much more technical knowledge than any of the folks on this panel. Right. <coughs> yes. You talked about community engagement in the EJ uh, process, but um, that's virtually impossible if there's no notification requirement. So I was wondering, what is the notification requirement for large emission sources? Um, is there some statutory requirements or not? In, in a, uh, when EPA is issuing a, a permit or a regulation, the statute does require, the Administrative Procedure Act, does require notice to the public bef at a proposal stage before EPA issues a permit or state issues a permit or promulgates a regulation. Are you speaking, though, about notification of the emissions after a permit has been issued? Notification of the process specifically to EJ communities, um, especially given that many are Spanish speaking. And I actually know of one very large facility that um, just received a Title V permit. There are 14 EJ communities within 1.5 miles of that facility, and nobody, um, none of those um, members were notified in any way, shape, or form, aside from a very small. Um, public notice in a newspaper. Um, but it, I mean, in terms of meaningfully and substantively, substantively engaging the process, it's impossible uh, for them with that kind of notification. They were not landowners. Um, only landowners living within 300 feet were actually um, sent direct notifications. Um, 
And actually, I have a second question um, to anybody on the panel. Um, I'm a, I'm, I assume you're getting a lot of complaints from uh, people living near unconventional oil and gas development these days. And a lot of those facilities are entirely unregulated because they're minor sources of pollution. And um, actually, facilities like metering stations, which are every 10 miles along a pipeline, create a tremendous loophole um, in terms of regulations because they are entirely unregulated by anybody. Neither e the EPA nor the state regulate them. And so a lot of the uh, venting events and dumping events, pigging events, occur uh, specifically in those metering stations. So how are you dealing with those types of challenges from an enforcement perspective? First of all, always provide tips. I mean, if you know, hear about, uh, or know about, or your, you know, your colleagues, your friends, or clients know about pollution, uh, and maybe it's a violation, maybe it's not, you're not sure, report it. Report it, please, 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 to EPA, to the state agency. So that's, that's the first, maybe most important thing, because maybe they just don't know about it. And maybe there is a, a cause of action that they could pursue. Um, EPA just issued a new rulemaking, I forget, is it proposed or final, uh, on oil and gas uh, well. So that's, that's important and maybe some things that weren't uh, as regulated before, maybe will be regulated uh, anew or in, in a different way. So that's something else to uh, consider. Uh, I mentioned, by the way, one of the national enforcement initiatives that is already in place and will continue in the next cycle is energy extraction making sure that in the energy extraction industry uh, uh, sector, uh, they are following uh, the various laws. So that is, it is one of our initiatives. Obviously not as big an, a, a, an industry in New York and New Jersey as it is in Pennsylvania and others, but, but we are looking at it. So. The infrastructure spreads around the country. It's, it spreads everywhere. Yeah. yeah. The, the oil and gas infrastructure. Mm -hmm. Yeah, yeah. I, I, but we're re region two, we cover New York, New Jersey, Puerto Rico. Right, right. so there, there are hundreds of metering stations in New York State because they travel with the infrastructure. Well, provide information, give us uh, detailed information about uh, pollution uh, and, and to New York State DEC and maybe we can look into it. And on your, on your first question, um, you really put your finger on the adequacy of notice. Yes, as a matter of law, we're required to provide notice in advance of issuing a permit or in advance of issuing a regulation. We do provide notice. Is it meaningful to the community that cares the most about it? If we put a little note into fine print of the newspaper, if we publish it on a website that no one thinks to go to, yes, we've discharged the law. Have we meaningfully reached out to the community? That's a very important point you're making, and it's one that the agency is grappling with, that the state permitting authorities, many of whom um, are the ones who issue the permits uh, nowadays rather than EPA. And uh, the, the, the promising practices that I was talking about, partly what that's designed to do is to, is to encourage facilities to talk themselves to the communities early on, to reduce the fear that they have of the communities of giving notice, to start the process very early, start the conversation early before the permit is even applied for. And EPA does not have the you know, resources to meaningful, we haven't figured out yet, I'll put it that way, how to engage meaningfully and provide meaningful notice to every single person who cares about these activities. And that's a problem we're struggling with. But we're also hoping that the facilities will accept the responsibility in their communities to start the conversation very, very early. So you've named an important issue, it's one that we're aware of, and especially when there's a language um, barrier. It's one thing when everyone speaks the same language, it's something else again when there's a difference in language. And so thank you for naming it and it is something that we're looking at and we're trying to figure out how to, how to just expand the conversation. And I'll just add that we're not unmindful of the language issue in New York City, of course, in the environment, you know, immediate area of here. Enormous numbers of languages are spoken and communities have to be communicated with in, in words that they can understand. So we are attempting to address that as well. Uh, maybe at the break, we, you can tell me the name of the facility, also the Title V facility that you were talking about, because I'd like to go back and look into that a little bit. Further. Sure. And if I, I can just add, under next generation compliance, something else, another piece of that is uh, to build that into permits. Yeah. So we yeah. are starting to see more permits, whether issued by states, for example, Massachusetts, EPA, 
increasingly the permit itself requires different types of notice to the community. For example, if there's a combined sewer overflow discharge, the community has to be notified with, you know, alarms or lights. So, you know, I think that is still a little new, but I think more and more you'll see this type of better notification of, of uh, pollution issues required in the permit itself. Yes. Hi, can you hear me? Okay, my name is Jocelyn Groom and I'm a student in environmental management. I'm getting my uh, master's degree. My question is for Pat. Um, I'm curious to know, it's come to light recently that Exxon was doing some cutting edge climate change research decades ago and they quashed the results and became climate deniers. Is there any discussion about persecution of large corporations that have so far escaped the sort of tragedy of the commons pollution that's been going on for decades? Um, I. I think that that's the case. Uh, most of that type of case wouldn't be a case that we would be undertaking in Region 2. Those would be cases that are more of a national scale, so that would be um, a case that would be handled out of the environmental crime section of DOJ. So yes, but not so much in our, um, our region. And also, I couldn't get my button to go on before, but I want to respond to the first question, actually, in, the, in regard to technology, because the technology has changed in the way that we often get videos of crimes. So we receive that, and that's been, uh, you know, a leg up in terms of interviewing people and actually having the video footage, so. Yes. Um, my name is Amelia Janish, and I work for Green Reviews, and I wondered if anybody on the panel could address the and, and any specific initiatives with regard to f federal facilities, both criminal and civil penalties, and what specifically on a nationwide as well as region two basis? Well, federal facility enforcement is a big area for us. Uh, we have an entire office uh, in, in, in the in, in headquarters. It's all about the federal federal facility enforcement. And so every region, including region two, uh, does it. We have enforcement cases against uh, federal facilities under just about all of our statutes. So um, it's not particularly one specific initiative, it's, it's part of our core program. And I, I guess if there was a federal facility that had, you know, uh, air toxics emissions or one of the other uh, NEI areas I spoke about, that would be part of the, the national enforcement initiative. So it's very important and we put resources into it, uh, spanning many, many areas. Superfund, non-superfund. Um, any other questions? Yes. Hey, Joe. I'll take a shot of that. Uh, I, I don't know if there's anybody from New York City. Yeah. <laughs> I don't know if there's anybody from New York City here right now who might be able. To. Yes. Yeah. Hi, my name is Gwen Litvak. I'm the chief of staff of the mayor's office of sustainability. I'm happy to chat with you about getting some resources from DOH and OSHA out there. Yeah, and I'll just add that one thing for sure that needs to be done as soon as these things occur, Joel, is just calls need to be made to the offices. At least we can get started. Yeah. 
I mean, you're raising the entire question about how uh, uh, federal oversight of state programs works, and the answer is, in most cases, we can step in when, in fact, no enforcement is occurring. So what we need to do is talk about the specific facts of, of a given matter and then see what we can, what's available to us. It's hard to answer that uh, more specifically without the actual uh, facts. Any other questions? I think we have time for one more. Any others? Okay, then I think we're done. Thank you very much, everyone, and I want to thank our panel. I am Seth Davis. Uh, I'm standing here in my capacity as chair-elect of the ABA section of Environment, Energy, and Resources, uh, one of the many co-sponsors of this wonderful program. And for those of you who don't know what we are, we are a group of 9,000 members. We'd like to be 10,000. Uh, mostly lawyers. You don't have to be a lawyer to join. We have associate members who are involved in the areas of environment, energy, and resources, and uh, I'm happy to say, even, even, even though he left us to go to Rome, uh, Mike Gerard is the, at this point, only New Yorker to have served in the capacity of section chair, and I'll be following in his footsteps. Uh, awesome footsteps in which to follow. So, as the sign says, Superfund is still super and still fun. Uh, this, we hope, the whole panel will be super and fun. Uh, we have a somewhat diffuse series of presentations, and because the gears will be changing, what I propose to do is to take a couple of questions, just a couple after each of the presentations, and then we'll uh, open up totally at the end in case there's anything remaining from the first presentation, which will undoubtedly raise uh, all, all sorts of questions. Uh, our first speaker, uh, Walter Mugden, uh, I'm tempted to say needs no introduction, but I will give one anyway. Um, Walter is, is serving a life sentence at uh, EPA Region 2. Um, and he and I first started working together on, well, not together, uh, on the same matters, but on different sides. Uh, I won't say when, but uh, neither of us had any white hair at the time, uh, and I'm sorry to say that I contributed to a good number of those white ones over there, and vice versa. Um, but for those of you who know Walter, uh, you know he is one of the, the true exemplars, one of the true stars of the environmental legal field. Uh, he is currently Director of the Emergency and Remedial Response Division of Region 2. Uh, he has, and we, we do remind him, he, he is still a lawyer. You can't give that up just if you, if you leave, leave a legal job. But he has also been the Director of the Division of Environmental Planning and Protection. Seven years as Regional Counsel at Region 2. Uh, and during that time, he uh, worked with a great number of the environmental statutes, mastering them all. He has supplied what I think is one of the finest summaries of recent developments in the Superfund and RECRA area, and unfortunately it somehow did not make it into your program materials. Uh, and I'm hoping that we can have that fixed before the end of the day. If not, uh, I'm sure Walter will be glad to send you a copy, and if he isn't, I'll be thrilled to send you a copy because it's really excellent, should be read, uh, and it's, it's top-notch. So, Walter, it's yours. Thanks, Seth. I'll start uh, with admitting to plagiarism. Uh, this clever title came from my colleague, Marla Weeder, so uh, she deserves the credit for that one. Um, just a couple of stats. Uh, as of uh, last September, this is uh, how many sites we've had out there. We've uh, assessed nearly 50,000 sites, uh, about uh, almost 1,800 1, sites on the national priorities list, a uh, number of them deleted by now. Uh, here's the key statistic. About 67% of the sites have all construction complete, but that means that almost a third of the sites do not. Uh, removal actions, the unsung hero of the Superfund program, lots of them. And of course, the ultimate goal is to bring land back into productive use. Uh, the enforcement program has been enormously successful. It is an enforcement first program. Uh, we have a total uh, expenditures for Superfund work out of, uh, of, uh, for non-federal facilities of about $57.7 billion. And you can see how much of that came from PRPs, uh, close to 71%, over 71% from PRPs. 
Many billions more spent at federal facilities. The U.S. government is the largest PRP by a large measure in the United States. Uh, some of the trends of what's going on in the program, uh, we had been running at a pretty high rate of listings in the uh, early 2000 time period. Then we dropped down considerably to about 13 uh, a year final listings average. Uh, it was during that period of time, 04 to 07, characterized as the tool of last resort. And the notion was that state programs, brownfield programs, record programs, things of that sort would be the tools of earlier resort, Superfund listing the tool of last resort. Uh, that uh, characterization was removed in 2009, and from 8 to 14, we have a higher average. But I will say that back in 2015, we dropped down again to 10 final listings. One of the things that's happening is that we are seeing more complex, more costly sites, urban river sites, large mining sites. And there's at least some indication that maybe we have more fund lead sites, which is sites that don't have PRPs that can pay for uh, the work. I mentioned construction completion, completions. It has always been one of the key measures of success in this program. Uh, of those sites that are not, have not achieved this milestone, 40% uh, are federal facilities. They are generally very large, very complicated sites. They may have literally hundreds of operable units uh, within the site. Um, and in fact, the, the average number is 4.2 operable units each uh, compared to those sites that have achieved construction completion, which have an average of about 1.8 sites. Uh, nevertheless, even though they haven't achieved construction completion, which is a metric that we use, means what it says, uh, nevertheless, at, uh, at a, most of these, we've made a lot of progress. Uh, uh, there is uh, action going on at all of these sites, and uh, we have now a new metric that we've been using for the last several years called remedial action completions, which are the individual words, sorry, individual steps along the way that lead to a construction completion. Trends, funding, well, congressional appropriations have been flat since the mid-1990s. That's when the uh, taxing authority ran out. Uh, we did get a big bump up in 2009 with the stimulus program. Uh, but from 11 to 14, appropriations were cut, about 18% from the previous flat appropriations. Uh, we're down to about $500 million a year for the last several years. Uh, this means that we, are, we have very limited ability to fund new fund lead constructions. Why is it that when we have $500 million a year, we can't fund new construction starts? The answer is because we have a lot of ongoing construction work from starts that were occurred in past years, and those, are, those have the first claim on the funding that comes out every single year. So big, complicated fund lead sites are often funded over multiple years. Once we start them, we acknowledge that we have an obligation to continue them year in, year out. Um, I mentioned that uh, there's a trend towards what we call mega sites. Here, some of these are sediment sites. These are some of the most expensive ones. Uh, examples of the Passaic River. We just issued the record of decision for the lower eight miles of the Passaic River. That was on March 3rd. That's an estimated $1.4 billion. The Hudson River dredging project, which was a remedial action chosen in 2002, uh, just was completed last October. At least the dredging portion of that work was completed last October. Uh, the estimated cost there is between one and a half and $2 billion. Uh, and there is a considerable amount of work yet to be done on the floodplains. Uh, that uh, are on each side of the 40-mile stretch of the Hudson that's involved. Uh, we could spend an entire day discussing whether or not this project was as successful as we have projected that it will be, uh, and uh, that's a whole other uh, uh, panel that we can have sometime. Um, here's a couple of other big uh, sediment sites. Uh, groundwater sites, there are these mega groundwater sites. This is one of the largest in the San Fernando Basin in California, probably close to a billion dollars. We got mining sites. Uh, the Gold King Mine is only one of them. That's the one that uh, had the big spill last year. I will note, by the way, that big spill, that uh, accident that EPA caused, um, three million gallons of acid waste in one big slug came out uh, to the Upper Animus River, and that gave us that beautiful photogenic mustard yellow slug of, of uh, contamination going down the river. That much contamination comes out of that hole every four days at steady state for the last century. And that one hole is one of about 20 or 30 holes in that mountain. And that mountain, all those holes together, generate 5 million gallons every single day of that same kind of waste. So the Upper Adamus River has indeed been dead for decades, and everybody's known it. It was the photogenic element of this that made it so particularly high profile. Uh, the good, if there's anything that came out of this that is good, it is that the site, which we had been urging should be listed on the National Party's list for 10 or 15 years, and the local uh, community had opposed that, uh, the local community and the state now agree that it should be listed, and that whole mountain 
which is about 20 or 30 holes, will be listed on the national priority list. And then we have radiation sites. The biggest single site in our region uh, of a, ra a RAD site is the Wellsback site down in the Camden area. It's going to be about probably somewhere between $800 million and a $1 billion when we're done. But the uh, mother of all sites is the Hanford Washington Federal Facility, uh, an estimated uh, $113.6 billion to fix it. Uh, so what are some of the challenges of these mega sites? High cleanup costs, uh, high natural resource damage exposure, large geographic areas, multiple municipalities to deal with, political entities, uh, on and on. Hard to determine when you have 150 or more years of industrial activity as we do in the Passaic River, for example. Very difficult to determine uh, uh, who's PRP and how to do an allocation. Uh, very long remediation schedules because of the complexity of doing the work. Sediment sites, in specifically, as opposed to some of these other mega sites, uh, have uh, just first a choice to be made. Are you trying to get mass out of the river, uh, or are you trying to contain the contaminants that are there by capping it? Uh, these are sort of philosophically two different ways of approaching the situation. There are concerns about resuspension during dredging. When we were running up in the 1990s to uh, doing the Hudson River uh, project, we estimated in the modeling we did that there would be 3% resuspension, that for every kilogram of PCBs that came out of the river, another 3% uh, uh, of that would fall back into the river. Uh, General Electric argued that the number should be more like 6 or 7%. The actual outcome at the end of the seven years, uh, six years of dredging was 1.5%, so half of what we had believed. But still, there was a lot of concerns about resuspension. Per capping requires perpetual maintenance. Forever is a long, long time. That's an issue. Uh, you've got a question of where do you dispose of the sediments that you pick up? Do you dispose of them locally? Could you? And the answer in some places is yes, you could. Uh, but that generally is uh, politically very, very, uh, um, there's huge opposition to local uh, disposal of sediments. sediments. In the Passaic River and in some of the other locations, we have existing authorized navigation channels. And the questions are around how do you deal with them are, are very complicated. Um, you got to be concerned about possible recontamination after you've spent a lot of money and time and effort cleaning the site up. Are you going to get recontamination from CSOs, combined sewer overflows, from existing sewage treatment plants, from non-point sources? For example, in the Passaic River, uh, we know that even after all the billion and a half dollars that we're going to spend, or have the PRPs spend, of course, on the cleanup, uh, there is still enough PCBs coming up, coming into that system from upstream, uh, from above the Dundee Dam, that uh, we will not achieve our cleanup objectives unless those PCB uh, discharges can be reduced, and they, we believe, are coming largely from POGWs. So we're working closely with our water program. In this decade, as we start the work on the Passaic River, we're going to ask the water program, and they've agreed uh, at the state and federal levels, to try and reduce the uh, ongoing loadings of PCBs. We're talking about very, very small numbers here, but enough to uh, cause uh, us not to be able to achieve our uh, objectives. Groundwater sites uh, have big challenges as well. I'm going to run through some of these pretty quickly. A uh, couple of the regulatory developments, uh, one that's very recent, in March of this year, we proposed a rule to add an element to the hazard ranking system, which is the model that allows us to rank a site, uh, score it to determine whether or not it can be placed on the national priorities list. We've added this concept of subsurface intrusion. Uh, you're probably familiar with vapor intrusion. That's one form of subsurface intrusion hadn't been looked at at all in the hazard ranking system prior to this time. Uh, another form is groundwater intrusion. If you have contaminated groundwater, as we do in Garfield, uh, New Jersey, where there's chromium contamination, gets into the basements when it's uh, high water times, uh, and then crystallizes out and becomes a danger to the people. So these pathways are now something that we can look at. Uh, a couple of years ago, we issued our groundwater remediation completion strategy. This is really an exit strategy for these big groundwater cleanups. We find that we get to a point of diminishing returns where we can pump and treat and pump and treat and pump and treat, and we just don't seem to be getting to clean. Uh, and the question is, under what, if any, circumstances could you say, all right, we've done enough, or we're not getting anywhere, anywhere further, is there a different alternative, or should we, do we have to walk away? So it's not a get out of jail free card, but it is a way of relooking at sites after some number of years and making sure that we still have a completion strategy that makes sense. Three years ago, we issued the all appropriate inquiries rule. We just updated it. Uh, this is something, of course, that every uh, property transaction requires to be uh, paying attention to. Uh, one of the cases I want to focus on is uh, an extremely important one, the Tronics Bankruptcy and Fraudulent Conveyance case. Short recitation of the facts, 2004 to 2006, Kerr-McGee Company um, out in Oklahoma creates uh, a, a subsidiary called Tronics and then spins it off. Uh, 
At the end of that period of time, in 06, Anadarko purchases Kermagee for $18 billion. Uh, 2009, this spin-off company, Tronix, goes bankrupt. Uh, 2011, there's a bankruptcy settlement between the creditors of Tronix and Tronix, and that settlement includes the United States, 22 states, six local governments, the Navajo Nation of Indians. The government, as well as other claimants, the governments receive a certain amount of cash, $300 million in cash, which doesn't go very far when you split it among all these different entities, but also receive, importantly, an 88% stake in the fraudulent conveyance case that Tronix has then files against its former parent, Kermagee. <clears throat> so in 2009, Tronix sues Kermagee and Anadarko. They allege that this was a fraudulent conveyance because they say Tronix was undercapitalized when created, loaded up with billions of Kermagee's environmental liabilities and not enough uh, assets to make it worthwhile. The U.S. government intervenes as a co-plaintiff. 2012, there was a lengthy trial, uh, went on for months. Uh, in December of 2013, finally, the judge awarded the plaintiffs, which included the U.S. and, of course, Tronix, somewhere between five and $14 billion, the exact amount to be subject to a further hearing. As a consequence of that judgment, uh, by April 2014, the parties had settled for the lower end of that scale, $5.15 billion. And uh, that settlement was approved in November of 2015 and uh, January, uh, November 2014 and January 2015, the funds started to be transferred or the funds were transferred to the plaintiffs. I'm happy to say that my regional office, Region 2, uh, enjoyed about 500 million of that $5 billion settlement. 250 or 240 million of that went into the Superfund uh, as cost recovery for the federal creosote site. But $240 million went into a special account for the Wellsback site. That's the radiation site down in the Camden area that I'd mentioned earlier as one of our big close to billion dollar sites. So that is an extremely important settlement for us. Burlington Northern remains the sort of the leading most important Superfund case of recent years. It was a 2009 Supreme Court case. Had two major findings that the Supreme Court made uh, or decisions. One was that one of the PRPs, Shell, was not liable as an arranger. Arranger, of course, is the actual statutory word for what we generally call a generator. Uh, it's somebody who arranges for disposal of a hazardous substance at a facility owned by somebody else. And that facility owned by somebody else eventually becomes a Superfund site or becomes a site at which uh, Superfund money is spent. So the Supreme Court said, hey, an arrange, to arrange for something means you have to have an intentional step. So intent is important. The district court also uh, had apportioned liability in this case among a number of PRPs, including notably two railroad companies, one of which is Burlington Northern, whose name uh, is given to the case. Uh, the uh, circuit court had declared that that was not an appropriate thing, that joint and several liability was the right uh, 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 standard for this particular set of facts. The Supreme Court said, no, 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 the district court did have a reasonable basis for apportioning of liability, and so we're going to approve it. Uh, since that time, roughly through 2015, there's been about 70 arranger decisions. And the defendants have been successful with some degree of frequency. They have been able to show that uh, in that particular case, uh, they didn't actually arrange for it. They didn't have the intent, intent to arrange for a disposal. So they've gotten off the hook. Uh, there have been about 32 apportionment decisions there. Defendants have been successful much less frequently. Uh, there's an increasing number of circuit court opinions, but there's still a relatively small number altogether and not a whole lot of new ground has been broken, uh, joint and several liability is alive and well. So, uh, as I said, under a ranger liability, the Supreme Court says you gotta have a fact-intensive inquiry, and intent to dispose is the key question for divisibility. The other prong of the Supreme Court decision, the court says there's gotta be a reasonable basis for apportioning the harm, and here are some of the relevant factors and these were among the factors that were used by the district court in the Burlington Northern case. Uh, my editorial comment is here in yellow, which is that the shares, if you're going to apportion liability, if the court is going to apportion liability, the shares have to total 100%. And in the Burlington court case, they didn't. Because of flawed arithmetic, uh, lawyers don't know how to do arithmetic. Uh, this particular thing that the Burlington court done wasn't, did wasn't mandated by the Supreme Court, but it was allowed. So here's a couple of questions. My answers are yes. Uh, and when you get those materials, you'll see more detail about all of this stuff. Here's a quick run, do, run through of why the arithmetic doesn't work. I won't go into it just now. But the court also made it very clear that there's a difference between apportionment and allocation. And there's been early confusion in the, in the lower courts about what this is. Examples, Reichhold, uh, uh, this case Reichhold, 
the court did something that it called apportioning liability, but really it was doing an equitable allocation that just used the wrong concept and the wrong term. What is the difference? Here is the Yankee gas case from 2012, which says it nicely. To apportion is to request separate checks. Each party pays their own meal. To allocate is to take an unitemized bill and everyone pays for what's fair. So if 10 of you go out to lunch and the, the, the waiter is willing to give you separate checks and one of you walks out, the other nine don't have to cover that person's payment. The, the restaurant is, uh, is left uh, without being able to get that payment. That's apportionment. Uh, if, however, you get a single check for all 10 people, the 10 people have to figure out what each one pays on a fair basis. And if one or two of them have walked out in the meantime, it's tough on the other eight or nine because they still have to pay the full bill, and that's allocation. Um, so some of the progeny cases, Burlington progeny cases, as I said, very few early decisions held harm to be divisible. Uh, Burlington didn't really alter the law and divisibility. It just sort of put it into a, a spotlight. Uh, here are some of the major cases, uh, including some circuit court cases. Ashley, too, of Charleston went to the super, uh, circuit court, and although this, the district court had said, hey, you know, all you need is a rough calculation, nevertheless, the district court didn't accept any of the five bases that the defendant in that case had offered, said, no, none of these work, and the circuit court agreed with that. Um, the most uh, fecund case for generating uh, decisions in the uh, divisibility arena, and actually both a divisibility and a, and a ranger, is the Fox River suite of cases. Uh, it's got a lot of inconsistent and, repet and uh, uh, decisions. This is one of the first ones, but let me jump further. So uh, ultimately, the district court says, no, it's, uh, it's, uh, there's, there's no basis for, uh, for divisibility. Then it goes up to the circuit court. The circuit court says, yes, yes, you can divide. You, it's theoretically capable to apportion this matter. It goes back to the district court in 2015. The district court says, OK. Circuit court says, this can be apportioned. I'll apportion it. Uh, and uh, then it, uh, there's a motion for reconsideration. And the district court says, well, no, after all, it's not apportionable. So that was as recently as last uh, October. We'll see whether uh, the, uh, the worm turns again. Um, so there are a ranger progeny as well. Uh, these are a couple of the cases. There's others in your materials. Uh, you know, it's pretty straightforward. You send stuff to a landfill. Uh, it's unwanted product. You send it to a landfill. You know it's going there. Duh, you're an arranger. Uh, on the other hand, you have a factory. You sell it as a going concern. The factory has some asbestos in it. Later on, it's shut down. It becomes a abandoned property. Uh, or derelict property, was the person who originally had the factory an arranger? No. Under this case, Newark Enterprises, no. Um, here's another one. <coughs> NL Industries discharges radioactive waste into the Raritan River. Later on, the Corps of Engineers comes along, dredges the river for other purposes, not for environmental purposes, but for navigational purposes, S puts the dredge spoils on a piece of property opposite where NL had operated. Uh, that company who owned that property later on, Epic, finds out that there's contamination on it, sues NL, says, hey, that contamination from you came from you. NL says, no, no, I didn't put it there. The Corps of Engineers put it there. No, no, NL is liable as an arranger. Um, some other things, uh, there's been a lot of case law on what happens when you have an, a, a PCB containing electronic equipment like transformers and capacitors, and you either are getting rid of them as waste, or you're refurbishing them, or you're trying to uh, sell them as a scrap, and they have some value as scrap, and these different kinds of transactions have been looked at by a number of courts and questioning whether each of one of those uh, different types of transactions does or doesn't qualify as an arrangement for disposal of hazardous substances. Uh, and uh, you'll have to keep track of these different cases and figure out exactly what your client's circumstances are if you have one of these uh, sort of uh, situations. Um, once again, NCR. This is the same company that's involved in those Fox River cases, and uh, NCR has been treated very differently in the Sixth and the Seventh Circuits. In the Sixth Circuit, by a uh, district court case, says you sell PCB containing waste material to a recycler. You knew it was hazardous. Uh, you didn't inform the recyclers. You're liable as an arranger because the recycler discharges into the water. But in the Seventh Circuit, the Circuit Court says, no, 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 that was a legitimate transaction, even though the proceeds from this transaction didn't cover the costs of preparing the waste paper for sale. Nevertheless, it was a legitimate transaction. It's not an arrangement for disposal. So I wouldn't be surprised to see this going back up to the Supreme Court one of these days. And there's some uh, decisions about whether the government could be liable as an arranger, depending on how it plays a role in permitting activities or authorizing certain activities. Here's a couple of cases where the US wasn't liable for issuing permits. 
uh, for certain kinds of activities. One was dredging uh, in a waterway, the other one was overseeing mine operations. But then you got a couple of cases where the US was liable. In one case, they required lessees who mined on government property to do certain things with their waste materials. The court felt that's enough of sort of sticking its fingers into the activity to become an arranger. Uh, and uh, there's this other final case here uh, where the government exercised control over a federal contractor's waste disposal activities uh, and uh, therefore got stuck uh, and as, a, uh, as an arranger. So what's the impact on the program? Uh, for all of this, well, this issue gets raised in virtually every negotiation. You've got Burlington Northern issues coming up in all negotiations. Uh, the stakes are high for both sides, government and the PRPs. There's a lot of uncertainty still, notwithstanding all of these uh, cases that I've talked about. We are seeing definitely more trials uh, because of the fact-intensive inquiry that the, con that the court called for. There is still this confusion between apportionment and allocation. Uh, we're probably likely to see some more sites with orphan shares. That means uh, more uh, costs for the government. Uh, so uh, that's probably what is likely to happen. And uh, with that, I will uh, sit down. Great, thank you. And I'll just say, Phyllis Feinmark, who you'll be hearing from this afternoon, questioned whether she or I would speak more quickly. You will be the judge. <laughs> you can take a breath now. Um, a couple of quick questions for Walter. Yes. Walter, a lot of us uh, here know about the Lower Passaic River and EPA's uh, efforts. Um, question for you with the uh, um, expiration of the Superfund tax, I guess, how many years ago now? Many years 1995. ago. 1995. Um, what does it mean that uh, Diamond Alkali is the lead funder um, in terms of the um, progress and the fact that the studies, at least from those of us who, who follow it, seem to be proceeding on a rather slow So for pace. the two or three of you who don't represent clients in the Pacific River, uh, <laughs> there, are, there are, I think we've noticed something on the order of 70 PRPs, uh, some of them are have disappeared, but most of them are still standing. Uh, the lead PRP, we've always said, we've always taken that position uh, to the extent that there is such a thing as a lead PRP, is Occidental Chemical, which is the successor in liability to Diamond Alkali, Diamond Shamrock. Uh, but uh, there's another company called Maxis, which is in the chain of succession. And um, so, and then there's a company called Tierra, which is the uh, sort of the cleanup subsidiary. And so we call them jointly Tierra Maxis Occidental, or TMO. Um, now that the rod has been issued, we have gone to TMO, mm -hmm. and we have asked TMO to enter into an administrative consent order with us to carry out the design mm -hmm. of this very, very complicated and expensive project. Uh, TMO has uh, responded uh, with a, what I'll call a good faith offer, saying, yeah, in good faith, they're willing to negotiate this matter. They have serious concerns about uh, what we drafted into the administrative consent order that we uh, proposed to them, uh, but uh, they've, entered, they've agreed to enter into negotiations with us, and we hope to bring that to a conclusion by the end of this federal fiscal year. September 30th or earlier. At the same time, we've said to all the other PRPs, this doesn't mean you're off the hook, you're not. Uh, but we have said that we are going to entertain uh, and come up with a structure for de minimis settlements and for clearing out what I'll call some of the underbrush, uh, try and reduce the, so the transaction costs for some of the smaller participants, uh, and have a fewer number of parties who really have some stake in the matter and really need to kind of continue to pay attention to all the technical stuff. So. Uh, I don't know exactly the timing that we're going to do on that. I think we're focusing our attention initially on getting this design order underway. And once that's done, we're going to turn our attention to these de minimis actions and the other things of that sort uh, to try and move it forward. Yes, sir. Yeah. Uh, when you uh, did the um, analysis of Diamond Shamrock's contribution to the Passaic River, and then the and Diamond Shamrock claimed that other responsible parties upstream up in uh, up on, in Delaw Delaware, um, Delaquana, or I think it's called, Delawanda, or something. The other companies along the way, could you uh, distinguish the dioxin uh, profile different for Diamond Shamrock from those others? All right, so first of all, there, you're right that, that the successor liability there to Diamond Alkali is because of di dioxin that came from the facility on Newark, uh, on the river in Newark where Agent Orange was made during the Vietnam War era. Uh, there is, there was arguably at least one other source upriver from there where there might have been dioxin coming out of uh, 
the manufacturer of hexachlorophene facility. Uh, there has been a lot of got back and forth about trying to fingerprint which dioxin would come from the Newark facility, which dioxin might have come from the upstream hexachlorophene facility, and whether that came in at all. So far, that's inconclusive. It looks like most of the dioxin that we're finding is most likely associated with the Newark diamond alkali facility. There are, however, many other PRPs and many other contaminants. You've got hundreds of contaminants there. The other major contaminants are PCBs. I mentioned uh, in my remarks that we are looking upstream for PCB, ongoing PCB discharges at very low levels that are nevertheless sufficient enough to cause us not to achieve our results, our desired results at the end of the day, and that we're looking to the water program to help us with. Uh, but many of the, of the other PRPs are in the Newark area. They're not like far, far away. They're small local areas. Mm -hmm. We have mercury discharges. We have VOC discharges. We got coal tar. We got everything in, the, in that river. Okay, we're going to uh, cut it off there. And Walter's not going anywhere. Um, we'll pick it up at the end. Uh, it's my pleasure now to introduce Edward McTiernan, uh, who for the four years of the first term of Governor Cuomo was New York State Department of Environmental Conservation Deputy Commissioner and General Counsel. Uh, I think those of us who had the pleasure of dealing with that office in that time will think back on his years as uh, one of the better tenures of general counsels of the agency. Um, of course, that gets me no credit for matters currently pending before his successor, I guess. It certainly doesn't. Okay, okay. But I do hope you were paying attention to what Walter said on certain issues. Um, if those of you who were here at the last conference could remember Ed's presentation on the shipments of petroleum by rail was kind of the most revolutionary and uh, we spoke the most content of, uh, of, of anything that was presented there. And for that reason, we asked him to come back and give us an update on those issues. Uh, even though he's no longer at the department, he's returned to us on the dark side uh, as a partner in the New York office of Arnold and Porter. And again, we'll take a couple of questions for him after he's finished, and then we'll have a free-for-all after all speakers are done. Should be set up. Sure. Thank you, Seth. So thank you uh, all for coming and for, for having me back. Uh, the attendance at this conference you know, always is remarkable. I think it's, a, it's evidence of how important the environmental practice in Region 2 and in, in the tri-state area continues to be. And, and I'm very happy to be with you this morning for a couple of reasons, not the least of which is today is June 2nd. That is the third anniversary of the application by uh, uh, Global Terminals for some um, Title V permission to add some relatively modest uh, heating capacity to a, termini, to a terminal in Albany, New York. And um, I'm gonna try and bring us back to, uh, to that discussion about global. And I'm also I'd like to spend my time commemorating that application with you by reviewing how we got here and giving you an update on some of the events involving uh, global and then giving perhaps a little whirlwind overview of all the federal and state activity on movement of crude by rail over the last uh, two years since we were all here together. Um, so there was a ruling in the global case just uh, at the end of April, and it described the matter as being in legal limbo. And um, I'm going to try and explain to you how we began our descent into limbo. Um, um, Movement of crude oil by rail in New York State is really nothing new. Crude oil was moving by rail in New York State since at least the 1880s. However, historically, the way that refineries in the United States, at least, uh, received raw product was by ocean-going vessel or pipeline. Um, all of this uh, changed as a result of the development of the backing crude fields in North Dakota. Now. North Dakota is an awful nice place, I'm certain. Um, it's one of those places where they have uh, you know, two senators, but only one representative, because they're relatively <laughs> sparsely populated. Um, <laughs> but it lacks ocean terminals, and it also has no uh, a, 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 you know, a substantive pipeline capability. So the, uh, the um, involvement and development of the back and fields, and I'm not sure what happened to the mouse here. Um, Oh, okay. Um, 
corresponds to this time period here. It also corresponds to my uh, entry into government here. <laughs> uh, and uh, crude oil, a movement by rail in the United States, increased dramatically as a result of the North Dakota developments. 4,000% increase in the movement of crude by rail. Um, if you have not yet seen a unit train moving crude oil, you should. They are truly an impressive piece of engineering. Between 50 and 125 tanker cars carrying a single product, each car carries 700 barrels, that's 30,000 gallons. So an entire unit train is 2.2 million gallons of crude oil rolling across uh, New York State. Um, where did the oil that happened to uh, come out of uh, North Dakota end up? Well, uh, this <laughs> figure shows the proportional distribution. Um, and uh, as you can see, EPA Region 2 is right, um, <laughs> right in the sweet spot. Uh, I think every school child in New York uh, learned about the Erie Canal, um, you know, commenced operation in 1825. The term I heard in, in the classroom was opened the door to the west, uh, was killed by the railroads, of course, in the 1850s. It turns out somebody left the door to the west open <laughs> because a lot of the crude from the back and field follows the Erie Canal <coughs> uh, transportation routes through upstate New York and the proportion of that uh, uh, material that found its way into New York State um, you know, is, is remarkable. Um, and where did, this, um, where did this crude oil uh, end up? Well, there's a, region, there's a reason why Region 2 uh, you know, was at the receiving end of that bold uh, green arrow. There are a lot of major terminals, and there are a, a significant refining capability uh, in, in the region. Uh, indeed, remarkably, the port of New York and New Jersey, the storage capacity for crude oil there exceeds 75 million barrels, which is uh, an important uh, percentage of the national storage capacity. Um, but I'd like to talk to you about a particular terminal, which is in Albany, New York. Um, uh, it's, uh, um, uh, Albany's important because, again, if you were a school child in New York, it's at the confluence of the Mohawk and Hudson Rivers. Uh, it was the hub of commerce uh, at a long, long time ago when the Erie Canal was important in the 1820s. Uh, but it is still an ice-free port. Uh, the federal government maintains the navigability of the, of the Hudson River up to Troy, New York. So products can move in and out of, of Albany all year round. And there are two Class I railroads that service the terminals in Albany, CSX and um, Canadian Pacific. In fact, Albany is Canadian Pacific's only guaranteed ice-free outlet. Um, so um, there is a terminal uh, in Albany, uh, in, uh, very close to downtown. Uh, it was an existing terminal, uh, had capacity of about 30 million gallons of storage. It had been around since the 1950s. Uh, it was acquired by, um, by a new operator in 2007, and the prior operator, Mobile Exxon, um, uh, wound down its operations in around 2010. Um, and it had historically been used to serve the upstate markets um, and distribute finished product. So fuel oil and uh, uh, fuel oils and gasoline were distributed out of this, this, um, this facility. Global's plan was without any new infrastructure, no new terminal, no new pipeline, um, no new tracks, was to change the flow direction so that instead of distributing finished products, the, uh, Albany would become a center for receiving crude oil. Um, and uh, this required um, a permit from the Department of Environmental Conservation. Um, uh, in order to increase the efficiency of the transfer of this crude oil, which is much thicker than refined product, they wanted to heat some of the product. And that's what the application that has gotten so much attention. And, you know, I would submit to you, it's certainly my personal opinion, that, you know, on all those many cold, dark nights in Albany when you need a little heat to, to move some oil, this permit application would not have gotten attention because of the permit itself. The question is the oil trains, the movement of trains. Uh, approximately two trains a day were moving across the state um, to serve um, the global terminal. It's a little hard to see this map. But it's a, the movement through each county in New York by gallon. Um, and 
this is a, a weekly reporting, and some of the numbers are pretty striking. Places like Herkimer County, a pretty quiet place, 30 million gallons a week of crude oil rolling through uh, downtown uh, uh, Utica and, and some of these towns that had forgotten they even had rail systems. So um, the oil train movement got an awful lot of attention. Uh, that created a problem. <laughs> because what people were really upset about was uh, the movement of crude oil by, by rail, and New York's role was really managing a terminal and had an, a Title V air pollution permit before them. Um, the New York State's role, the state's role in uh, regulating the movement of hazardous uh, cargo is extremely limited. Why is that? Starts with the Commerce Clause and works its way through every single major piece of federal legislation. Uh, the, uh, the Hazardous Material Transportation Act, the Interstate uh, Commerce Clause uh, Termination Act, they all have expressed preemption provisions. Uh, states cannot regulate the movement of goods by rail. Very simple uh, premise. Um, however, uh, regulating the terminal was a possibility. Now these terminals are really just like short stay motels for, uh, for crude oil. Um, the, uh, the state regulators treat terminals based upon their capacity, not their throughput. So uh, for all intents and purposes, a terminal is treated as if it's filled every single day of the week. Its spill plans, its air pollution permits are all based upon the premise that it's totally filled up all the time. So the fact that, the, um, that, uh, that global terminals had a new plan and would have greater throughput by rail really didn't change the profile of this facility very much from a regulatory perspective. That did not uh, prove to be a very satisfactory uh, position to a lot of, uh, a lot of stakeholders. Um, so as I mentioned, um, uh, um, there was a Title V permit uh, before um, the DEC. Title V permits have a pesky problem. When Congress um, uh, changed the Clean Air Act, um, and, and, and brought Title V into existence and, and brought uh, state permitting uh, under the federal blanket, it anticipated that there might be delays in getting permits. And under the statute, states have 18 months to, um, to process a Title V permit. In fact, there's a great deal of um, comments in the Federal Register and in other places uh, where EPA uh, assured Congress that it could be done in much, much less time and that 18 months would be the outliers um, so uh, DEC was stuck with this 18-month deadline. Um, they de declared the application uh, submitted by Mobile for the uh, for submitted by Global for these uh, these heaters to be complete. Moved forward through the seeker process. A negative declaration was indeed issued. The controversy hit. Uh, the state uh, issued um, a notice of intent to rescind back in May. The state's been sued in two different ways. Local residents have sued in an attempt to uh, prevent the permit from being issued, and as you might imagine, uh, the operator has sued in an effort to get his permit issued. Um, I mentioned earlier that on April 14th, uh, the court uh, ordered uh, the department to act. It said your 18 months is up, in fact, much more than 18 months, and um, uh, it's time for final agency action. Uh, I know uh, that we're going to have a speaker from DC later. I don't want to steal his thunder, but I think he may provide a little bit of an update on some uh, on some of the events uh, uh, that have happened since that court order. But uh, I'm not sure we've heard the last word. Um, but uh, just because states have a limited role, oh, here's, so here's um, is just a picture. Perhaps it's a little hard to see of the global terminal. It's it's relation to downtown Albany, and in the foreground you can see um, perhaps. Uh, the, the presence of what an oil train, a unit train, looks like. And uh, when these trains rumble through downtown Utica, downtown Syracuse, uh, they get a lot of attention. Um, um, and this, as I said, unlike out west where there's a lot of litigation about new pipelines, new terminals, uh, new facilities, this plan involves no new infrastructure. Um, anyway, um, so just because the states uh, well, I'd like, to, I'd like to mention briefly, I'm going to change the order here a little bit, some of the federal activity. Uh, the feds have been very, very active on changing the rules of the road for railroads moving uh, hazardous cargo, class three uh, hazardous liquids like uh, crude oil. Um, and in May of uh, 2015, 
the Pipelines and Hazardous uh, Materials Administration, uh, uh, an arm of the federal DOT, adopted comprehensive regulations uh, that would change both um, uh, new specifications for rail cars, the famous uh, uh, D111 cars, uh, adopted new operating requirements and had a 10-year phase-in, which is a remarkably quick undertaking for railroads. These are monolithic <laughs> uh, organizations. Um, uh, needless to say, though, the, the, the DOT was immediately sued by the railroads um, and by uh, other stakeholders, uh, environmental NGOs. That litigation is, was ongoing uh, in two different uh, courts. And lo and behold, uh, in uh, December of 2015, uh, a, a statute was adopted, uh, the, the FAST Act. Uh, it, it, it mainly got an attention in the environmental bar because of its impact on the NEPA seeker uh, type analysis, but it also, uh, uh, subtitle C, section 7301, had the safe transportation of flammable liquids by rail um, section and basically adopted by statute many of DOT's key decisions, uh, effectively undermining much of the, much of the litigation uh, positions. Um, at the state level, despite being hemmed in by preemption, uh, no chief executive likes to be told that he, doesn't have a, he or she does not have a lot of authority, and indeed each of our three statewide elected officials have tr attempted to play a role um, on movement of crude oil by rail. Uh, Governor Cuomo issued uh, an executive order in, in January of 2014. Executive Order 125 formed an interagency task force, increased inspection of rails and terminals in New York State. If you have not seen the task force report and you are the least bit interested in movement of hazardous materials by rail, I would recommend it to you. It is an excellent primer on both the physical uh, um, issues of uh, you know, equipment and the, um, the regulatory environment. Um, but, um, but I wanna, I wanna step aside for one second because it was a really fascinating thing that happened. North Dakota, my state I'm fascinated with, <laughs> uh, has something called the Industrial Commission, which uh, regulates, among other things, natural resources. Uh, the Industrial Commission had at this time, in the late uh, 2014, a proceeding pending by which it intended to set a standard for crude oil that could be offered for transportation. Um, and a, a very interesting thing happened on October 24th, 2014. The New York DEC and the New York DOT wrote to North Dakota urging action on that, on that proceeding. And indeed, on December 9th, 2014, North Dakota adopted a rule that set a limit on vapor pressure that could be um, in the backing crude before it's offered for sale. One of the challenges with backing crude is that it's slightly different than some other crudes. And when you have this Coke can that's shipped across country and it gets shaken up and shaken up, if it has a high vapor pressure, it increases some of the risks in transportation. Um, uh, I find this fascinating that we see here, even though the states are fully preempted, New York preempted and uh, North Dakota preempted, in the great experiment that is state regulation, and states' rights became a lot more important to me after I got my DEC job. Um, <laughs> here you have two states who found ways to influence interstate commerce without, I believe, running afoul of the Commerce Clause, regulating the product before it gets offered for sale and regulating the, the hotel or terminal that it ends up in. So um, I think it's a very interesting uh, development. But uh, um, Governor Cuomo's actions were not the only actions uh, that are part of the recent update. Uh, interestingly, in December of 2015, Attorney General Schneiderman uh, filed a petition with the DOT, with the federal DOT, asking that the vapor pressure requirements be ratcheted down as a matter of federal rule. Uh, 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 Attorney General Schneiderman uh, would, would propose that the 13 pounds per inch uh, limit that, that, the, uh, that the North Dakota Industrial Commission has set be ratcheted down to nine uh, PSI, and that's a petition that is still uh, technically pending before, uh, before uh, the federal DOT. Finally, not to be left out at all, our other statewide elected official in New York, okay, it's the Comptroller. <laughs> uh, the Comptroller DiNapoli has written uh, on, on April 26 to DOT to complain about the insurance framework that railroads operate under. 
uh, Comptroller Dinapoli, as some of you know, is the trustee for the state spill fund. His position is uh, he could get stuck holding the bag if there's an expensive cleanup and there's a lack of insurance, and he's asked for, uh, he's asked for federal help. I want to leave you with a couple closing thoughts about continuing uh, developments in this area. Uh, I won't ask for a show of hands, but I'm sure that some of you out there remember uh, gas rationing, odd and even days, and, and lines. Um, as a result of that, um, many people know that we've had an export ban in this country. We do not export crude oil. That's likely to end. Um, as that gets wound down, um, the estimates are that exports of oil could add as many as 4,500 cars of crude daily to the national rail system in the United States. That's a lot of trains. Um, people are assessing the question of pipelines. Uh, I think the general assessment is that uh, uh, rail accidents are more common, but pipeline accidents tend to involve more gallonage and do more harm. Mm -hmm. uh, and it almost doesn't matter because it's practically impossible to get a pipeline built in this country right now. So anyway, I offer those as my closing thoughts. I'm certainly happy to take some questions about any of these, uh, these issues. And um, uh, again, uh, thank you. Again, we can, we can take a couple of questions for Ed. Yes. Uh, are you saying that the heaters uh, that were being permitted were necessary to transfer Bach and crude? to the tanks? No, the heaters were not necessary. The terminal is operating today without heaters. Yeah. Uh, and it, it's, it's the, the, it was the department's understanding when I worked there that the heaters could help the efficiency of certain transfers. Um, you know, Albany is not the warmest place, uh, at least uh, until climate change takes care of that. <laughs> uh, so the idea of in, uh, more efficient transfers. What happens in Albany is the um, Bakken crude is moved from rail cars spends the night in the uh, in giant tanks at the terminal, and then is put on ocean-going barges. Much of it goes back to Canada, amazingly, to be refined in Newfoundland. Some of it goes to the Caribbean, some of it goes to the Garden State, uh, and some of it goes down to the Gulf, but it gets transferred oh, I just I to barges it's from It's there. a high and vapor it pressure, doesn't it? It'd be more for like a tar sands kind of situation where you need the heaters. Okay, that's fine, thanks. Okay, one more? Yes. Yes. So the, the, the answer is undoubtedly the bottom has fallen out of the oil market. Oil is a commodity. The great thing about a capitalistic economy is when we have a commodity, everybody runs after it and then, <laughs> and then it's inevitably a crash. We're certainly in that, in that uh, crash mode. The, the, the number of shipments is definitely down. I did try to get some um, Department of Energy information uh, statistics. None of it was presented quite as graphically as I thought this audience <laughs> would appreciate. Uh, but, but the reality is because of the way that the regulations work, from the state's perspective, it doesn't matter what throughput is. Capacity is what's regulated because they, tr for spill planning purposes, for, for, for uh, potential to emit under air permits, you treat these terminals as if they're filled up every single day. Uh, so the rail traffic is what gets the attention, but the, but, the, but the terminal is treated, frankly, as if it were at full capacity all the time. Okay, our last speaker is Kenneth Clue. That's with an L. Some of your program materials uh, have it spelled wrong. Kenneth Clue, uh, who is not a lawyer, uh, which will be, I'm sure, a relief to many of you. Uh, he is the director of the Division of Reme Remediation Management to the New Jersey Department of Environmental Protection. Uh, and we asked him to be here today to talk about what is one of the more unique aspects of the program in New Jersey, the License Site Remediation Professional Program, uh, the transition away from New Jersey's uh, use of a traditional remediation oversight program to the licensed professional model. Uh, and he's, he, he's the man that can tell you all about that. So take it over here. This will control the slides. Good afternoon, and uh, thank you for inviting me to be here today. 
Um, I look forward to telling you a little bit about um, the Site Remediation Reform Act and its evolution in New Jersey. I'll provide some brief metrics uh, and then uh, talk a little bit about a recent time frame that just passed in New Jersey and how we are dealing with that and also then just touch back on um, some, uh, just a, a brief regulatory overview of some things that are coming up now. But the, uh, the Site Remediation Reform Act, which was enacted in 2009, has really fundamentally changed the way we do site remediation work in New Jersey. So before the Site Remediation Reform Act, New Jersey had a voluntary cleanup program we had no enforceable deadlines. In fact, many of the sites that I was working on in the mid-1980s, when I first joined the DEP, were still under remediation when the Site Remediation Reform Act was uh, enacted and continue to undergo remediation. And in fact, many of these haven't even had not even completed their delineation in their 30-year history since they were discovered. Uh, before we had the Site Remediation Reform Act, we had very prescriptive technical requirements that laid out exactly, almost like a cookbook that you had to follow as to how you investigated and remediated contamination. So there wasn't much left up to the environmental professionals who were actually performing this work. And uh, we also had an enormous and ever-increasing backlog of contaminated sites. We were well over, the numbers are somewhat disputed, uh, but we were well over 20,000 up into 23,000 contaminated sites that were being directly managed by our staff. And like most states, we were directly involved in every decision. Environmental professionals, responsible parties would submit documents to the department. We would review those documents. Oftentimes there was a long lag time while we were reviewing documents send something back with comments, await new data, perhaps several months, even years, get another document, which resulted in some very protracted cleanups. So we were becoming an obstacle to remediation because those who wanted to move quickly really weren't able to, and those who didn't want to move, we played right into their hands and just had a very long, drawn-out cleanup process. One of the other consequences was that because of this process of submitting documents to the department and us providing very lengthy, detailed comment letters back, we were really enabling those individuals who weren't really qualified to, per, uh, to uh, perform this work. There were no credentials. Anyone, in effect, could be an environmental professional in New Jersey, and that's how it is in many states. So we would, we would get documents from an environmental professional, send back these very detailed comments that they would show their responsible party, and they would then um, undertake the work that we recommended over the course of months or years, and then we would get something back from them. We also assumed responsibility, in a sense, for the work that was being done. We were only evaluating what was ever submitted to us, and at the end of the day, the department issued the no further action letter. It was our affirmation that work was done. And that was the brass ring that everyone had at the end of the day saying, yes, I have my no further action letter issued by the Department of Environmental Protection. They have blessed this and therefore I am done. There was no responsibility placed on the environmental professional or the responsible party. It was all on the department issuing that no further action letter at the end of the day. It was really a catch-me-if-you-can kind of process. There were no consequences for professional incompetence, no consequences for withholding information, no consequences for intentionally providing misinformation. The worst thing that would happen at the end of the day was the department would come back to you and say, as an environmental professional, the work that you, that you uh, submitted is not sufficient you need to go back and tell your responsible party, tell your client that they need to pay you to do additional work. So it was a pretty good arrangement for the environmental professionals and for the responsible parties as well. So as a result of SARA, we got some really important legislation. Now there was an affirmative obligation for responsible parties to remediate. 
there was a reporting requirement in our spill act previously, but nothing that really said that you had to clean up unless you fell under a specific statutory program like our Industrial Site Recovery Act. There were regulatory and mandatory timeframes now for specific milestones in the cleanup process. Like I said previously, we had cleanups that were going on for decades without any real progress. Um, one of the other things that we had was uh, we created the license site remediation professionals. This was really the key issue. License site remediation professionals had to have educational, professional experience, and most importantly, they had to pass an exam in order to practice in New Jersey. Every remediation that takes place in the state, with some limited exceptions, like um, Superfund cleanups or those, some cases under RECRA that have federal uh, oversight, or our unregulated heating oil tank program, require the services of an LSRP. Where I said before we had very prescriptive rules, we changed our process, changed our regulatory process, and now our rules really set the end goal. So instead of saying exactly how you went about doing the work, it said what your obligation was. For example, at the conclusion of your RI, remedial investigation, you needed to fully delineate the contamination, evaluate all receptors, and have all the information you need in order to develop an effective cleanup plan. Before that, we told you exactly how many wells you needed to install, how many well, uh, where they needed to be placed, how frequently you needed to sample them, and it really took all of the responsibility off the individuals who really have the most knowledge in the field. So we now are allowing these environmental professionals to apply their professional judgment and also to proceed without DEP approval. There are certain documents that need to be provided to the department, but an LSRP continues to remediate without waiting for us to get back to them. We inspect all documents that come to the department. We don't review every document in great detail. Every document comes with a form that provides an overview of the work that was completed. All of those get inspected. Things that don't look quite right or have a high potential for uh, environmental or uh, public health risk get a more thorough review. I mentioned about the prescriptive rules for doing work. We abandon the prescriptive rules, like I said, for those more um, lofty objectives, and we did the rest of our the rest of the details or the how-to are provided in guidance. And all of our 30 or so guidance documents that have been developed have all de been developed by DEP staff with the participation of our stakeholders. So LSRPs and responsible parties participate in the development of all of our guidance documents. LSRPs can deviate from the guidance documents using their professional judgment, but they have to justify why what they did accomplishes the goals. The other thing that's critically important was the creation of the LSRP board, the Professional uh, Site Remediation Professional Licensing Board that oversees the licensing and the performance. There is a very strict code of conduct now that governs the performance of the LSRPs. There are serious consequences for providing misinformation, not applying professional judgment, and most seriously, for not implementing remedies that are protective of public health and the environment. Complaints are filed to the board. LSRPs can actually lose their license and, and uh, suffer criminal prosecution for failing to adhere to the code of conduct. This works really well with our Brownfield Development Program. Um, Brownfield redevelopment is all about helping people move quickly, those of you who are engaged in that type of work. We have three programs that really work well in New Jersey. We have a hazardous discharge site remediation fund that provides grants and loans to private and public entities. This is really attractive to municipalities. It allows them to get 100% grants to do any investigative work, to explore a property before they actually acquire it, to determine if it's of value for them to, re to redevelop without actually going in and, and obtaining that property. We provide 100% of the funding to do all of that work. And then if they acquire the property and want to uh, develop certain end uses, 
we provide certain grants in those cases. For recreation and conservation, they can get a 75% grant to do remediation work. Affordable housing, a 50% matching grant. Renewable energy, a 75% matching grant. So you can imagine these are incredibly popular. Since the program's inception, the state has doled out about $250 million in grants to municipalities to do this work. Our brownfield and landfill reimbursement programs are focused on private entities that allows individuals who, who, who are not responsible to acquire property, uh, conduct remediation, and then reimburse for up to 75% of their remediation costs by generating new taxes. And then our last initiative really is our brownfield development areas. It's an area-wide program, uh, coordinated uh, approach to remediation and redevelopment that we uh, started back in 2002. It's been very successful right now. We have 28 BDAs that include 270 sites and about 2,500 acres. The most famous of these right now is um, our uh, Kramer Hill property, our Kramer Hill BDA in Camden, uh, where the state has invested through this program about $24 million, but more importantly, that leveraged a $57 million grant from the Ray and Joan Kroc Foundation to construct and fund the um, operation of the Salvation Army Community Development Center down there. So that is one of our true success stories under that initiative. So I just wanted to provide some very brief statistics, a snapshot of, um, of what the LSRP program, what the case, uh, the DEP site remediation program looks like right now. I had mentioned we had well over 20,000 sites. Right now we're carrying, and this is at the end of December, carrying about 14,000 sites. 11,000 of those are being managed by LSRPs. Our other cases include Superfund, RECRA, federal facilities. And then at any one time, we have about 1,000 to 1,200 unregulated heating oil tank cases. These are homeowner cases, uh, fuel oil. These come through and go out relatively quickly. There is a high throughput for, uh, for these cases. The goal here, and as we're seeing, is we're accelerating the process. Someone mentioned before about mathematics and lawyers. I had mentioned before we had 20,000 sites. Now we have 14,000. One would immediately do the math and say, yes, New Jersey has cleaned up 6,000 sites during this period, but that would be incorrect because we always have new sites coming into the process. This provides some of that information. You can see how many new cases we have coming into the program every year. So during this period between uh, 2011 and 2015, since the implementation of the Site Remediation Reform Act, we have closed over 20,000 cases. The milestones that I wanted to point out here, uh, the, uh, the number in uh, red, that was when the Site Remediation Reform Act was enacted, and that required every contaminated site to be overseen by an LSRP. So you see that big spike there in red. Uh, in, um, you, across from that, in blue, you see in uh, calendar year 12, this is when we had a big rush for everyone who didn't want to hire an LSRP to come in and get the gold ring issued by the DEP, which was the uh, no further action letter. So that's where that number came from. And the other uh, number that I wanted to highlight here, or year that I wanted to highlight, was in calendar year 14, where for the first time we actually closed more cases than we had new cases coming into the program. Uh, the final remediation document that, we, that is issued now by the LSRPs is called the Response Action Outcome. They issue it independently, unlike the NFAs that the department issues. They are, had issued. The LSRP is fully responsible for the protectiveness of that response action outcome. Just some quick numbers. As you can see, the number of RAOs as sites are progressing, moving quickly through the process, as LSRPs are becoming more comfortable and familiar with the process, those numbers have been increasing essentially every year. One of the big fears was that the department was not going to be able to relinquish that command and control. And as documents came in from, 
from the LSRPs, we were going to be invalidating. Invalidating is what the department does when we determine that an RAO is not protective. Since the program's inception, there have been 222 documents of all of these RAOs that have been submitted that have been returned to an LSRP, which a an LSRP has accepted back to be revised. The LSRP has withdrawn those RAOs and agreed with the department's finding in most cases that not that they weren't necessarily protective or done correctly, but the LSRP did not provide enough supporting documentation to justify his decision. And that's one of the things that we've been working with the LSRPs to do is document, document, document. Make sure that you provide enough information to support your decisions. There have been nine instances where the department, only nine, where the department has invalidated RAOs. In every instance, this was a situation where an LSRP who was licensed at one point, initially every, the LSRPs were all licensed by the department and they were temporarily licensed until they took an exam. They were originally licensed based on credentials. Many of those LSRPs, even though they had the appropriate academic and professional credentials, were unable to pass an exam, so they lost their license, were never able to obtain a permanent license. All nine of those cases that were invalidated were invalidations because an LSRP, because he was no longer an LSRP, was unable to withdraw the, uh, the RAO voluntarily. He just did not have the authority any longer to do it, so the department was forced to invalidate those RAOs. So that fear that was raised has never materialized. I mentioned one specific time frame uh, one of the things that was uh, one of the statutory time frames included in the Site Remediation Reform Act was that our, our, for all cases that were in the DEP where we knew of a discharge before 1999, the responsible party had to have delineated the contamination, complete an RI by May 2014. That's 15 years from the time that, at least from the time that the, the contamination was known to be present to complete your remedial investigation. Many did not make that deadline and many requested an extension that was provided through a subsequent statute and signed into law by Governor Christie. There were 1,149 applications or extensions that were granted two years to this past May of 2016. Everyone was given an additional two years to complete their remedial investigation. Of those, we received 958 RI reports. That's an 83 compliance rate. And perhaps the biggest news here was that all of these came through an electronic portal that we developed. So rather than submitting, as you've probably seen, these enormous documents in multiple copies uh, in paper, the RI reports came through an online portal that ensured that uh, everything was in order and cut way back on our paper and also makes them much more available through our Freedom of Information Act or our uh, OPRA process. For those 191 who did not make the deadline, uh, they will be subjected to what's called direct department oversight. This is really where you as a responsible party do not want to be because it is back where we were and we don't want folks to be here. Uh, this is where we were before the Site Remediation Reform Act. Once you are in direct department oversight, you have to remediate in accordance with our instructions. You have to perform a feasibility study. We select the remedy. You have to submit a public participation plan. You have to submit a remediation cost review that calculates the entire cost of your remediation, including any O&M, and then all of that money has to be put into a trust fund. That is really unappealing if you are a responsible party. So that's why we have done everything possible to try to encourage responsible parties to avoid being in direct oversight. It's bad for you, it's a tremendous use of our resources, and we don't want folks to be there. One of the good news is that 
For those who miss the deadline, if they come in and voluntarily do all these things, the department has the ability to rec relax certain requirements going forward. So we may not select the remedy. We may not require a feasibility study. So if you have a client who has missed the RI deadline, I encourage you to advise them to step forward, comply with the direct oversight requirements, notify the department, and we may be able to work something out. One of the newest things we're doing is a ticketing initiative. It's an innovative approach to try and help those who are not complying comply. Rather than going through the administrative law process, which many of you know probably takes years, DEP signs a complaint. It's um, issued with a municipal court date. It then is followed up with a letter from one of our deputies attorney general with terms for compliance. It goes before the municipal court judge who then can assess penalty, penalties only, but no injunctive relief. We've only been doing this for about six months now. We've issued 37 tickets for 27 sites. We've settled 20 of these for $136,200 and in uh, an average of five and a half months. That is lightning speed for those of you who uh, participate in this process in state or federal government. A quick overview on regulations. The Site Remediation Professional Licensing Board rules, those things that govern LSRPs were adopted this past January. We have a new heating oil tank system remediation rule that is coming out that governs unregulated heating oil tanks. That should be this summer. Amendments to our administrative requirements, technical requirements, NGIPTES and UST rules this summer. And then we have recently readopted without change our remediation standards. We are in the process of amending those and those are expected to be due out late summer, early fall. Lastly, landfill legacy law. Any of those, especially of you who may live in the northwestern part of New Jersey, may be familiar with the Fenimore landfill that inspired this legislation. Uh, we, will now, we are now regulating the placement of contaminated soil on landfills that have been closed or have not been properly closed. Those rules are also under development. I encourage you to um, subscribe to the department's listserv. You will receive automatic information on um, updated rules, announcements, policies, guidance. You can do so by going to our webpage. I've included my contact information if you need to reach me. And I will leave you with one word, and I'm sure Walter will agree with me, perfluorinated chemicals. <laughs> if you've never heard of them, you will. Thank you. Thank you. Thank you. Bearing in mind that we have lunch ahead of us, we can take a few questions for Ken or for anyone else. Mark. Ken, uh, one of the things that I think uh, that also should be mentioned, which is a benefit to the program, is you can now sell industrial facilities that, that you would call lightning treatment as opposed to what used to happen. And that's been a huge economic help in the, uh, in the commercial area of the industrial area. Thank you, Mark. And, and that was one of the uh, incentives. We realized, sorry, we realized that we were not really protecting the environment. When you are slowing down cleanups, you are not really protecting the environment. When there are people who want to get done and you cannot accommodate them, that is not a good place to be and as a, as a regulator. And as you've probably heard, the uh, perfect is the enemy of good. So, and that's where we were. Yes, back there. Yeah. Um, you have a LSRP board. You mentioned that oversees the licensed professionals. Has that board ever uh, taken away a license other than from a professional who didn't pass the exam? There are some um, complaints before the board now that um, may result in the loss of an individual's license. The process is relatively new and has really only evolved since uh, you know, the past 
six months or so, but I don't believe they have yet, but uh, there is a finding, a decision that is coming out soon that um, may result in an individual losing his license. Okay, yes. Or I might say he may, uh, I think, and I think there have also been individuals who have voluntarily surrendered their, their license as a result of a board complaint. Yeah, I, I'm Michael Hertz. I teach at the Cardozo Law School. I was interested in, in your description of the change from these highly prescriptive regulations to the more open-ended ones, if you will, a change from design to performance standards. In principle, that should lead to uh, cleanups which are sort of very more, are more innovative, show some creativity, right? Um, and I'm wondering whether in fact you observe that happening or actually on the ground is everyone doing sort of exactly what you would have required in your prescriptive regulations anyways? No, that, that's exactly what we're seeing. And, you know, one of the things, uh, one of the criticisms was, and, you know, I'll, uh, I'll repeat this, you know, now you have the fox watching the hen house. You have, you know, these LSRPs who are in the pocket of the, uh, the remediating parties just doing their bidding. That code of conduct is really powerful. And one of the things that we saw by taking the department out of the equation, we were no longer the backstop for LSRPs. So where they may try to cut corners before, now because responsibility for all of those decisions was on the LSRP, many of them are actually being more approaching sites more conservatively. Now that we're now that we were a few years in and people are getting more comfortable, our LSRPs are getting more comfortable, we're starting to see much more innovation and um, professionals exercising their professional judgment. Okay, we can take one more. Yes. So, you know, there, we, I think there's a fallacy that what, was, what we were doing before was really working because the information, the only information that the department had in rendering its decision and issuing the no further action letter was the information provided by the environmental professional. I will tell you now, any of us can go out and collect a sample anywhere on a site and give the department the information that represents the conditions that want to be represented. You can take the dirtiest sample, you can take the cleanest sample. We can't be out there in every instance overseeing the collection of every sample, how sites are being remediated. So there's a fallacy that the department was out there overseeing, duplicating work. It's just not practical. What we had to do was shift responsibility and have consequences for those very same individuals who were doing this work. And like I said, we noticed an immediate change where many of the LSRPs approach sites much more conservatively. And in those instances where we observe conditions where we don't think LSRPs are behaving properly, the department is filing complaints. We have several complaints, and I sign off on all the complaints as director for our division that we bring before the board, and we pursue those very, very aggressively. I guess the question is, what remedies do you have available to you beyond taking away someone's license? Well, there are criminal, possible criminal penalties that the board can issue. And the key point here is that the department regulates responsible parties. The board regulates LSRPs. The department does not regulate the environmental professionals. That is entirely a board responsibility, just like the bar, just like um, medical profession, engineers. We've aligned it so it operates just like the other environmental, uh, the other professional 
fields. Which is to say that an LSRP who submits an inadequate remedy plan for you, uh, uh, the, the, cl the client has ultimate liability for it. LSRP, the client and the LSRP both have to certify the document saying that it met the rules, followed our guidance, and is protective of public health and the environment. The other thing that the LSRP board does with the department's assistance is they conduct an audit of all documents submitted by 10% of the LSRPs every year. So they go through, randomly select 10% of the LSRPs and evaluate all of their submittals to date and to see whether or not they're complying and whether or not they're complying with the code of conduct. So there are several safeguards both on the department side and with the LSRP board and individuals, private individuals can also submit complaints about LSRPs and we've seen several of those already. Okay, well we've gone over not all of us can talk as quickly as Walter. Uh, will you please join me in thanking this wonderful panel for their time? Okay. Welcome back, everyone. It is with great pleasure that I introduce today's keynote speaker, Judith Enk. Since December 2009, Judith has been the regional administrator for EPA Region 2 which as we all know, covers New York, New Jersey, Puerto Rico, and the Virgin Islands, and eight federally recognized Indian nations. Judith's responsibilities include pretty much everything on today's program and more. It's been my privilege to work with Judith at the agency for these past six plus years. And it's hard for me to imagine that any RA has ever been more energetic and wide ranging than she has been. And the region is much the better for it. I know Judith has a lot to tell you about, so with that, Judith Think. Thank you, Eric. Um, <coughs> hi, everyone. It's really, really good to be with you. <coughs> so um, I always think of this as EPA Day, and um, a few CLE credits to boot doesn't hurt. I know why you're here, um, and it, it, all, it all works. So it's a real privilege to be here. I really want to commend uh, Columbia for co-sponsoring this, along with um, Eric Schaff and Paul Simon, the two hardest working lawyers in Manhattan. Uh, they have their hands in a, a lot of issues and do an amazing job. I was asked to run through um, some of our accomplishments in EPA Region 2 over the last um, six or seven years. Um, I want to remind everyone that I'm not leaving for about seven months, and I can get a lot done in seven months. I feel like I'm just learning to figure out how EPA really works, and um, it'll be a busy summer, and sorry, guys. Um, and I want to quote Monty Python, I'm not dead yet. <laughs> so um, it has been a real pleasure to work uh, uh, for both Lisa Jackson, the former New Jersey DEP commissioner, and Gina McCarthy, and an honor to work for President Obama, who appointed me uh, to this position. Um, and so I'm not good at following directions, so what I think I'll do today is run through some of the EPA uh, most significant accomplishments and then spend the other half of my time working on a really important uh, emerging water quality threat that I want to talk to you all about and get your thoughts and ideas on. So you all know the whole setup of EPA, the, you know, the importance of the headquarters office in Washington. They play a really, really important role, um, but they, um, they don't get the fun that we have in regional offices. If you're ever thinking of working at EPA, the fun is at the regional level because we get to work closely with communities. Uh, this, I'm meeting with some of our stakeholders. These are four-year-olds. Uh, we did um, a grant to Queens College on preserving monarch butterflies. So I get to spend the morning with these really smart kids who just look at them. I love them. They're so adorable, and they learned about monarch butterflies. And, and it's more fun hanging out with these kids than PRPs. Just saying. 
Sorry if there are any PRPs in the room. We love you. Uh, but the dynamic's a little different in the room. So at the regional level, you get to do stuff like this. You meet with um, little kids at, uh, there's a farm in, in Queens, the Queens Farm. So we get to fix local problems. We also get to be entrepreneurial. I want to start by saying all of our work is really viewed through the prism of environmental justice. How can our daily work improve conditions in low-income communities? And you know and I know that the health risks from pollution in low-income communities is very different than in other communities. And then secondly, what inspires a lot of our work is the impact on children's health. Children are uniquely vulnerable to pollution. Their little bodies are still developing, and so a children's health focus um, is really important to us. So some of the things we've really worked hard on in the last few years, one is Hurricane Sandy. Uh, 117 lives were lost, and there were lots and lots of environmental problems. Um, including uh, sewage treatment plants that lost electricity, so you had massive amounts of sewage going into communities. The Gowanus Canal went over its banks. Uh, people's home heating oil tanks erupting in their basements. So you, you typically think of FEMA and other agencies, but EPA played a major role on Sandy. In the beginning of the Obama administration, we also administered um, a lot of ERA money. Remember the stimulus program when President Obama was first elected? So we were able to administer $845 million uh, for water infrastructure improvements and $180 million for federal Superfund in improvements. Um, one of the more interesting experiences at EPA was enduring the federal government shutdown in 2013. That was interesting. Um, we also made sure that the federal clean water, federal funds were not used on the Tappan Zee Bridge Project. There's such a desperate need to fund water infrastructure. Uh, we sounded the alarm about contaminated drinking water in Hoosick Falls, uh, drinking water contaminated with PFOA, which is now a serious issue in um, Petersburg, New York, Newburgh. And in fact, some testing has revealed problems in Vermont and New Hampshire. So we um, work closely with our state partners to try to make sure that people have clean drinking water. Um, I'm kind of going out of order. This is not chronological. Uh, we've also done a lot of work on PCBs in schools. This was an issue that came to me when I um, first started at EPA. What you're looking at is a lighting ballast. And we had heard from parents in New York City public schools that they were really concerned about um, PCBs in air in schools, and there was a real focus on uh, caulking material. And then we're sitting around a conference table one day, and we said, what about the lights? And it was like one of those moments, you know that old cartoon, the 80s are over and I forgot to have children? Um, it was kind of like that. Of course, PCBs um, in lighting ballast. So, uh, we had some nice conversations with the city uh, education department, and the, the ending is a good one. Uh, New York City Department of Education has removed lighting ballasts containing PCBs in 624 public school buildings in New York City, and they've agreed to um, remove them in, in all 767 school buildings by December of this year. And this is the largest school district in the country. And while EPA worked hard on this, I also uh, want to give credit to New York lawyers for the public interest. They were the ones who filed a lawsuit and got the city talking. Uh, we brought it so far. Um, and then New York lawyers for the public interest did a lot of work on that. And I think that's just so good for kids and teachers in New York City public schools. When you think of EPA Region 2, you think Superfund, you think Walter Mugden, you think of 293 federal Superfund sites across Region 2. There's a lot of them. And one interesting fact is we've prioritized very recently our Superfund work in New York City. Since 1980, there was only one federal Superfund site in all of New York City, the Radium Chemical uh, Facility in Queens, which has since been cleaned up and delisted. But in the past six years, we've added three new federal Superfund sites in New York City, the Gowanus Canal, 
uh, Newtown Creek and the Wolf Alpert Radioactive Waste Site in Queens. Uh, we've done a lot of work on cleaning up the Hudson River of PCBs. Um, all of the hot spots have been addressed. We're now uh, working on the floodplains, people's backyards, boat launches, public parks that have some level of PCB in them. And we're in the process of doing a five-year review to make sure that our uh, directed cleanup was effective. We think it was, uh, but it's always good to do five-year review and look at all of the details and make sure we got it right, so we're happy to expedite that. I think we decided early on to have a real focus on urban waters. Um, I'm really happy that we pushed out the final cleanup decision for the lower Passaic River in Newark, New Jersey. That's a nice photo when we announced the cleanup decision. We could not have done it without the leadership of New Jersey uh, Environmental Commissioner Bob Martin, who was um, front and center with us. Uh, so we're just, you know, we're not where we are on the Hudson, but we're, we're really turned a corner on the Passaic. And I think um, cleaning up the Passaic, which we will do, makes the Hudson River look like a picnic. This is a little bit more complicated uh, than the Hudson, which just had one PRP and one major contaminant driving it, but we're gonna get it done. It's really important for New Jersey. New Jersey has also made some progress on reducing uh, sewage discharges into rivers and receiving waters. New Jersey was the only state in the nation that had general permits for combined sewer overflows, CSOs. And that wasn't a good thing. So we work closely with New Jersey DEP, and to their credit, they are, they've now issued over 20 individual permits for CSOs, which I think will result in significant water quality improvements throughout New Jersey. We also introduced the concept of green infrastructure, uh, and it, we now include it in all of our water consent orders. So we've done a lot on water. We've focused on no discharge zones, where New York has been a real leader. No discharge zones tells boaters you can't discharge your sewage into water bodies. Kind of hard to believe that we need a rule for that, but we do. The way the process works is the state submits a petition to EPA. We decide whether to take action. So from 1976 uh, to 2003, we approved nine no discharge zones. And um, that is, we've done the same amount in the past six years than we did the 27 years prior. Uh, there was also nine no discharge zones. So in essence, uh, we did in, in um, seven years what used to take us 27 years. And the beneficiary of that is all the water that's not receiving all that sewage. Um, I'm really proud of the work we do on job training for both Brownfields and Superfund. Uh, we issue job training grants to different parties. We've handed out millions of dollars. And um, I recently uh, was at the Fortune Society in Queens, a very innovative not-for-profit. They do job training for people who were recently incarcerated. And this was the last, um, I've, I've spoken at three uh, graduation ceremonies at the Fortune Society. So these are unemployed or underemployed, mostly gentlemen who recently got out of jail and they're looking to improve their lives. And so you can't just walk onto a Brownfield or Superfund site and get a good paying job. You need to have certification and training. And that's what our grants do. So that is a real honor. Enforcement has been a big priority. We took civil and criminal action at Tonawanda Coke, a petroleum coke facility just north of Buffalo. We dramatically improved air toxics, particularly benzene, and sent the plant operator to jail for violating environmental laws. We did a lot of work on a really tragic situation in the US Virgin Islands just a little over a year ago. A family of four from Delaware was on vacation in St. John. The condo that they were staying in, the apartment below them uh, was treated with methyl bromide, a pesticide. It was applied by a, a chain, uh, Terminex. Uh, they should not have been using uh, methyl bromide in a residential setting. And even the short-term exposure has had a devastating impact on this family. Uh, the two teenage boys and the dad have permanent serious neurological damage that they will never recover from. 
So, um, you know, we brought our case. Um, it's important. Um, and uh, I think, you know, this family uh, has been through a lot, and I think their experience really illustrates the need for strong environmental regulation at the local level. We, d we don't ever want to see this happen again to any other family. We've done a lot of work in Puerto Rico and much more work to be done. Uh, we're joined today by Evelyn Rivera, a lawyer in our San Juan office, uh, is here somewhere. Uh, she, along with about 49 other staff in uh, our office in San Juan, are doing amazingly important work um, and at a time when Puerto Rico is experiencing just tremendous economic problems. This is a photo in a community called Caño Martin Pena, a low-income neighborhood about 35,000 people live in, and there is a canal that is choked with debris and raw sewage. So we've worked with the Army Corps of Engineers on a really innovative environmental restoration dredging project, which is poised to start if we could just find $200 million, which I'm sure we will in the future. Um, and then EPA Region 2 lawyers have done an amazing job reaching uh, consent orders on Clean Water Act violations. You know, it's, it's a really interesting story. When, if you ever have the privilege of going to San Juan, most people just kind of hang out in the hotels and the beaches. This is just about a mile away from where all the hotels are. And if you walk through the neighborhood, you see lots of homes where there are hoses and the raw sewage and the gray water comes right out of the hose into the community. They're not connected to water infrastructure. So as a result, there's a lot of flooding. Uh, there are, are tremendous, um, tremendous amount of health problems, GI issues, high rates of asthma. Uh, when homes are flooded, then the furniture dries and it, there's mold and that's an asthma trigger. So that is a huge issue, uh, which we will continue to work on. Uh, we do a lot of work on uh, cleaning up the Superfund site on the island of Vieques. And in addition to doing that Superfund work, we've established the Vieques Sustainability Task Force to bring sustainable economic development to the island. And when I first started going to Puerto Rico for my EPA work, I was always kind of puzzled that I couldn't find any recycling bins anywhere. Um, so I would actually bring the recyclables home with me in my suitcase, which is not a good thing. And I was worried about what the TSA might do to me if they saw all the newspapers and soda cans. So we formed the Puerto Rico Recycling Partnership and also the Virgin Islands Recycling Partnership. And recycling has started in the Caribbean, still a long, long way to go, but at least we've got these programs moving. Puerto Rico is a really important part of Region 2 and an important part of our environmental justice agenda. Three and a half million Americans live in Puerto Rico. They are currently struggling with an unbearable, unsustainable debt of $72 billion. There is a bill in the legislature, in Congress rather, that is not a bailout, but it sets up a seven-member oversight board, among other things, to try to figure out how we get out of this uh, economic mess in Puerto Rico. Uh, President Obama supports this bill. We need Congress to act on it. And then on top of that, you have the challenge of the Zika virus, which is hitting Puerto Rico uh, pretty hard. Uh, just two days ago, there was a baby born in New Jersey with microcephaly. The, the challenge of Zika is if some of us get Zika, the symptoms are uh, flu symptoms. But if you're a pregnant woman, you are at risk of a very, very serious birth defect um, being microcephaly. The baby is born uh, with all sorts of birth defects. So we are working hard on Zika. Uh, kind of hard to believe that there's not a stronger financial response to the Zika crisis. One thing that we're trying to do is in most of Puerto Rico in the Virgin Islands, people don't have screens. So how do you protect your family from mosquitoes if you don't have screens in your house? So the CDC is trying to get funding for screens. I think that's a good example of integrated pest management. So that is gonna keep us very engaged in the months ahead. We also have done a lot um, with our Indian Nations partners. We have a government-to-government -government relationship with eight Indian Nations across New York. It's been one of the most meaningful and enriching experience 
I've had. Um, the top left is Administrator McCarthy um, meeting with Siobhan Smith from um, and Grant Jonathan, who works for EPA. Uh, Siobhan is the environmental director for the Shinnecock Nation, the newly, most uh, recent federally recognized tribe um, out in Suffolk County. So EPA is very, very proud of our working relationship with Indian nations. And suffice it to say, I think we learn more from them than they do from us. But it's a very, um, very significant working relationship for us. We also are doing a lot on citizen science and just hired recently Dr. Anahita Williamson, who worked at the New York State Pollution Prevention Institute. And that's something uh, I wish we could do more on, which is focusing on pollution prevention. So in terms of going forward, I think the urgent future challenges that all of us need to focus on, one is climate change, obviously. The second is clean drinking water. And the third is plastics pollution in our water, which I want to spend the rest of my time today talking about. We are turning our oceans into landfills. We're doing the same thing to rivers, lakes, and wetlands. These are basically becoming unpermitted, unregulated landfills in our water. And the problem is plastic pollution. Uh, plastic is polluting waterways. It's made from petroleum, so it's contributing to climate change. And here's what we know about what I think is kind of a sleeper issue that's not getting enough public attention and not enough action. 80% of the trash in the ocean comes from the land. It's not dumped from ships. It's washed off the streets and off of beaches into storm drains and sewage treatment plants and directly into the water. 80% of the trash in the water is plastic. And we know that plastics don't easily degrade in the aquatic environment. And what happens is when you have a lot of plastic making its way out into the ocean, the ocean currents act kind of like a paper shredder. And the plastics get shredded into little tiny pieces of plastic that build up in the marine environment. And if there's one thing I want you to remember from this afternoon, it's the following fact. If, things, if the status quo does not change by 2025, for every three pounds of fish in the ocean, there will be one pound of plastic. Three pounds of fish to one pound of plastic. And hardly anyone knows about this, because you typically don't see it unless you're a diver. The United Nations has reported that over 663 species have been impacted by plastic pollution. Um, it's fish, it's coral, it's seabirds that often mistake plastics for food and eat it. The seabirds see red and shrimp, they see red and um, orange little pieces of plastic and they mistake it for shrimp and they eat it. Uh, the seabird, the albatross, is a seabird that mistakenly feeds plastic to their chicks, killing tens of thousands every year through choking or poisoning. So scientists are doing autopsies on seabirds, and this is not unusual in terms of what they are finding. The research community is far ahead of where the business community is on this and where government regulators are. There's lots of peer-reviewed good data out there. Look at papers published by Dr. Jenna Jambach, uh, by Dr. Sam Mason at SUNY Fredonia, who we recently honored. There's a lot of good data out there, but what is missing is a strategy on how to ta tackle this. At EPA, we're focusing a lot on microplastics. These are pieces of plastic that are five millimeters or smaller. Think of, it's like as small as a grain of sand. And we find microplastics in cosmetics and personal care products and exfoliants. And, or microplastics start out as a larger piece of plastic and then get broken down. Microplastics have been found everywhere, including in polar ice. Wastewater treatment plants pollute nearby water with microbeads. Because you think about, you all know about sewage treatment plants, they're not really designed to deal with these little tiny pieces of plastic. So the receiving water is re receiving these little pieces of plastic. So how do we tackle a problem this 
big. Um, what I like to do when we have what seems like an unsolvable project is a problem is bring a lot of different people together. So we've launched a trash free waters initiatives and we're focusing on five major sources of plastic in the marine environment. And we picked on these five sources is because when people do litter cleanups, people doing litter cleanups are getting more sophisticated. They're not just picking up the litter, they're often counting and characterizing what they're picking up. And they have identified five, five big items that show up in litter cleanups. So we have a little project called PB5. P is for plastic and B is for bottles, bags, cigarette butts, food service boxes, and micro beads. And there are a series of things that we can do as individuals, as government leaders, as business leaders to address this issue. Bottles, there are some simple things you can do. Use a refillable water bottle and refillable coffee mugs. Um, I don't know if you remember when you were growing up, some of you, not all of you, soda and beer and milk was sold in refillable bottles. We could go back to that. Bags, you can use reusable bags. Puerto Rico uh, just did a plastic bag ban. The governor signed the bill a few months ago. Uh, interesting, in New York City, the city council passed a local ordinance putting a, um, a plastic bag fee on both paper and plastic bag to encourage people to bring reusable bags with them. And a funny thing happened. The New York City City Council passed this ordinance just a few weeks ago. The mayor said he will sign it. He still hasn't signed it yet, but he said he will. And voila, the New York State Legislature is now considering a bill that would preempt local governments from dealing with plastic bags. Uh, the bill is likely to pass the Senate, and last night it passed the Assembly Cities Committee uh, by an overwhelming vote. So I guess so much for local control. Um, cigarette butts, the best thing you can do is quit smoking, um, or make sure the butts make it into cigarette butt receptacles. It's a great way to source reduce. Food service boxes, you can bring your own reusable takeout containers when you go out for lunch. And think about it for a minute. You, you eat a sandwich at your desk. It's unlike today, it's probably a pretty bad sandwich. And it lasted 10 minutes. And yet that plastic um, box is going to last for decades, if not centuries in the environment. Uh, we're doing a lot of work on microbeads. President Obama signed the Microbead Free Waters Act into law in December of this past year. The new law will prohibit the sale of personal care products containing plastic microbeads by July 2018. These personal care products include face scrubs and toothpaste. Who knew there were little pieces of plastic in our toothpaste? I didn't know that until I started working on this issue. So I wanna urge you to read the ingredients list on the box carefully. If you see polyethylene or polypropylene, then the product contains microbeads. This is a daunting problem. Plastic production in the United States on average has grown about 8% annually since 1940. And I think what we need to do is change what is done upstream by changing how we design, manufacture, and use products and their packaging. It's all about source reduction. We can produce less, we can conserve natural resources, including energy, and we can prevent plastic pollution in our treasured water bodies, whether it's the Atlantic Ocean, or the Great Lakes, or the Hudson River. So this is a serious issue. I love this issue because it's a marriage of my two favorite issues, solid waste and water. I love clean water issues. I love solid waste issues. I don't know why, but I do. Um, but here's the problem. We don't have it fully figured out. So I want you to kind of think about this information, kind of let it marinate a bit. And if you've got really good ideas, call me up only with good ideas, um, because we have to figure this out together. Eleanor Roosevelt once said, you must do the thing you think you cannot do. And how we keep eight million pounds of plastic pollution out of the ocean every year is one such thing. 
So thank you. Now in our next panel, we are going to highlight the fact that even though the title of this conference is Key Environmental Issues in U.S. EPA Region 2, EPA is far from the only regulator that is operating in Region 2. And so we are going to hear now from representatives of the New York State Department of Environmental Conservation and the Departments of Environmental Protection for both New Jersey and New York City. Here also, we are going to hear from all three speakers, and then we'll take uh, questions at the end uh, of that process. So to kick us off, uh, representing uh, DEC Commissioner Basil Segos is Tom Berkman, who is the DEC Deputy Commissioner and General Counsel. As General Counsel, Tom oversees more than 80 environmental attorneys. Tom joined the DEC in 2011 and is focused on the whole range of New York State environmental programs, including implementation of the Clean Water Act, Clean Air Act, Solid Waste, state land issues, wetlands, and a whole bunch of others. You can read them in the bio. Tom covers a lot of ground. Prior to his appointment to DEC, Tom spent three years as an assistant attorney general in the criminal division of the New York Attorney General's Office and has worked for national law firms in New York City and Washington, D.C. Tom has also served as an assistant district attorney in New York City, Queens County. Tom? Uh, thanks, Eric. Um, it's great to be here today, and I, I really appreciate the opportunity to speak on behalf of Acting Commissioner Basil Sagos. Um, one of these days, uh, I'm going to learn how to use a PowerPoint presentation. I can tell you now, today is not one of those days. <laughs> Before I get started, I just wanted to briefly address uh, Seth's uh, complimentary remarks of our, our former general counsel, Ed McTiernan. I can say, I couldn't agree more that uh, Ed's years could certainly be considered the golden years of DEC. In fact, I find myself wishing to return to those golden years <laughs> about every night around 8 o'clock after putting in 12 hours uh, at the office. Today, rather than going into sort of the myriad of legal issues that face uh, the department, um, legal issues that haunt me every day, I'd rather spend this time giving you what I would describe as a 3,000 foot sort of perspective about the department, the issues that the department is facing, as well as the priorities, um, the environmental priorities that we're taking on under this administration. So DEC's mission, as quoting from the ECL, our authorizing legislation, is to conserve, improve, and protect New York's natural resources and environment and to prevent, abate, and control water, land, and air pollution in order to enhance the health, safety, welfare of the people of the state and the overall economic and social well-being. And we work to achieve this through the pursuit of environmental quality, public health, economic prosperity, and social well-being, including environmental justice, which you heard a little bit uh, about earlier today, and the empowerment of individuals to participate and environmental decisions that affect their lives. So DEC, it's a big agency, over 3,000 employees. At the top, it's headed by our commissioner, who right now is the acting commissioner, Basil Sagos. I'm hopeful that in a few weeks, I'll be able to just call him commissioner. Below him are a number of assistant commissioners or deputy commissioners, one of which you'll hear from later today, Jim Tierney, who somehow manages to manage the, the numerous water issues that come before him. Um, below that, the department has 24 divisions. So th this is handling that wide array uh, of environmental issues that I just talked to you. Besides the central office, which is where all of that is situated, there are nine regional offices. Uh, and appropriately, the New York City regional office is called Region 2. Um, so the total, as I mentioned, taking all these regions and central offices, almost 3,000 employees working to protect the environment. My role as general counsel um, is to, to help those 3,000 employees as best uh, I can with the aid, and thankfully I have the aid of uh, over 70 or 80 attorneys, uh, to make sure that all those actions are done in a, a legal um, manner, and in the event that we're challenged, and mind you, we're challenged a lot, uh, is to defend the agency. 
So getting to the priority issues facing the department, and, and I think this builds on really what I think has been a remarkable record so far, um, or impressive environmental record, is we're tackling emerging threats uh, that, that are facing our environment. Uh, we've taken major actions to combat climate change. We've reauthorized the Superfund and Brownfields program. We're uncovering new threats uh, to our water quality that's changing the dynamic in our approach to remediating contamination and pollution issues. And to do all this, uh, what I think can only be described in, as an historic commitment uh, to environmental protection, recently $3 million um, was authorized to the Environmental Protection Fund, and that's an investment that you know, far surpasses any previous investment uh, under any previous administration. This $123 million increase from last year brings this vital program to its highest level ever, providing record funding for environmental stewardship and protection efforts across the state. In particular, this major commitment will allow us to greatly enhance our work to improve water quality, aggressively tackle climate change, advance comprehensive environmental justice agenda, and to augment our efforts to protect farmland and open space. So I want to jump first into water quality improvements. And there's been a particular case that has been the focus of the capital region. Um, Judith touched upon it uh, when she just spoke to you. Uh, I don't know if it's made its way down here to New York City, but it, it centers around Hoosick Falls and the chemical called PFOA. And I think the department's response to this particular crisis has, based on the scale and scope of our response, I mean, I, I would say that it's unprecedented. Um, and I think it's taught us a lot of lessons uh, and has shaped the manner in which we will move forward to address similar issues as, as they come upon us. Just to give you a little bit of background as to this particular issue that uh, has hit, this emergency that has hit Hoosick. Um, it, it was discovered that BFOA, uh, this compound, uh, was found in the drinking water in Hoosick Falls. And based upon that, when the department got involved, uh, we took what I would say is extremely aggressive action. First, we worked with our EPA partners to recommend listing it uh, on the MPL. Um, we also sought for or sought national action to create a national standard or a national guidance value. And I'm happy to report that just last week or is the week before, I, I've lost track at this point, uh, EPA came out with a standard of 70 parts per trillion as, as the level that uh, people would look at to say what is a safe drinking water level. We're talking about the scale and magnitude of our, our response. Uh, when when we uh, did learn of this, the first one, after recommending it for listing uh, in the MPL, the department determined that swifter action uh, is necessary. As you may or may not know, the MPL uh, process is a lengthy one. Um, so in order to free up the type of resources that the department has, uh, we took the move to list BFOA as a hazardous substance, thereby freeing up our ability to utilize Superfund dollars. What did we do with those Superfund dollars? We took samples of over a thousand private ground uh, water sources. We installed over 750 POET systems, which has been shown to be effective to remove this compound uh, from drinking water. Uh, we ensured that the companies uh, provided a larger system for the village's public uh, drinking water. And we continue to work with those responsible parties to, to hold them accountable ultimately for the cleanup of, of this chemical. Unfortunately, this situation won't be the last. So as I was saying, I think a lot of lessons were learned from this uh, and lessons that, that we will bring into uh, other situations. Uh, in that respect, uh, Governor Cuomo established a water quality rapid response team that's co-chaired by DEC and DOH. And that, that team is tasked with undertaking a comprehensive statewide analysis of where other drinking water supplies may be impacted by BFOA or other potential contaminants. 
And ultimately, our goal is to be able to aggressively respond, as we did in Husik, to these new threats, while at the same time working to get ahead of it. In Husik, you know, the problem came to us. Uh, you're in a much better position if, if you can identify the problem first and take aggressive action there. As part of this effort to, to really sort of get out in front, um, we're embarking on the first ever comprehensive study of Long Island groundwater, creating a model program for tracking contaminants movement and ensuring a healthy and sustainable water supply for Long Island. And this year's EPF, which as I said was historic, uh, provides important funding to assist the development and implementation of solutions to water quality impairments and threats. There's a new $20 million water quality improvement program uh, investment, which includes enhancements to our pharmaceutical take back program and other traditional grants. Outside the EPF, there's major new funding dedicated to Water Infrastructure Improvement Act of 2015, which will all augment grants to municipalities for critical drinking water and wastewater uh, system improvements. Uh, this year's budget doubles the funding for this initiative from two million approved last year to four million, supporting critical clean water and drinking water projects to improve the environment and the economy. These grants uh, on a whole can be leveraged, uh, will, will leverage approximately two billion in local drinking water and wastewater infrastructure investments. Now clean water uh, also depends, and we talked a lot about climate change uh, earlier today. Well, one of the major threats uh, to water quality is climate change. And this, I think, is where, where New York has been a leader recently and continues to make uh, significant efforts to combat climate change. Climate change is costing uh, our state billions of dollars in damages each year and threatening our public health and economic well-being. So it not only makes environmental sense to tackle climate change, but it makes economic sense as well. Nearly four years ago, Hurricane Sandy um, really sort of demonstrated the reality of the expense of climate change, um, impacting and decimating communities across New York and impacting thousands of homes and businesses at the cost of 67 billion. This was not just an isolated event. A year before that hurricane was Hurricanes Irene and Lee, which cost um, $17 billion in damage. And there's other costly emergencies that we anticipate from lake effect, lake effect snows uh, to summer flooding. So all of this really demonstrates, and I, and I think the department recognizes, uh, the need to take action and immediate action to reduce carbon emissions. So, so what have we done? Well, this administration uh, ha has made it a priority. We've recently signed the under two MOU, which will commit the state to reach an 80% reduction in emissions by 2015. The state energy plan seeks to reduce uh, greenhouse emissions by 40% by 2030. And in addition, the governor recently announced in the state of the state that New York will be coal free by 2020. You heard a little bit about the Clean Power Plan um, and, and the court challenges facing it. Uh, despite those court challenges, um, as I think you heard, states are allowed to voluntarily uh, work towards it, and, and that's exactly what New York is doing. We're moving ahead with developing our strategy to implement the Clean Power Plan and continue to move forward aggressively, assuming this important federal effort will be upheld. The state also continues to aggressively move forward implementing the Community Risk Reduction and Resiliency Act, which is helping the state prepare for impacts to sea level rise. In fact, New York, I think, is, is really sort of first in the nation in moving ahead with sea level rise regulations. One other thing that you, you might not hear about uh, as much down here in New York City, which but I think is equally important both for water quality and climate change purposes is the land acquisition that's occurring in upstate New York, specifically in the Adirondack Park. The department recently completed the state's largest Adirondack land acquisition in more than 100 years with the purchase of 20,758 uh, acres uh, in the Boreas Ponds Tract. This final acquisition is a series of land purchases that the state has completed under a 2012 agreement with the Nature Conservancy to 
conserve 69,000 acres of land previously owned primarily by the former Prince Prune and Company Paper Company. So this, this purchase not only creates unbelievable recreational opportunities, it also serves to protect water quality as well as, you know, uh, affecting climate change and reducing and having this type of uh, absorption uh, up in the Adirondacks. I wanted to, and I know I'm running out of time, and I just wanted to briefly touch upon environmental justice because I know you heard about it uh, earlier today. This has also been a priority of, of the administration. And, and it's a priority because the issues that I'm talking about earlier often disproportionately affect these EJ communities. Uh, and it's really important to, to take on those, those communities and make sure that they're being looked out for. Um, that's why you know, this administration is focused on implementing a comprehensive environmental justice agenda. The EPF includes a new $7 million EJ funding initiative, the largest such investment in New York State history. The program targets funding to two million to continue expanding the community grants program. Uh, it wants to conduct additional air quality monitoring in urban areas, improve access to state lands through the State Parks Connect Kids initiative, improve education and outreach to EJ communities, and provide new environmental job training. In addition to this tremendous investment, DEC is also focused on improving public health and air quality by advancing new regulations to place limits on emissions from distributed generation sources such as diesel generators and natural gas fired engines. We're in the process right now of reviewing comments submitted on our proposed regulations and should have a revised final proposed uh, regulation soon. Certainly we appreciate all the comments that, that some of you have given to us during that uh, regulatory process. So in conclusion, uh, th there's a lot of issues that we're tackling at DEC, uh, but we have over 3,000 dedicated employees who, who have made it a priority to take those on. So hopefully we'll be able to carry out that mission, and I appreciate your time. Thanks. Thank you, Tom. And next, here today for the uh, New Jersey Department of Environmental uh, Protection Commissioner Bob Martin is Ray Cantor, uh, who is the Chief Advisor to the Commissioner. Ray is a manager, lawyer, and public policy expert with more than 20 years of experience in governmental affairs and policy analysis and development. Ray has also served as Senior Counsel and Committee Aide to the Environment, Energy, and Natural Resource Section of the New Jersey Office of Legislative Services. He's been the Director of Governmental Affairs for the Medical Society of New Jersey, and also the executive director of the New Jersey Apartment Association. Ray also served as the DEP's assistant commissioner of land use management and compliance from 1998 to 2002. Ray, thank you. Thank you, it's good to be here again today. And on behalf of Commissioner Martin, who could not be here, uh, I want to uh, appreciate the opportunity to, uh, for uh, on his behalf of saying um, how happy we are to be here once again. I think we've been coming here every year for the last six, six years. Um, I know Judith mentioned how uh, she believed that the fun is in the regions, while I believe the action is really in the states. Um, you know, uh, we're the ones who are implementing, you know, or, or issuing all the water permits, all the air permits. We clean up more sites uh, probably than um, maybe the entire federal government combined, some of them are as complex as the most complex Superfund sites. We regulate flooding, you know, manage the, the, the land, issue land permits, and deal with fisheries, parks, et cetera. So um, we're in the communities. We have uh, lots of action. And I just want to talk about uh, New Jersey's uh, philosophy of, of how we go about doing our job. Again, when I was here six years ago, um, you know, we, we talked about uh, what the commissioner believes, uh, what he would say if he were here, is that he, every day he thinks about how can I improve the land, air, water, and the natural resources of New Jersey. But part of his mission coming in into the new you know, administration, Governor Christie's administration, was to try to find that balance between environmental protection 
and economic d development. Um, you know, the, that's, you know, a balance that we all deal with, you know, a, as regulars every day. It's not always just one side, and if you read most of the statutes, you know, you do find, you know, th that balance that needs to be achieved. When we made that pronouncement of this is, uh, of trying to find that balance, we, we were roundly criticized by the environmental community. Uh, the newspapers, you know, um, you know uh, were highly critical, and that continued to, to this day. If you go and Google, Governor Christie, environment, you'll read about how we rolled back environmental laws, weakened policies. There's probably uh, a, a slew of, of accusations, and if you listen to some of the more inventive environmental groups, some really good quips you know, about how horrible we've been for the last six years. Um, but I, I want to tell you that the result has been much different than uh, the, the perception. One, uh, um, despite everyone saying how much we've rolled back in environmental policies or in protections, I don't know of a single environmental uh, regulation that, that we have rolled back. Not a single standard has changed. Um, but yet you'll find that compliance is up and the trends for, for air, our air, water, natural resources are all on the upswing and they're all improving. How do we do that? I, again, and none of this is really rocket science. You know, for, use, for those of you who are regulators who are dealing with, uh, with the regulated community, it, it's really a lot of common sense in how you go about uh, proposing and implementing your regulations. And it's a matter of Commissioner Martin's focus on transforming how our department does, goes about doing its business. So let me talk about a little bit about um, the regulatory process um, all, all regulations come, th uh, come through me uh, for, for policy and otherwise, so I know a little bit about uh, what we've been doing. Um, we had s just several goals that, that you know, we laid out at the beginning of the administration. We wanted to end needless process. Obviously, process is important. Process is how you make sure that mistakes don't happen. But when you have regulatory programs, and for those of you who have been through the 70s when we had gross you know, uh, bouts of, uh, of pollution, and, and we put in laws, and then you know, in, in the 80s, you know, uh, we became a little bit more sophisticated, you know, in, in our regulatory approaches, um, and we had you know, tremendous success. But over time, we, um, you know, at least in New Jersey, we found that we have regulation upon regulation upon regulation, and as we began chasing those last molecules of, of the water discharges versus the gross amounts that were missing out you know, in the 70s, it became far more and more costly to go out and chase those last bits of, uh, of you know, the, the, the last one percent, the last few percent that we're not otherwise catching. Um, we focused on what matters. Um, there are things that really matter, you know, for, from a regulatory perspective. Things that really are going to change um, uh, behaviors or uh, impact the environment, and there are things that, that do not. Uh, again, in the regulatory process. Um, we often regulate to the bad actor, to, the, to that one mistake that someone who no longer works here found 20 years ago, and those provisions are, are put into our regulations, and they remain there, and no one really quite knows why, but uh, they're still there, and they're still, uh, at this point, maybe superfluous. We focused on results. A again, it's not just uh, what you do, but whether or not you're achieving real results that, that matter in, in your regulatory approach. We wanted to work more with local governmental entities to have partners you know, in, in this process. Again, it's not just us in Trenton that um, are out there trying to protect the environment, but in, in a state with uh, four, uh, 565 or whatever we have, I can't even count how many municipalities in New Jersey, it's really important to have them on our side and them as partners. And the private sector as well. Um, we, we found if you work with people, if you try to get cooperation, um, to, that you get a lot more results, a lot better you know, environmental uh, benefit at the end of the day. Again, uh, the, the commissioner coming from the private sector really wanted to leverage technology in making us more efficient um, in, in saving costs for uh, the regulated community. So that was a big emphasis of what we did as well. And the commissioner's emphasis, and he, and he tells uh, staff this you know, almost on a daily basis, what does the science say? Don't tell me what you want to achieve or tell me, don't tell me what you want to do. Tell me what the science you know, uh, shows. Uh, does what you're, uh, is your suggestion backed up by sound science or, or is it not? Uh, is, if science is driving us one direction, then that's the direct, direction we should go at, into. It's not saying that there aren't policy calls you know, uh, when science, we obviously 
have to make um, you know uh, benefits of, of costs you know etc. But again, um, often um, policies are made or decisions are made based on perceptions of where you want to go as opposed to what the science is really showing. So we try to have those as really guiding principles for how we do a regulatory um, um, process. I just want to talk about a couple of examples uh, that I think you know, you know, illustrate um, you know, our regulatory reform. Um, I'm going to mention the LSRP program. I'm not going to get into a lot of detail. I believe uh, Ken Clue was here before, and you all heard Ken, and Ken's the expert, so please don't ask me any questions that you didn't ask Ken because you know, I, 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 I really can't answer them. But the LSRP program is, and, and, and this, by the way, was a law that was passed um, by under the uh, Governor Corazon and Democrats administration. Um, I'm only taking credit for, uh, for implementing it, but, but not for the, the, the great idea. It's really a bipartisan um, way of uh, getting sites cleaned up um, quicker and, and, and maybe even less expensive, but really getting sites cleaned up is the ultimate goal. And it's, by the way, it's modeled on, on the Massachusetts model uh, of using licensed site remediation pr professionals. But what we did, there, there are really three pillars of, of that program. It empowered the private sector to clean up sites in an efficient manner without having to go back and forth with DEP, and also gave them the obligation to clean up those sites, which again, um, you, you have the privilege of being able to work you know, on your own, and you have the obligation to make sure you do it. So again, th that, that was a key tenant. It also set very strict standards for what we were trying to achieve. The uh, uh, Site Remediation Reform Act, I believe, uh, of 2007 that, that drove the LSRP program was really part of a long series of reforms that New Jersey ha had um, you know, um, put into place. When I was in the legislature, um, you know, um, drafting legislation, we had worked on a number of other site remediation reforms where we came up with strict cleanup standards, but also uh, flexible means to, to you know, uh, attain that through institutional and engineering controls. We were more interested in making sure that sites got cleaned up, the public was protected, public health was protected, than we were in previous you know, paradigms of making sure that every drop of contamination was removed from a site. Um, you know, that's great as an, as an idealistic you know, measure. It doesn't work necessarily you know, in practice. So the legislature had already set up a paradigm for allowing sites to be cleaned up. The Site, uh, um, the site Remediation Reform Act, which established the LSIP program, you know, then you know, gave everyone the tools to make sure that it happened in an efficient manner. So we, have, we, we empowered the private sector to do things. We set strict standards. And we had strict oversight as well. Again, rather than DEP being the uh, entity that had to sign off on every step of the way, you know, as Ken probably explained to you, we allow the licensed site remediation professionals to do the cleanups based on our strict guidelines of what they're trying to achieve and um, using their professional judgment. But we also look at the documents at the end of the day, and we have audit programs, et cetera. So um, what are the results of, of this? More sites you know, are being worked on now than ever before in New Jersey. Um, you know, we started the administration with about 20,000 contaminated sites. I think we're down to 14,000 now. If Ken gave you different numbers, trust Ken's, not, not mine. Um, but really what this means is that the environment is cleaner, public health is protected, and sites, you know, um, and again, New Jersey being an old industrial um, state, more sites are being put back into productive use, driving the economy and providing taxes for, for local government. Uh, we also had um, a, a waiver rule that we put in early on the administration, and that basically said you don't have to comply with the strict provisions of any particular rule if you could show, um, one, that you have a net environmental benefit, you know, there was undue hardship, and maybe you could do it in a, a way that we didn't imagine. There was an emergency or a conflict. When we came out with, um, you know, th this regulation, I was on a panel with a state senator, and he was, he was saying, I, I, we don't want you to do this because you know, if you do this, I know you're gonna end up in jail. Well, um, you know, we, we didn't end up in jail. We actually set up a paradigm where our staff members are thinking a little bit more inventively than, than they can. It did not open the floodgates for um, destroying all our regulations as the critics uh, suggested. Uh, in the four years, we've had our waiver rule in effect and again, for, for those of you who are, are regulators, you know sometimes you just get situations where the rules just don't make sense. And it was really meant to apply those things. You can't get from here to there because the rules just don't allow you to get there even though you know that's the better result. So we've had about 70 requests for waivers. 
to date, you know, the big floodgate uh, of, uh, of what we've done, we've approved two. And we have two more we're about to approve. But, you know, it's changed, you know, a bit of a mindset, both on our part of our staff and how they look at permits and the regulated community w when they're coming in. That they, they know, you know, that the waiver may be out there somewhere. No one wants to get there. And there's a much more cooperative relationship between us and the regulated community. I'm um, just going to mention as well, uh, again, I'm, I'm out of time, you know, as well. I talked about the commissioner's transformation. Um, he, you know, again, coming from the private industry, he put private industry mentality, you know, in, into the minds of, you know, we state workers. Um, you know, he instituted a number of different things that helped us um, get better results from the private sector that, you know, um, basically treated people coming in for permits a a as customers. Um, you know, you, what you could find is that you get a lot more cooperation if you just act nice to people. People coming in for permits had historically been called um, polluters, bad guys, staff w wouldn't return their phone calls, even though there was a legal right to get a permit. So now what you find, first of all, everyone in DEP, including myself, had to go through customer service training. We're now on our second round of that. Um, so if you call us, you get a call back within 24 hours. If you send a letter in you know, uh, on something, you'll probably get a call back because we, we're trying to avoid the letters back and forth and that waste weeks and weeks of time. And for, for you attorneys out there, I'm sure you'd rather get a phone call back from uh, the permit writer to, to solve your problem as opposed to you know, the unending letters. Um, so again, customer service. We have Office of Permit Coordination that works on those complex permits that have multiple um, programs involved. Um, you know, I'm sure you understand the frustration of going for, from water to the air program to the land use program, back and forth, you know, uh, to, to the local government, et cetera. So we have a coordination unit that helps work, brings everyone together in the room, talks about your issues up front, and, and tries to resolve them as they go along. We have alternative dispute resolution uh, that, that handles uh, cases. About 80% of the cases that go in there are favorably resolved. Again, keeps us out of the courts, saves time and money for everyone down the road. Um, and again, w one of our major changes as well is our emphasis on general permits and permits by rule. General permits, um, I think you all understand permits by rule, are those things which have really minor environmental impacts. And we say if you do it in, in this manner, um, you know, then you can just go ahead and do it without even telling us. Um, sometimes, you know, uh, we're now switching more toward uh, permits by rule by certification. You have to log in into the system. So at least we know what activities you're doing and we have a certification. But what those general permits and permit by rule and by certification do at the end of the day, it drives the regulated community to those decisions which have the least environmental impact. It's much easier for someone to do it the way we, we think they should be doing it through a general permit than going through the individual permit route and spending lots of money and you know, uh, time and energy both on their side and on our side. So again, we try to set up the paradigms where they can do the right thing, do it quicker, do it easy, do it easier. Um, I could talk about Sandy and, and our, uh, for forever, but I'm also out of time on that one. But needs to say, we've been doing a lot on Sandy you know, as well, on steps going forward. But again, you know, going forward, what we plan to do, um, we have about 18 months to go. Uh, as Judith said, uh, we're, we're not dead yet. Um, you know, we have, um, you know, uh, we want to continue the work that we've been doing. We're, um, uh, I know I'm going to go over slightly just on this one point, but, you know, we have a situation right now, if you come into DEP and you need a wetlands permit for a project, a flood hazard permit, and a coastal permit if you're, you know, along the coastal areas, you need three different permits, you have three different processes, sometimes um, the procedures, the applicability, the standards are all different, and you're being not bounced around. Um, you know, we've already adopted our wetlands and a flood hazard reform. We're working on wet, uh, excuse me, uh, flood hazard and coastal. We're working on wetlands. Once that is done, you will be able to come into our department for one land use permit. So you, you, you'll say what you're doing, the processes, the notice, you know, everything will all be standard you know, throughout. You will come in with one application, which will be online. You'll get one permit, which will give you all your land use permits. Again, it's another way of just making our system much more efficient, saving time and energy for the regulated community, and getting a better result. So um, I thank you very much, and I look forward to your questions when we're done. Thank you. I do have a PowerPoint. You have a PowerPoint? Okay. Um, we need a PowerPoint changed up here. Yeah, let me just see if I can actually do this. Yeah. Rather than screw around. 
I could push the button and we could be here for another half an hour trying to undo it. So let's. Can escape, right? Boy, am I glad I didn't touch the button I was thinking about <coughs> touching. That would not have been pretty. Anyway, thank you very much, Ray. Um, our third speaker is Robin Levine, who's representing Emily Lloyd, the commissioner of the New York City Department of Environmental Protection. Robin serves as the senior environmental counsel at New York City DEP. Robin's practice focuses on environmental compliance matters, including compliance with the Clean Water Act, Safe Drinking Water Act, and public employee safety and health laws. Robin started her legal career at the New York City Law Department, where she represented city agencies on a variety of matters involving employment, civil rights, and environmental issues. Robin. Thanks, Eric. Good afternoon. And I know Commissioner Lloyd wished she could have been here today. Um, I'm going to speak about a topic that is very dear to her heart and weaves in actually um, a bunch of issues you've heard about today. Unlike the other agencies that you've spoken today, DEP um, is both a regulator upstate in the watershed, um, but we are largely a water utility. So um, all that delicious water that hopefully you drank during lunch or the bagel that you ate um, was a direct result of our important mission to deliver over a billion gallons of water um, to half the population of New York State and then to treat that wastewater. We also enforce um, some local laws for quality of life. Over the, since the passage of the Safe Drinking Water Act and the Clean Water Act, uh, DEP has spent about $40 billion investing in upgrading its wastewater treatment plants, building additional water supply infrastructure. And while that was challenging and complicated, if you had tried to find a site to put a facility in the city of New York, you know how difficult that can be. Um, but we were able to largely complete that mission um, and the goals there were very specific. Upgrade to secondary treatment, treat with UV light, um, climate change, which is we are starting to see day in and day out, um, presents a very different sort of challenge to the department. Um, the goals are less defined. There are a lot of things that we don't know, but there are certain basic truths. We know we're seeing warmer days that um, stress the electrical system, and we are a very large user of electricity for our wastewater treatment plants. We've seen more increased intense average rainfalls. If you've gotten caught in one of these cloud bursts where all of a sudden it rains like heck, um, and then the streets flood, and the sewer system was not designed with this in mind. Um, and we're also seeing rising sea levels, and that's a challenge for DEP because by necessity, all of our infrastructure in the city is located at the water's edge. In terms of the water supply system, um, we are starting out in a really good place. Um, the very smart um, forefathers, and maybe there were some foremothers, um, involved in designing the water supply system um, relies, um, you know, cited our reservoirs in three separate watersheds as, as the water supply expanded. And we have multiple reservoirs. And also within those reservoirs, we can withdraw water from different levels. And that proved very important to us um, during um, this very extreme event. Uh, someone spoke about it earlier, Hurricane Irene and Tropical Storm Lee. It occurred over a two week period upstate and it was supposed to hit the city. It was the Sandy that didn't happen here, but it happened upstate and it really devastated some of our upstate communities and had a tremendous impact on the water supply system. It stressed our dams, so our dams um, are built to very high standards, so um, everything was fine there, but it did have an impact on water quality. We saw materials washed from homes, enter the streams in our reservoirs, and we had quite a bit of turbidity, which is that cloudy colored water you see 
Um, our reservoirs are designed to help us manage turbidity. That shot of the Ashokan Reservoir shows a dividing weir where we can try for the longest possible time to keep turbidity away from where we're delivering water. But it was a challenge, and um, there are a number of actions that we have been taking and will continue to take uh, to try to protect the source water. Uh, we, this uh, map is a, um, shows the watershed of the Catskill Delaware system, which is where we draw 90% of our water supply on a typical day. And all those dots that are almost impossible to see represent activities that we have undertaken in partnership with the over 50 communities um, in our living watershed. Uh, just by way of example, um, we partner with over 90% of the large farms in the watershed to incentivize farmers to engage in good farming practices to prevent pollution from entering the water supply. Um, the state talked about acquiring land. Um, the city's acquired almost 114,000 acres um, since we commenced this program in the early 90s. And the state's done its part too by protecting a lot of land in the Catskill Park. And so approximately at this point, 40% of the land from which we draw our source water in the Catskill Delaware system is protected from development. And that is very helpful when we have these extreme events. We've also made infrastructure investments. We've built a UV uh, treatment plant, which provides a second form of disinfection in East View, New York. Um, and the Croton Water Treatment Plant, which you've probably read a lot about over the years, went online a year ago um, and gives us additional flexibility um, when the water supply is stressed. We have also embraced technology. We have a very sophisticated operational support tool um, that allows our engineers to make real-time decisions about which reservoir to take water from, the elevation, and it also, um, it also can draw on climate change data. So it's not only looking forward, but we can plan ahead based upon different climate change scenarios. Turning to the city, um, water quality has improved tremendously. You certainly hope it would with all the money that we've invested upgrading our wastewater treatment plants. Um, but climate change also presents a challenge here. This is a shot in the Rockaways um, during the height of Hurricane Sandy. And um, although it didn't rain very much in the city um, when Hurricane Sandy passed over, we had fierce winds and a tremendous storm surge. And that had a very significant effect on our plants. Um, we had damage at 10 of our 14 wastewater treatment plants and almost half of our pumping stations. We were able to get back up and running very quickly, um, but nonetheless, we have more work to do in that regard. And even before Sandy, uh, we had undertaken a planning effort that resulted in 2013 in the issuance of our wastewater resiliency plan. Under this plan, um, we are going to be investing about $350 million to harden our infrastructure that's near the water's edge. We'll be elevating critical equipment, encasing electrical equipment um, in waterproof, I'm not an engineer, but stuff, <laughs> <laughs> and taking other actions so that when we have these storm surges, um, Hopefully we won't have outages, so the outages will be of a lot shorter duration. And the good news there with a lot of this work that we're doing is it's fiscally prudent. We anticipate that we will avoid $2.5 billion worth of costs over the next 50 years by investing $350 million over the next several. We've also done a lot of investments um, in gray infrastructure. It's the concrete in the ground either above the ground or in the ground um, to capture wet weather. We've expanded the capacity of our wastewater treatment plants, and we've built these combined sewer overflow facilities. Approximately 60% of the city is combined sewer, and 40% of it is separately sewered with sanitary and storms. So in the combined sewer areas of the city, when it rains, our wastewater treatment plants can take twice the amount of normal flow. Um, but it, when it rains really, really hard and really fast, um, we can't get all that flow to the plants. So we are building these facilities to capture some of that flow 
and then when the plants have capacity, we can pump that flow back to the plant and it can get secondary treatment. Green infrastructure has its benefits, but um, I think Judith talked a little bit about green. Uh, DEP was an early embracer of green infrastructure. We started in the 90s with the Blue Belt program in Staten Island. There, that's a separate system. And rather than just build concrete pipes to take stormwater um, off the streets, we have used an innovative system um, to drain uh, almost 15,000 acres, or approximately 40% of Staten Island's land mass by using streams, ponds, wetlands, and other natural features. And that avoided the need to build a lot of storm sewers. We've recently, starting in 2012, kicked off a major green infrastructure program to complement our gray infrastructure in the CSO areas of the city. Um, we've spent almost $200 million and built over 3,000 individual practices so far, and there's a lot more to come in that regard. Um, the benefits of green infrastructure, I'm sure you've heard about them. Not only does it um, help with water quality, but it's certainly more beautiful than the gray infrastructure, um, and it has other co-benefits. Um, one of the benefits is there's a public education component. We're partnering with the Department of Education and the Trust for Public Lands to um, develop green infrastructure and public spaces, including schools. So here's a shot of a schoolyard before GI. And after working with the kids, Judith got to show her picture. We didn't have any kids here, but they helped design this playground. Um, and this is this um, great public amenity as well as benefiting water quality. And we're going to be replicating this elsewhere throughout the city. In some areas of the city, particularly the areas that were developed more recently, um, the housing went ahead of building out the storm sewer system. And particularly with these heavier rains, we see more street flooding. Um, so Commissioner Lloyd and the mayor have made a major commitment to building out the storm sewer system. This is in Southeast Queens. We're going to be spending $1.5 billion over the next 10 years building this out. We're going to be using GI as well. We're also working with um, local homeowners, trying to educate them on steps they can take. Last year, we gave out over 5,000 rain barrels that help capture um, stormwater on folks' property. And finally, um, DEP is a major user of um, energy, particularly in the city, and particularly and an, probably an unintended consequence of a lot of the infrastructure that we were mandated to build is very energy intensive. The UV plant, Croton, the wastewater treatment plants, upgrading them for nutrient removal. All of these technologies require a lot of energy. And so we have made a commitment to try to reduce our energy footprint. Um, we completed solar panels. I know someone brought that up earlier um, at Tallman Island. Uh, I'm at the, sorry, at the Port Richmond wastewater treatment plant. And that's a very successful proce project that's reduced our energy footprint there. And we are kicking off a project at the North River Wastewater Treatment Plant to use digester gas and waste heat energy um, to produce energy for the plant. And that will result in, I think, a 90% reduction in our energy footprint at the plant is the equivalent of taking approximately 2,000 cars off the road. Um, so that's, that's what we're doing at DEP. And um, enjoy the drinking water. Thank you, Robin. Um, so we have time for some questions, right? Okay, any questions? Yes. Can you explain the relationship between the state and federal regulatory authorities? Are federal statutes like the Clean Air Act and the Clean Water Act meant to be floors or ceilings? Can states go beyond these standards through their state implementation plans? If so, what's the process to amend uh, a SIP and, for example, to provide enhanced protections to our critical resources like farmland? And also, are you concerned about the Energy Modernization Act, which is now in conference, and its attempt to limit 
existing state jurisdiction over federal projects like interstate gas projects? Okay, to fully answer your question, would we'll probably be about a week. <laughs> but let, okay. let me do this. Let, let me sort of start off a little bit, then I'll turn it over to you guys just a bit. Um, from the federal side, some of the major programs that you talked about, the Clean Water Act, Clean Air Act, um, large parts of that are delegated to the states and the federal government, EPA, is in an oversight role. So the state is actually on the water side, it would be through the Speedies program as opposed to NIPTES and, and so on. Um, you asked a question about federal standards, whether they, they serve as a floor or a ceiling. They serve as a floor. S uh, states are, are able to, to become more stringent in their, in their uh, regulation, but they're not allowed to go below the federal standards. And uh, as far as the rest are concerned, the, the, the process for I'm sure, I'm, I'm sorry, I don't remember all of what you asked. Amending the state implementation plan to allow for enhanced protections. Well, the state implementation on, on the Clean Air Act side, the, right. the SIP is modified on a fairly regular basis. And I don't know if you, one of you guys wants to talk about the SIP process. I think you've captured it. Uh, yeah. I think you, you need to be in there. I was going to say, I think Eric has captured uh, your answers as to you know, this being the floor, and we're always capable of having greater um, restrictions or, or requirements, um, but we are held to, to a standard that mm -hmm. EPA often uh, comments on uh, so, to us, but uh, I, I don't have really anything else. Yeah, we'll be happy to, to talk to you a little bit, but for the fact, I, I was hoping that we might be able to talk okay. a little bit later. I'd like to get the name of that facility, the okay. Title 5 facility, so maybe we can do that at the break. Sure, great. Any other questions? Yes. Rich, could you use the mic? I'm trying to accept the notion that, mm. that having outside consultants do the work for the agency is, is acceptable because it achieves the same result that would have been achieved had the agency done it and had the ability to do this. So what I'm asking you is, have you ever run any kind of parallel reviews in the agency to see whether or not the people that are in the L LSRPs would have come up with the same result for a cleanup that you would have come up with had you had the wherewithal to do it? Again, a, a question for Ken. However, um, for first of all, it's not a matter of, of us doing it versus um, the, the private sector doing it, the way the program is, is set up, it, it's the LSRP making those judgment calls versus us making our judgment calls. And the way the program is structured, it's also not a matter that would they have done with what we would have done or recommended, because you know, there, there could be a, a number of different ways to get to the same you know, um, you know, re result. We have a, um, uh, a cleanup result of 10 to the minus six you know, health standard you know, on, on cancer risk. But again, we allow institutional engineering controls. Um, what we do check on, and again, and what the final remedy is, uh, we don't choose the remedy, we just make sure it's an acceptable remedy at the end of the day. So long as it's acceptable and protective, then we will sign off on it. Um, um, I'm aware of no instances at the moment. Again, the program is still fairly new, and the other programs are still ongoing. We have an LSRP board that looks at LSR, you know, um, and now regulates them. They've only been up and running for a year as well. So I'm sure as we go along, there'll be a lot to learn. Um, what I've learned uh, as well in this whole um, area of cyber remediation is, is it's continuing learning uh, and fixing and correcting and then moving on. But what we've seen so far um, you know, in our experience is a successful program where, where good professionals are making the right judgments and sites are being cleaned up. And I'm aware of no uh, major instances uh, of where we have problems of achieving those results. Okay. Yes. Okay, any other questions? Yes. Talk about uh, New York State submitting information uh, with regard to compliance with the Clean Power Plan, even though it's on hold uh, right. with the Supreme Court decision. So 
as a former New Yorker but current New Jerseyan. Um, Ray, I want to pivot to you. Is New Jersey also submitting information with regard to its compliance with the Clean Power Plan? No. Um, we were actually one of the states that were part of the lawsuit that got the stay in effect. Um, and we, it's a longer conversation, but no, uh, we, we are in, we, we can talk about our progress in reducing carbon and what we believe are, are the great New Jersey success story in doing so, but we're not complying with the Clean Power Plan at this point in time. And why is that? It's a longer conversation. <laughs> how, how much more time do we have? Uh, again. Um, 30 seconds or less. <laughs> well, uh, again, um, the part of the basis of, of our suit uh, is several fold. One, uh, we can talk about how we think that EPA went beyond its jurisdiction, you know, in, in requiring uh, beyond defense requirements and uh, a number of other things. But again, New Jersey, which is, gets most of its electricity, or at least half of it, from, from nuclear power, um, we are, I believe, the fourth cleanest um, per kilowatt, you know, um, production of, of car carbon per kilowatt hour, you know, in the nation. We've done our work. You know, we, we've, um, you know, we're one of the cleanest power uh, emitters, you know, in the United States, and we don't believe the Clean Power Plan adequately reflected that. If uh, the Clean Power Plan had done, uh, been structured differently, um, that took into account New Jersey and states like our successes, we may have had a different opinion, but it was not structured to recognize the success of states like New Jersey. Michael, time for one more, or are we out of time? One more, if there's one more question, we have time? Okay, yes. I just wanted to, I just wanted to address this to um, New York State is I just wondered if you would like to comment on the um, licensing for the Indian Point Power Plant and where that process is and how the DEC is uh, thinking about those. Well, to use Eric's words, uh, I think that would take uh, at least a week uh, to answer. So, you know, I can certainly talk to you a little bit uh, af during the break. Okay, then I guess we're done. All right, thank you very much. Thanks to the panel.